Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you could please be seated now. And perhaps I can ask Heather Connolly as well and the speakers to join us on stage. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second day of the Madrid Public Forum. Uh, we're delighted to have you back for today's action-packed um, succession of conversations. And it's a great honor and a privilege to have Heather Connolly with us today. As you all know, she is the president of the German Marshall Fund, Fund of the United States. But more importantly, she's a dear friend. Um, and it's also our pleasure to have such a distinguished um, collection of speakers at this session. Thank you very much, Heather. The floor is yours. Thank you so very much. It is wonderful to be part of this exciting day and to be part of such a distinguished panel. This morning, we're going to talk about NATO in an era of great power competition uh, with some extraordinary voices to help us think through this new era. But I would be remiss if I did not say NATO is in such a stronger position today to face that era of great power competition because we are about to welcome two new members into our family. So ladies and gentlemen, let's just celebrate this historic moment in welcoming Sweden and Finland into NATO. Belgian Prime Minister De Croo and I were talking in the back and we were saying, you know, we get so busy doing the work, we don't take that moment to say we are here as part of history, and that is very exciting. So we, uh, we are waiting for uh, British Foreign Secretary uh, Truss, who is in traffic and will be coming here, but we are going to start unpacking NATO in an era of great power competition. First, we're going to begin with Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo. I'm going to confess to you all, the Prime Minister and I have had a chance to have a conversation earlier this week at, at the Brussels Forum, so we are a little practiced in this <laughs> conversation, but Prime Minister Albanese, watch out. You're, you're going to be pulled in here. But um, uh, Prime Minister, let, let me begin with you, because I think the challenge is not the great power competition. We, we understand that. I believe, and you can, uh, you can press me if you don't agree, I believe the challenge is our competing geopolitical demands. So I'm going to put this more clearly. What's more important is China the pacing challenge. That is the great power that we have to pay attention to. Or quite frankly, over the last four months, it has been clear that Russia 
is the challenge, that if we do not get this, this challenge correct, we cannot get the, uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, correct. So, um, Prime Minister Jakru, let me, let me begin with you. How do you think about the greatest security challenges of our time? How do you, how do you le balance the competing demands of Russia now, obviously for NATO and collective defense, but yet China and the looming challenges of the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, I think it would be a mistake to put, uh, to put Russia and China in the same basket. I, I, I think it's a very different situation. Uh, the Russian challenge is an immediate one, and it's a direct threat to our Western way of life. Because in the end, uh, we have a war on the European continent, but it's much broader than just this war in Ukraine. There is an energy war as well, which is impacting the, the entirety of the world. Uh, there is a disinformation campaign and destabilization campaigns. There is uh, Belarus um, abusing of refugee flows to try to destabilize uh, Lithuania. So our way of life, the Western way of life, is under gigantic pressure. And the answer, I mean, what kind of an answer have we given? As a European Union, I mean, countries are lining up to join the European Union, so it's clear that as European Union, besides soft power and hard power, we also have what I would call seductive power. I mean, we, I mean, yeah, we, we maybe we, we forgot how to seduce because of COVID, <laughs> because we were afraid one of another. But 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 we are. That's attractive. soft power. That's as soft a, as power. a European Union, we are attractive, and look at what NATO has done. I mean, some thought you know NATO will be uh, fragmented, will not be able to, uh, to, to, to stick together. It's actually quite the opposite. And indeed, as you said at the start, what a historic moment with uh, Finland and Sweden, countries who were not member of NATO for a specific reason, who understood that in the world of today, if you're alone in the world of today, it's not a good situation to be in. Countries who are alone today, or they're afraid, or they're on their way to join NATO. And, and, and we are extremely uh, happy to be able to, uh, to, to welcome them and to welcome them at this, uh, at this summit. From my perspective, this summit already is a success. I mean, we still have work to do, but that element, that message that you give to European population and to the rest of the world, especially to Russia, that message could not be clearer. Strength and unity. Mr. Prime Minister, I, I want to just press you on thing. I, I do not know what the strategic concept will, will say. We are all eager to read it. But uh, uh, what press reports are suggesting, and NATO Secretary uh, Stoltenberg, or, uh, Stoltenberg has suggested that the document may say that China poses a challenge to NATO's interests, security, and values. But you would agree with that, although you're not saying that China and Russia are uh, equated. You would agree that China poses a challenge to NATO's interests, security, and values? Well, well look, from, from a European perspective, uh, China is a, a partner. In some domains, we're partners. In fighting climate change, we are a partner. In fighting the pandemic, we were a partner. B, China is a competitor. On the economic side, it's a fierce, uh, it's a fierce competitor, but competition pushes us to be on the top of our toes and see their arrival. And that's quite clear that in a lot of domains they are, uh, they are a rival. But, so it is a country that challenges us, obviously. I think it's good that in the new strategic uh, concept that China has is, is part of that, uh, of, that, uh, of that analysis. But our relation with China is one on different, uh, on different, on different dimensions. I also think that the response we have given to Russia on the aggression on Ukraine is a message related to other security threats that could happen in other places of the world related to China. Okay, fantastic. It's a great segue uh, to welcome Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese with us. First of all, congratulations Thank on you. your election and welcome to your first NATO summit. This is very exciting as, as a partner. Uh, as an, uh, as a, uh, someone who observes China very keenly, um, I would love your perspective on how you see this era of great po uh, power competition as a great partner of NATO and really how you see this era of great power competition and the competing demands, particularly in China, for the Indo-Pacific and in Europe these days, how do you balance those as prime minister? Uh, I think uh, 
Back in Australia, there'd be some people saying, uh, why is the Australian Prime Minister at a NATO conference uh, in, in Madrid? And it's because one of the things that's really been brought home uh, by recent global events, uh, whether it be the pandemic was a reminder, um, various cyber issues a reminder, but also the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has had an impact on our power prices, it's had an impact on global supply chains. It's a reminder that the days of thinking that you can compartmentalise, oh, well, that's an Asia-Pacific issue, that's a European issue, uh, are over, are over if, if ever that was real. And that's why we have a, a direct interest in uh, what is going on in, in, in Ukraine, in the, the consequences of the, the brutal uh, Russian invasion. Uh, that's why Australia is the largest non-NATO contributor uh, to uh, support sovereignty in Ukraine with uh, $285 million so far of defence support and $65 million of humanitarian support. It's because uh, Australia understands very much uh, that what is playing out there has consequences in our own region. If an authoritarian state uh, can uh, attack a sovereign national state in, and seek to enforce uh, its will uh, through uh, brutal military power, then that has implications for the entire region. Now, uh, you know, Australia is in the, the, the part of the world that's the uh, subject of strategic competition with the, the rise of China, uh, the US's historic role, but also the important role that various European powers have played as well, uh, France, Spain, uh, the UK, uh, in our region. And, and, and that's why uh, what is happening in, in Ukraine has to be viewed in, in that context and why uh, in terms of a, a, a global uh, order and uh, the norms of international engagement uh, are being tested here. And the resolve of the world is being tested as well. Uh, does the world say, well, you know, this has been going on for a while, so we'll begin to withdraw uh, our support uh, for uh, the, uh, the struggle that's going on now on the ground in Ukraine? Or do we say, no, that, that is something that we have to step up uh, for? And I think it's very much the latter. And it is, it, it is being watched uh, in, uh, in our region uh, where we have uh, China, who we want peaceful and stable relations with, uh, but uh, the truth is that China has been more forward-leaning into the region. Uh, we've seen an agreement between uh, the Solomons and, and China in our region that is potentially of uh, some concern. And uh, my government in the last month has very much reached out uh, to uh, make sure that we uh, continue to remind, for example, our Pacific Island neighbours that uh, our support uh, comes without strings attached. Uh, we're good neighbours. Uh, we are historically the uh, security partner of choice in the, uh, in the Pacific, uh, along with our, our, our friends. Uh, but it is something that we can't take for granted. Uh, so whereas uh, I, I think historically it, it's fair to say that uh, most Australians wouldn't have thought greatly about Ukraine, uh, they are thinking now. Mm. And there's bipartisan support for the commitments uh, that have been made. Uh, President Zelensky addressed our, our parliament on the last sitting day. On, the day of my, my budget reply as opposition leader. Uh, and uh, there is support for us to continue to engage. And across the political spectrum, there's certainly uh, very broad support uh, for my presence here at NATO. And I think it, that it has been, you know, thank you to NATO and, and its leadership, uh, Jens Stoltenberg in particular, for uh, reaching out and making sure that the Asia Pacific leaders, uh, not just myself, but Japan, Korea and New Zealand uh, are here present as well, which just sends that message to the world as well as specifically to our region uh, that, uh, that it matters what happens here.
strength in numbers, strength in unity. And I think it's uh, equally interesting. The Indonesian president is visiting President Zelensky in Kyiv right now. So that Indo-Pacific uh, element uh, here with Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, let me, let me ask you, because you gave an interview before uh, traveling to Madrid uh, saying that you believe the Chinese government had some lessons to learn from Russia's strategic failure. And I was hoping I could pull that out uh, a little bit because what are, what do you believe following, obviously, politics, domestic internal issues in, in Beijing so closely, what do you think Beijing is internalizing with allied resolve and response to the war in Ukraine? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, objectively, certainly in Australia, when you saw uh, from, uh, you know, one perspective, you have uh, Russia, which has been historically a, a, a very powerful uh, nation state, uh, versus Ukraine, uh, historically not as powerful. Uh, you, uh, I think there was a perception that, that this would be over relatively quickly. There was also a perception that there might be uh, some uh, argument, uh, not about substance, but about uh, process and contribution. And what we've seen is that uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine has produced a more united world in terms of uh, democratic nations and a, a resolve that is uh, strong and clear and uh, I believe will be decisive as well. And that's a, that's a very positive message, uh, that uh, the attack on a sovereign nation uh, won't be uh, just regarded as being just about Ukraine. It is about uh, the way that the, the UN Charter is implemented. It is about the international rule of law. And if, if it is uh, allowed to be subjugated, uh, by brute force, then that does have implications uh, for the region. And I, I'm absolutely certain uh, that uh, China, in terms of the context here, uh, as Russian forces were uh, being mobilised uh, around borders uh, while Olympic Games were going on, you had the uh, partnership without limits uh, signed between China and Russia. And uh, that was... Uh, part of the process leading up to the Russian invasion. And uh, that, I think, uh, shows uh, how interconnected Absolutely. Uh, China and, and, and Russia were. And in terms of the resolve, though, and the response, it, it I think, has been so strong. Yep. And the, the two new potential members of NATO just reinforces that, Absolutely. I think. Uh, in the last 24 hours. Indeed. Well, we are delighted to welcome British Foreign Secretary Liz Trust here with us. Perfect timing. No, 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 you're perfect. And in fact, this is a perfect segue into the question that I was going to ask uh, you as well, Foreign Secretary, because right before coming here, you also gave an interview about the lessons that you believe allies are learning, um, it, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan, how, how they're watching this. And I'd love to pull that thought out, uh, if you don't mind. What do you believe Taiwan, uh, what do you believe the Chinese government is learning from allied unity and resolve uh, over, you, over Ukraine today? Well, thank you. And Oops, I think your microphone is, are we working? Is the microphone working? I don't think so. If not, we'll, that's right, there's a backup plan. That's a good backup plan. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, it's absolutely imperative that we secure Russia's defeat in Ukraine. And it's imperative for the sake of European security, freedom, and democracy. And it's the only way that we are going to achieve a lasting peace in Europe. Uh, there are some who are saying that there could be some possibility of negotiations now, uh, whilst Russia is still in Ukraine. But I think that would bring a false peace, and it would lead to further aggression in the future. And we have to learn the lessons of the past, the failures of the Minsk Protocol, for example, in being able to secure a lasting peace in the area. So my very strong message is we have to defeat Russia first and negotiate later. 
And I completely agree with the Australian Prime Minister that we need to think very carefully about the messages we're sending to President Xi. We've seen increased collaboration between Russia and China, and we know that China is watching Ukraine closely. They're expanding their military capability, and they're extending their global influence. And one significant thing today is that we will see in the new strategic concept put out by NATO specific reference to China, because it isn't just an issue for the Indo-Pacific region. Mm. It's also an issue for Euro-Atlantic security. And I do think that with China extending its influence through economic coercion and building a capable military, there is a real risk that they draw the wrong idea which results in a catastrophic miscalculation, such as invading Taiwan. And that is exactly what we saw in the case of Ukraine, a strategic miscalculation by Putin. So this is why it's so important that the free world work together to help uh, ensure that Taiwan is able to defend itself and to stress the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan states. And what we're doing is making sure that Taiwan has meaningful participation in international org organizations, but also working to strengthen our economic ties with Taiwan. Because this isn't just about hard security, it's also about economic security. I think the lesson we've learned also from the Ukraine crisis is the increased dependency of Europe on Russian oil and gas contributed to a sense in which uh, Russia felt enabled uh, to invade Ukraine because it, they knew it would be very difficult uh, for Europe to respond. So we also need to learn that lesson, I believe, uh, with China of not becoming uh, strategically dependent on China and, in fact, making sure that we have strong alternatives. And not just that the free world has strong alternatives, that also allies such as the Pacific uh, Islands uh, that the Prime Minister was talking about, allies uh, in Southeast Asia, allies in Africa and the Caribbean also have alternatives to China's economic investment. And people will have seen at the G7 the announcement of $600 billion worth of investment through the Global Partnership for Infrastructure Investment Program. And I think that's a very important alternative uh, to the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. So I think there are huge uh, lessons we can learn, and we need to learn them as soon as possible. Foreign Secretary, uh, before you arrived, we were, we, were t we were challenging ourselves on how we balance the competing geopolitical demands. And this is sort of my, who comes first? Is, is China the pacing challenge? And, and we, we need to stabilize the situation in Europe to focus on China. As you said, it's, the game is right now. If we don't get this right in, in Ukraine, and Ukraine wins and prevails, the international system is a very different system for all of us to work at. And I know the Strategic Defense and Security Review had that balance of focusing on Europe, Russia, collective defense, but that tilt to the Indo-Pacific. Help me understand how, how the government is balancing these competing needs, which, which take enormous resources, military, economic, um, and of course, uh, diplomatic investment. Well, the answer is we have to do both. Both. Uh, they're indivisible. And anything that happens that affects Euro-Atlantic security has a negative knock-on effect on Indo-Pacific security and vice versa. That is why it's so important that we have partners like Australia, like South Korea, here at our NATO conference in Europe. And the way I see it is working, and this is... Uh, this is very important in the Indo-Pacific region, is of course countries like Australia are much better versed in the region. This is their neighborhood, Japan as well. So we also need to work through allies, through collaborations like AUKUS, uh, through the Blue Pacific Partnership that we've just launched with the US, Australia, New Zealand and Japan. And I see it as a network, a network of freedom loving countries that work together share expertise, share experience, do things like joint military training. Uh, we had the recent deployment of the carrier strike group out in the Indo-Pacific. But, but we clearly all have specialist expertise in our own neighborhood. So one of the things we've been doing in Ukraine is helping Australia deliver aid into Ukraine uh, through UK routes. 
So I think we can very effectively work together, but that requires us all as allies is, first of all, to be more economically open. Uh, the UK is currently working to join the CPTPP so we can trade more with the Asia Pacific region. I would like to see our American colleagues do that as well. I second and that. And our European mm. colleagues. Uh, we also need to be following through on investment because for too long, the pitch has been left clear to Russia or China to provide security support, to provide investment support. And we know that that is leading countries down the wrong path. So we need to be actively engaged and we need to work with each other to do that. Prime Minister Tucker, I want to bring you in because uh, I know you want to jump in on that, but I want to uh, give a question, and this is like the rapid fire uh, response. Um, so we are united. We see the challenges of both. The, the network is growing of like-minded, but we also see a greater alignment between China and Russia. The U.S. just sanctioned five Chinese companies for supporting Russia's military yesterday. How do you see very quickly this converging alignment is it substantial? Is it convenient? It, they get a vote here, and how does that work? But Prime Minister Dukou, you want to jump in perhaps on what the Foreign Secretary said, and then, but answer that quick question as well for all three, the Sino-Russian engagement. First, on, uh, on, on that, I mean, I would not overemphasize the, the scale of that so-called alignment. Okay. I think there's as many topics on which they are completely misaligned as that the topics that they try to push forward where they are aligned. But I think we have to be extremely clear towards China is that any active support to the aggression of Russia in, in Ukraine cannot, will not go unanswered. I think we have to be extremely clear on that. But on that so-called alliance, I mean, the economic cloud of Russia, it's less than the Benelux. So it's less than Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And we are moderately small countries. So economically, it's, and that compared to China, I mean, how can that be really a sustainable partnership? I mean, it's something like this compared to something gigantic. So it's completely unbalanced. And I think that also in economic and in strategic interest, at some point, it will be unbalanced. So when we see alignment happening, we should point it out, and, and it cannot go um, without a reaction. But in the longer run, I'm, I'm not so convinced of, uh, of, of that. The other point I wanted to make is that, look, we say Ukraine has to win the war. And there's no doubt on that. Now, the question is how? Because, I mean, this might be something that takes a lot of time. And there's different ways of ending a war. As you said, negotiating, but I mean, not in this situation, and to negotiate, it's hard to negotiate with a wall, because no, there's no one there to, to negotiate, and in any case, not in the current circumstances. Second way is with economic sanctions. Now, the economic sanctions, they take time, they hurt on the Russian side, they're hurting here as well. Sure. And, and, and the key point remains, you can do foreign policy and you could do geopolitics as long as your domestic population is still supporting it. And that I think is going to be our main challenge in the months to come, is to protect our population for the effects of what is happening. And that will demand incredible effort from all of us and incredible coordination from all of us, which leaves us to the third element on how this war can be ended is on the battlefield. And that means that supporting Ukraine with weapons delivery, and I think the three of us have done our part in that, but that is going to be the path the only path that will lead to the outcome that we want. And it means that we will have to increase in a dramatic way the support Absolutely. to the Ukrainian, uh, to our Ukrainian friends. Absolutely. Mr. Prime Minister, very quickly on Sino-Russian alignment. Well, China seeks to uh, be the most powerful nation in the world. That's what we're seeing playing out here. That's not, you know, you can have different perspectives on that <laughs> as well. But uh, China seeks through that as well to reach out in opportunistic ways, whether it be uh, a, a, some common sense of uh, a lack of values, as I would say it, uh, that they have in common with Russia in terms of a lack of democratic values uh, that they have, uh, an authoritarian streak. And just as Russia uh, seeks to uh, recreate a sort of Russian or Soviet empire, uh, the uh, Chinese regime is seeking 
uh, friends, uh, whether it be Russia or in the region, uh, through financial, through economic uh, support to uh, build up alliances and to undermine what has uh, historically been uh, the, the Western uh, alliance uh, in uh, places like uh, the, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so it's got to be seen in that, in, in that context uh, as well, which is why uh, Australia, along with our, our friends here in NATO, uh, see that we need to uh, reassert our values in return. Uh, Australia's currently subject of economic coercion uh, from China with sanctions of everything from coal to wine to barley to meat. Uh, and uh, we assert with the change of government that our values don't change. Uh, our capacity to trade off our values for short-term economic interest will not be done either. We assert that uh, those sanctions, uh, there, there's no basis for it and they should be removed. Uh, so we want good relations uh, with our, our major trading partner is, uh, uh, has been China. Uh, but what that means as well is that the world, one of, part of the response to China and Russia uh, coming together has to be trade diversification in our, in our case, has to be uh, greater economic strength. That's one of the reasons why uh, one of the discussions I've been having over the last couple of days here is uh, the Australia-European uh, trade agreement uh, needs to be progressed. Uh, Like-minded countries need to engage with each other and support each other because uh, that's happening for uh, non, the non-democratic world. Uh, the democratic world has to respond. Absolutely. Um, Foreign Secretary, I, I'd love your thoughts uh, very quickly on the Sino-Russian uh, alignment and how concerned you are about that, whether it's in international organizations like the Security Council or military exercises in the Indo-Pacific. Well, it's certainly very worrying that China is now making statements about NATO. It's making statements about the sovereignty of the Falklands Islands and really uh, moving uh, from the Indo-Pacific sphere to also challenge, and this is why it's so important, NATO response uh, with our strategic concept that specifically references China. Uh, it's also very clear that Russia is the junior partner in this relationship, and I think that should give pause, to f pause for thought to countries like India. And I do think there is an opportunity, as well as working more closely with our, our Australian friends and um, we created a blueprint of a trade deal that now can be used with the European <laughs> Union uh, Prime Minister and joining CPTPP. We are negotiating a trade deal with India. I know Australia has already done that as well. So I think there is an opportunity when we see the alignment of these two authoritarian regimes for democracies, for free nations to work more closely together. And I think more, I think more countries now see the imperative of doing that. And it's no longer good enough to look inward and to be protectionist or defensive. We need to reach outward and create that network of liberty of fellow like-minded countries. And if you look at the G7, which I think has been a real force in this conflict, the G7 has been the coordinating body for sanctions. People said it couldn't be done, but we've now delivered over six waves of sanctions on Russia. We represent 50% of GDP. And if you, ask friend, if you add friends like Australia and South Korea, it's even more than that. And we need to use that economic weight to challenge that coercive behavior. So if one of our number is targeted with coercion, the entire free world and those economies can respond. And I think historically, we haven't used that economic power. We've been equidistant, if you like, in terms of who we trade with, who we work with. And I think countries are becoming much more focused now on is this trade with trust? Do we trust this partner? Are they going to use it to undermine us or are they going to use it for the mutual benefit of both of our economies? So trade has got a lot more geopolitical as well as uh, the security relationships we're developing too.
Can, can, I, can I just make, make this point as well? What's playing out in Sri Lanka at the moment mm. uh, should cause pause for thought as well. We have uh, an economic catastrophe playing out there. Uh, China uh, using that to assert uh, political influence. And it, it should be a, uh, I agree with what uh, the Foreign Secretary has said in terms of uh, using our economic influence. Uh, China uh, seeks to use its economic power in, in a very overt way. Uh, and uh, when uh, we've seen a, a withdrawal of strategic errors by, uh, by uh, Australia at one stage with uh, a withdrawal of, of foreign aid or a reduction in the region, what we saw is a step in. Yeah. So we can't have any stepping back uh, because uh, the void will be filled and it will be filled with, uh, with strings. And I think our, our approach towards development, uh, I think that the G7 decision of uh, just uh, the past couple of days to provide uh, a, an alternative in the new threats and challenges. The good news is that we are not alone. NATO is working closely with uh, like-minded countries. We are happy to uh, have the Prime Minister of Australia here, among others, as is well reflected by the participation during the summit of 11 invited countries, eight of which are at leaders' level. Uh, in, in this summit, we are strengthening our ties with our partners in the East, the South, and in the Indo-Pacific. I also truly believe that uh, in order to adapt uh, the transatlantic security system to face the new challenges, we must, we, we must strengthen the relations between the European Union and NATO, uh, making uh, the, the complementary um, uh, to one another. Uh, th this is why tonight we will have, uh, for the first time ever, an informal Euro-Atlantic dinner at the Prado Museum. For the first time, I repeat, we will bring together allies, the member states of the European Union, uh, and the European Union and NATO institutions. I know uh, one thing for sure, which is that we, we want peace, stability, certainty. We must work together and put the necessary means for the alliance to provide such peace, stability, and certainty for our societies. The war in Ukraine, my dear friends, has thought us uh, that we cannot take uh, them for granted. We, we must strive uh, to help uh, them. So thank you very much. Congratulations to El Instituto del Cano. And thank you very much for the participation of this uh, panel of uh, uh, leaders at the European level and uh, global level. Thank you very much. Well, colleagues, thank you very much. Stay in your seats. Don't go anywhere. Please, but thank again the Prime Ministers and Foreign Secretary for joining us. Thank you. And so now we will transition here. So colleagues, we will ask you thank you so much. I have to disconnect from this too. I'm going to stay hooked.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you will please take your seats and we will let the Prime Ministers and the Foreign Secretary be able to depart. They have some important business to do. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're about to begin the next session. So much for getting this crowd together. Oh, oh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please, please take your seat. We'd like to get ready for our next panel. I'm going to all right, everyone can please take your seats. We're going to continue our great conversation. And we are going to bring colleagues from Brussels into this conversation, live from the German Marshalls Fund Mar uh, Brussels Forum. And I don't know whether we will be able to see them or not. Okay, thank you all. That was a great session, and I, you can feel good energy in, in the room. Well, first of all, let me, um, because I did not say it, let me give a huge shout out to Charles Powell and all of our colleagues at the Elcano Institute who've done an amazing job. Uh, it takes a village to put on something this significant. And so just, uh, uh, just a huge, huge thanks to our friends at Elcano. We have um, five, yeah, thank you, absolutely. So for this panel, we have five experts, two, two cities, one moderator in less than 45 minutes to dig into a lot of the conversation we just had with our leaders meeting. So, oh, there we are. I see our friends at the Brussels Forum. So let me begin uh, by bringing uh, my colleague, Alice Ekman, uh, senior Asian analyst from the European Institute of Strategic Studies. Alice is in our Brussels Forum. Uh, studio uh, in Brussels. Alice, can what? you hear me? Yes, and I can correct that it's European Union Institute for Security Studies. Apologies for that. Oh my goodness, I, I, that was, I apologize if I misread that. I apologize. <laughs> Alice, welcome. I wanted to start with you. We're going to dig into this conversation of NATO in an era of great power competition because as, as you might have heard, 
we had a lively discussion, particularly with Prime Minister Albanese, on, yeah. on thinking through China. Um, and what do you think the lessons that the Chinese government are learning from allied I'll, unity I'll in the war in Ukraine? Well, I think China did not need Russia to draft a strategy towards Taiwan. That's, that's important to have in mind. China's uh, ambition to so-called reunify with Taiwan is, is, uh, is in the pipeline for quite some time. Um, now, of course, China is certainly watching closely the recent development, but I think um, we should, I mean, it's very hard to guess what Xi Jinping and his advisors have in mind and, and drawing the lesson, I don't really like the, this, this uh, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, this questioning in the sense that I think um, China knows that it has several tools at its disposal uh, uh, to promote its strategy towards Taiwan. And as a military option, it only, is only one of the many uh, options that China has at its disposal. There is cyber uh, attacks, information warfare, lawfare. The, that has been used against Hong Kong in different terms because status of Hong Kong is of course different, but it's important to have this in mind. And also, I don't like the really much the question of I mean drawing lesson, and it's not to, to it's, it's not to be critical here about the, the format of the discussion, but it's more about it, it implies that we draw rational lesson or that Beijing and Moscow are drawing rational lessons from a situation that is rational. But the situation is not rational at all, <laughs> I'm sorry to say. Um, and, and we have been uh, witnessing very clearly that uh, economic rationality is not a driver of uh, Beijing position towards uh, toward, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, as you all know, the trade uh, volume between the EU and China is much more important, much more significant than between China and Russia, but still uh, that doesn't shape or readjust China's position towards Russia's invasion of Ukraine at all. A completely different example, far away from Ukraine, but that underlines the, I would say, limited impact of economic rationality uh, is the impact of the national security uh, uh, law that has been adopted in summer 2020 towards Hong Kong. It led to a reduction of Hong Kong economic attractiveness, but the aim was a political, uh, political gain. So um, I think if we have to draw a lesson, it's uh, from, from, from the situation, is that uh, now I think positioning is becoming more and more ideological to a sense that economic rationality is not the main explainer or the main driver of uh, Beijing or Moscow's uh, uh, positioning and cooperation in the long term. And I believe uh, Sino-Russian uh, relationship is much more than a marriage of convenience. I know we, we discussed about, about this, uh, the nature of the relationship in the previous panel, but it's very important to, to, to underline that uh, it's not just about energy cooperation, economic cooperation, it's much more and this is the joint cooperation in multilateral system uh, to reshape global governance toward the post-Western order, uh, that we'd like it or not. It is written black and white in the 4th of February uh, joint statement. And it's also about coalition building. Uh, but coalition building in an informal way, uh, uh, not by signing formal alliance treaty, but by uh, trying to challenge uh, the current alliance system as much as possible. And as the uh, previous panel mentioned, NATO itself is seen as an enemy, both uh, from Moscow perspective and Beijing perspective. Uh, Wang Yi, the um, state councillor and minister of foreign affairs in his annual press conference, uh, mentioned that he sees the Indo-Pacific strategy as a new form of NATO in Asia that is uh, not legitimate and doomed to fail. So the, the, set, uh, the scene is, is clearly set here. Elise, thank you so much, and I, I apologize again for uh, mispronouncing your title. And I, I think you, you've really raised an important, uh, important element, the irrationality. Do not analyze this through the lens of Western logic. It does not exist. Thank you so much. Let me turn again also uh, in Brussels, uh, David Ignatius, uh, columnist of the Washington Post and trustee of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, David, wonderful to have you. I wanted to ask you, uh, because you, you have such great insights into not only the, where the Biden administration is heading, but the sort of the, the pulse of public opinion. Belgian Prime Minister de Croo has really made a point of saying, guys, this is a long grinding war. We have to ensure our public 
understands that the sacrifices we are going to have to make, I would welcome your reflections on sort of how you view public op opinion and certainly the political willingness to take the sacrifice that is necessary to allow Ukraine to win. So David, over to you, thank you. Well, first, uh, Heather, I've heard from every uh, European uh, I've talked to here and also the Americans the same uh, repeated insistence that uh, over time Ukraine must win, uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia must lose. That was the outcome of our debate last night, and I think it's strongly felt. And, and to succeed in that uh, requires uh, discipline and focus. So I worry about anything that dilutes NATO's focus at this moment of great challenge on that goal. It's going to require enormous discipline. Uh, it requires the opposite of dilution of effort or expansion of mission. So while I'm interested in the strategic concept that speaks of the Indo-Pacific as an area, obviously, of importance uh, to NATO, I, I, I worry about completing first jobs first. Uh, and the first requirement now is that NATO follow through uh, in its uh, support for Ukraine, um, in its protection of its own members and, and, and territory. The NATO alliance is built around what's supposed to be an ironclad commitment in Article 5 to mutual uh, self-defense. And before we begin to think about extending that, uh, into the Indo-Pacific, uh, begin a new phase of thinking about NATO expansion. Let's make sure that NATO in its core uh, home is succeeding. I just would make one final point, uh, Heather. Looking back at the Atlantic Charter of 1949 that created NATO, it's really interesting that the preamble of the charter, while this was a defensive alliance born in a period of great power competition, insisted that NATO's purposes were aligned with those of the United Nations. Indeed, in Article 5 itself, the commitment to mutual defense, uh, the promise that an attack on uh, any one member is an attack on all, is immediately followed by a paragraph saying any such conflicts and response will immediately be referred to the United Nations Security Council, and the end of any such conflicts will be uh, arbitrated in line with the Security Council. The advantage of that, I think, is that from the beginning, NATO was about enforcing this rules-based order symbolized by the United Nations. The United Nations has not been an effective vehicle for ensuring that rules-based order. But as we think about this new uh, era, the new challenges, finding a way to see if the United Nations can be a more uh, coherent uh, uh, instrument uh, in alliance with NATO, in alliance with the other partnerships the United States has now in Asia, uh, I think is, is, is of first importance. David, thank you so much. I'm now going to turn back here to the panel in Madrid. Uh, Julia Yaffe, journalist, founding partner, and Washington correspondent of Puck News. Julia, I am a groupie. I follow you on Twitter, so I'm going to be, you know, true confession. Um, you really have a strong sense of, you know, the, the, the Putin regime. And I want to pick up on Alice's point about the irrationality of Putin's decision making and how we as an alliance can, can try to make it as stable and predictable around that irrationality. And then exactly to David's goal, I mean, part of Russia's great power status was certainly being on the UN Security Council and, and I think it sees its waning strength to, to, to align with China to preserve its own great power status. So help us understand as best as we can, uh, Russia is trying to remain this great power, but the strategic miscalculations are more, it's, are, it's accelerating uh, its, its diminution. So I would push back a little bit on the framework that uh, Putin's thinking is irrational. Sorry. I, I think that's not, it did, you know what, can we have a microphone? And I think that will help us immeasurably, if I knew where the microphones were. Uh, do we have a microphone here, please, sir? We want to get all these words of wisdom. <laughs> we need a good microphone for it. What's that? Yeah, I think she just needs a microphone. 
or I'm going to come over to you and you're going to talk loudly. <laughs> There you go, let's borrow that. COVID. <laughs> um, I was gonna push back a little bit on the, on the, here we go. I love you, but. Thank you, I know. It's a little too, it's a little too close for comfort. Thank you, okay. that, was, that was good troubleshooting. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm always on plan B. Resilience, NATO resilience, <laughs> ugh, got it. So, um, I, I w as I was gonna say, is I, I wanna push back a little bit on the framework of rational and irrational. I think the idea that the Western uh, framework of thinking about things as rational and the Russian one as irrational is problematic. I think Putin operates within his own framework of rationality. It makes sense in his universe. It is rational for him. Uh, he has never been a great strategic genius. He is good tactically and he kind of has a long vision and is really good at like kind of the short steps and then everything in between is it gets a little hazy. But I think in the sense of his point of view, this was unfinished business. Uh, he has become more and more uh, interested in his own historical legacy and thinking about how he will be remembered in the history books along with Peter the Great and Catherine the Great and I think he wants to be Vladimir the Great. So I think in his point of view, uh, this was a very important war to start, and now he cannot lose. Uh, that is all in his kind of framework, that is rational. So uh, I would caution against thinking about things as rational and irrational and try to enter the mindset of the actors we're talking about. As for institutions like NATO and the UN, uh, I think if before Russia was trying to be part of these uh, institutions, like what was once the G8, uh, the UN Security Council. Now it's about showing the hollowness of these institutions mm. and using, you know, the seat on the Security Council to um, undermine what the West is doing. To constantly, especially after what happened in Libya in 2011, um, it said in Moscow that that was why Dmitry Medvedev didn't get a second term in the Kremlin because. He basically, his administration voted the wrong way in 2011. So, um, and I think that's what Putin was ultimately trying to get uh, in the lead up to the war, was a veto power over European security w within the kind of, or on top of the NATO structure. And I think that is where uh, Russia and China share goals, which is to undermine the hegemony of the US, the post-Cold War hegemony of the US, in part by showing the hollowness of institutions like the UN, like NATO, uh, by pushing constantly to see what they will do, how they will react, and then when they don't, uh, you even have Volodymyr Zelensky saying at the UN Security Council after Bucha, what is the point of you if you cannot prevent atrocities like this? I think you said it again almost yesterday at the Security Council over right. the, the bomb. So, so he's even, you know, Putin has even gotten his arch enemy to admit as much to their faces. So I think uh, your colleague is right that it's more than just an economic relationship. I think there's an ideological anti-Western alignment there too. Wow, let me, let me go back to Brussels and bring in Carl Bildt, um, co-chair of the European Council on Foreign Relations, former uh, prime minister and foreign minister of Sweden. But Carl, before we dive into this, I want your statement on this historic day for Sweden. We'll get into the great power competition in just a second, but I, I wanna hear what your thoughts are right now on this day. Well, we aren't there yet. Um, we <laughs> have right. now, I guess, we will receive an invitation to start negotiations on membership of NATO. I do hope those can be done fairly quickly. That's what Jens Stoltenberg said. Then a process of ratification by all of the 30 members, and then we will become members of NATO. It is, of course, momentum decisions that was taken by the leaders or the politicians of Finland and Sweden a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, after a very quick process after February 24th, and I do hope, hope that we will get a fairly expeditious process uh, until we can formally enter the Atlantic Alliance in the next few months, I would hope. Well, yes, there's process, but I'm going to celebrate the, the moment indeed. So Carl, help us understand where you think Putin is right now uh, in his thinking um, and how confident are you that 
Europe, the United States, our allies and partners do have the stamina to sustain Ukraine in the next couple of months. This, this is going to get even more difficult, I believe, in the following weeks and months. This will get more difficult. War is an exceedingly costly business, and this war is likely to go on for quite some time. Putin is in a rendezvous, his own personal rendezvous with Russian history, and he's not going to give up. He is driven, I, I agree very much. I mean, he, he is, from his point of view, is rational. Uh, sorry to say. I mean, the only thing that I can compare with in sort of modern or semi modern European history is, sorry to say, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler was driven by his version, his mission out of German history to make the Third Reich, the Third German Empire, to create a Lebensraum, as he said, for the German people to get rid of the nation of Poland, which he considered to be something unnecessary, created by Versailles. And much the same way with uh, Putin. He has his own vision of a recreated Russian empire, of getting rid of Ukraine, which he considers a threat to that particular vision of a greater Russian empire. He's right in that particular respect. And his absolute conviction that the outcome of this particular war will determine his place in Russian history. He's right in that as well. Uh, but I think we need to be aware of the, of the historical significance and the weight that he personally attaches to this particular endeavor. And that means that he is not going to give up easily, uh, to put it very mildly. That means that we must have the staying power um, both in terms of the military support, the political support, and the financial support, and the human support necessary to make it possible for Ukraine to survive and to win. Because if they were to lose and Putin were to win, which I consider nearly inconceivable, the consequences for all of Europe, and for all of the global order, by the way, will be momentous in its uh, negative implications. Carl, thank you so much. I'm going to turn back here to Madrid with Luis Simon, Director of the Brussels Office and Senior Analyst, analyst at the Elcano Royal Institute. Luis, you are a student, have been a long student of NATO, but from Madrid, you can always feel the tension a little bit from the challenges to NATO's east, but yet the challenge that, that still come and emanate from the south. And Madrid's and the Spanish government's strong concern that NATO balance that as we now look even farther afield in the Indo-Pacific. Help us understand from a Spanish perspective how in an era of great power competition can we balance these great powers but also not lose that focus of the, the, the challenges that emanate from the South. Thanks, Heather. Uh, that, that's a great question. And thanks to the organizers, by the way, for a brilliant uh, job. Um, so um, I think that that's, this is indeed a priority for the, uh, for the Spanish government, uh, I think. And, 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 and indeed, there, there are multiple, multiple levels, because on the, one, on the one hand is how do you balance the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. I think the South is sort of part of the, of the Euro-Atlantic uh, security picture. And my sense is that there is a growing consensus, and w w again, we need to see what the strategic concept says about this uh, today or tomorrow, whenever it, it is released. Uh, but my sense is that there is a growing consensus uh, within NATO that you cannot treat the eastern flank and the southern neighborhood as silos, because uh, not least because Russia is actually increasingly present in the, in the southern neighborhood. And, uh, uh, and in fact, I mean, we've seen it in Syria, we've seen it in Mali, and multiple, uh, multiple other places. So I, I think the feeling, uh, uh, certainly here in Spain, and, 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 uh, and I would say even beyond, is that Russia aims to uh, sort of subvert the European security architecture. Uh, so it is poking wh wh wherever it sees opportunity. So it's not treating uh, the East and the South as silos, but it's looking at it comprehensively uh, as part of an integrated picture. Uh, and my sense is that NATO is sort of trying to adapt to, uh, to, to look at it that way as well. Uh, having said that, I wouldn't say that the main challenges coming from the South uh, emanate from great power competition and, 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 and from Russia and China. So I'm not saying that great power competition will be the main lens through which NATO will look at the South. There are transnational challenges there which is, are just as relevant, if not more, like terrorism, uh, 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 you know, the climate security nexus and so on that we were discussing yesterday. But I think the great power competition lens will also be increasingly relevant in NATO conversations on, on the South. 
Well, yeah, just jump please, in real quick. Please, I was going to. Um, also, you know, you have Russia trying to actively undermine the territorial integrity of Spain, right, by by sponsoring and fomenting separatist movements in Spain. That's so, right. absolutely, I was going to say, and because of the product of the war and this global food crisis, we are going to see uh, the the crises, both from food, climate. Uh, the, this is going to bubble up and certainly confront uh, our southern NATO allies with a, a lot more challenges. Okay, I would like to do a quick rapid round. One, one question to all, rapid fire. Elise, I'm going to start with you. We have an amazing uh, array of expertise here. So from your individual perspective, what are you watching for in the next uh, coming weeks and months on the great power competition spectrum? Something that you're watching closely as a sign of either uh, NATO is strengthening and winning, uh, or the authoritarians may be gaining. So, Elise, what are you watching for in great power competition? Not maybe the 20th Party Congress coming up, or uh, you're such an excellent China watcher. So, help us understand what you're watching in the Indo Pacific. Yeah, unfortunately, none of us as Isaac are excellent because the opacity surrounding the party is so big that we have to be modest here. But I'm certainly a China watcher. What I'm watching is China's diplomatic activism while we are focusing on on on, on Ukraine and and when we are we are a meeting at this forum, China now is trying to revive the BRICS, uh, which is not a security institution, as you know, but it's trying to say that it represents much more in terms of population than the G7 population. For for instance, so China is also very engaged in trying to maintain Russia at the G20 and other multilateral forum that other countries w would like uh, uh, China not to be uh, Russia not to be present. So China is very uh, active diplomatically. It also has launched a group of friends at the UN. You know, group of friends in defense of the UN Charter, a group of friends for uh, uh, development, uh, global development concept. It has also launched a so-called uh, global uh, security initiative. I mean. China China is very active diplomatically at the UN and other institutions. We mentioned the BRICS, also the SEO is to, is to be watched. And what I'm looking at is the battle of coalition, uh, to be honest. Uh, while the, uh, the, the alliance is, uh, is uh, reinforcing here and, and also clarified and, uh, and strengthened in different ways and also thinking strategically about uh, adjustment, conceptual adjustment and concrete adjustment, uh, China at the same time sees the great power competition, not just as a competition between Washington and Beijing, but between a group of countries, and has a coalition building strategy, which is uh, not uh, completely weak, <laughs> I must say. I mean, we should not underestimate China's po potential to gather so-called friends uh, around its concept and initiative, and because the objective in the end, f from Beijing perspective, is to marginalize a lie, to say, sure, you may be strong, you may be consolidated, but in total, you're not so many countries in terms of voting power at the UN, or just uh, in terms of population. We may disagree with that, but the initiative is, is very is very much active, and China is reinforcing this diplomatic activism by a communication strategy, which uh, try to push the argument saying that if the world is facing food shortage or other issues, it's because of Western sanction. So basically, the West would be, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the cause of all the, the, the great trouble of the world. And in the end, you know, again, I, I want to underline that, but uh, Beijing is very much pointing at the U.S. and NATO as a prime responsible for the war in Ukraine. Of course, uh, this is far too simplistic, but it's important to see here that we have a full battle of coalition, not just in terms of diplomatic activism, coalition building, but also a communication war that I think needs to be addressed because we are moving far, far, far away from facts. Well, Lisa, I mean, I just saw today that Iran is asking to be now included in the BRICS formulation, um, and uh, you're right on communication. We are not winning the stratcoms in the global south, for sure. David, what are you watching for in, uh, in the coming weeks and months? And I just would note that uh, Putin has told us he is going to attend the G20, which will put a lot of pressure on whether other leaders will be uh, attending that as well. But David, what are you watching for? First, I think uh, Russia and China uh, lacking the, the great gift that the United States has of having allies and partners is looking for them. So we see Putin traveling to uh, his 
neighbors, uh, Tajikistan, I think, and, and another country on his periphery, um, the Chinese looking for allies in the BRICS. I just, I think that's a, an effort that's um, uh, late and is, is likely to, to cause as many problems for Russia and China as it does create benefits. The, the fundamental trends that I'm seeing, Heather, are that the center of gravity of NATO is moving east uh, with the strength uh, of the eastern flank and north with the addition uh, of Finland and Sweden. Uh, if the center point of NATO was somewhere uh, in the mid-Atlantic, it's now a little further uh, east and, and, and north. And I think that's um, good and important, especially at a time when NATO members uh, understandably doubt the long-term staying power of the U.S. commitment to NATO through different uh, administrations. I, I think we should talk about the efforts the U.S. is making in the Indo-Pacific to form other regional alliances. I, I'm interested that NATO wants to assert an interest in the Indo-Pacific, but the U.S. has done a pretty good job of developing NATO-like communities of interest uh, in the Indo-Pacific to buffer the conflict between the United States and China. I think that's really valuable, that there not be one tripwire that then instantly gets you in, into an Article Five world, but instead, these good allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia, other allies in the Indo-Pacific, maybe uh, uh, India in, in some form. Uh, and, and what I see ahead, uh, Heather, is a common operating system for the network of partnerships and alliances that the United States leads in Asia and the NATO alliance that the United States leads, helps lead in, in Europe. The idea that the two would become uh, the same and have indistinguishable obligations. Um, I think we're a long way from that, but a, a common operating system for these alliances, defensive alliances of democracies, strikes me as really a good thing. Dave, that's a really keen insight, and that need for, we call the needing the bridge between the transatlantic and the transpacific and building those more durable mechanisms, fantastic. Julie, what are you watching? Is it anything to do with Vladimir Putin's health? That's what I know. Just teasing. Um, I think he's fine for a 70-year-old Russian man, um, okay. which, I mean, he's outlived much of his cohort, but I think he's fine. And I think the you know attention to his health and the idea that if he were to die tomorrow is a lot of wishful thinking. I don't know that the war would end with his dying. Um, Remember, he started his presidency with a manufactured war to give him legitimacy. I think whoever would come after him would have to do the same, probably by continuing this war. But I'm watching for two things, and they're much more granular. Uh, I'm watching you know, the what's happening on the field of battle. I think that's just extremely important. It looks like Russia is has been pretty successful in the Donbass, once it kind of learned from its early blunders and refocused on a smaller area, it's now stepping up its attacks on Kiev and Mykolaiv on the Black Sea coast. Um, so, which is what a lot of us feared that once they get most of the Donbass, they would start again trying for the, you know, taking the bigger bite that they wanted to back in February. And the second thing I'm looking for is to see how how China is going to continue and whether China is going to continue walking this tightrope and kind of talking out both sides of its mouth. And if they're going to step into the breach that is left by the export bans, the technological export bans by the West, uh, because Russia will run out of microchips and semiconductors, et cetera. And I, I'll be watching to see if, if uh, China steps into that breach with spare parts, et cetera, that Russia needs to keep not just its economy going, but its army going in Ukraine. So Judah, just that's what I'm watching. And I think that's where, as an alliance, we're not prepared. If China does go full in and does support uh, the Kremlin, the sanctions that would come from the US, the secondary sanctions that would have huge impacts on European economies. I, I watch that very carefully. Carl, what are you watching? You watch so much. What, what, what are you focusing on? Well, I mean, first, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, and let me add three things which I think are important. One is for NATO to turn into concrete reality what Secretary General Stoltenberg said the other day, um, sort of beefing up the Eastern Front. Um, and that's not just giving a headline number, but I mean concrete units that are going to be there 
the Baltic states, in Poland, in Romania, in order to really assure the security of the countries that are most exposed to what is now happening. Second thing, why I was, to be quite honest, disappointed with the G7 in Elmo, I would have wait, I would have expected some sign of a readiness to discuss how to break the blockade of Odessa port, because that is extremely important both for the supply of food to the world, uh, it's a global obligation, you might say, but also extremely important to the development of the Ukraine economy. Uh, but evidently one relies on negotiations through the UN with Russia. I can say with confidence they are going to go absolutely nowhere until they know, the Russians, that there are nations that are willing to do concrete things to unblock Odessa. Third thing, uh, war is costly. Ukraine will need not only military equipment but also money. We are talking about five to seven billion dollars a month, or euros, in order to get, have the Ukrainian state sustainable without financing through debt and inflation and whatever. And the magnitude of that needs to be realized by the EU, by the US, and by the UK somewhat more clearly than we've seen so far. Carl, thank you. Luis, what are you watching? So thanks, Heather. I, that's, uh, that's, there are a lot of things to watch, right? But I think if, if, if uh, you're asking about the next few months, I, I would agree with Julia here. I think we need to pay attention to the situation on the ground in, in Ukraine, right? And, uh, and uh, in particular, whether there, there will be any more clarity in terms of the military and political outcome, uh, what kind of uh, footprint Russia will have militarily in the country and how it will be uh, uh, geographically uh, distributed. Uh, because, I mean, this is a question that is very important as NATO continues to think about its deterrent strategy and its posture in the East after Madrid, right? And also as the U.S. in particular, if we're talking about great power competition, as the U.S. continues to think about how to prioritize, as you were saying, between the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, let's see what the national security strategy has to say about this. Let's say what the national defense strategy has to say about this in terms of uh, force posture, but also force structure. Uh, and whether it's geared more towards uh, your Atlantic related contingencies or in the Pacific. And it's not a binary choice, but there are uh, some, 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 some trade-offs. And also going back to what, uh, what, uh, what Julia was saying, I, I couldn't be more agreement, also how all of this uh, impinges on, on the Sino-Russian uh, Sino relationship, right? And, and whether China can manage to uh, continue to, um, uh, to have it both ways as it's trying to do. Fantastic. Well, I have to say, the, the thing I thought someone might mention, but I'm really glad no one did, no one said the U.S. midterm elections. All right. So that's fantastic. All right. So we are going to do a two-city question. So if I can turn to my colleague, Ian Lesser, who's our GMF Brussels director. Ian, could you get us a question from our wonderful Brussels office? And then once that question is taken, I'm going to take a question from our Madrid office. So get your hands raised if you'd like, and then we will... Uh, uh, direct those questions in our last three minutes here for the panel to answer. Ian, over to you. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a hugely important thing that we do. I mean, you can lose focus. On, it's, 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 you know, it's a thing that we do that has long duration. You know, it has... It's, uh, Ian, uh, can, you, can we take a question from the right. audience? I do magically have a microphone it because I do though. have a question oh, that I have perfect. been tapped to ask. So perhaps if, <laughs> if you're able to hear me. Um, so my name is Danielle Pitskevich. I am with the Young Professional Summit here. Um, the issue with discussing great power competition is that we're looking at winners and losers. I'm over here. Sorry, everyone. Uh, we're looking at it's not going to be as binary as a winner or a loser. And so if we're looking at a winning scenario, what does this mean um, with, of course, with, with uh, Mr. Ignatius mentioned, we have distractions when we have the next crisis, when we have, uh, you know, another pandemic, when fatigue sets in. What is we? What do we consider as a winning scenario? And is this going to be an economic, a military, or a winning scenario in values, or can we have all of the above? So that's my question to you all. Oh, fantastic! I'm going to shoot one to Fred Kemp here, right in the front, president of the Atlantic Council. Is anyone with a microphone? If not, you can come up here and I go do. to the podium. Actually, Fred, I, if they don't have—oh, oh yeah, Julia has a microphone. Fred, come on down. Come on down. 
We've got to share. Out. Yeah, exactly. I could share my headpiece, but that didn't go too well the last time. So, Come on up here. <laughs> so, Heather, I'm going to disappoint you and ask the midterm election question. Um, uh, I, but I really want to do it for the, our non-American friends. Uh, so, uh, Carl and others, uh, obviously Sweden, Finland coming in, but at the same time, uh, they're making a bet on the solidity of uh, the U.S. future and U.S. future support of NATO. I'd just like to hear how the non-Americans in this panel are looking at this. Oh, okay. So, well, maybe I'll, Carl, uh, I'll send the midterm election question to you, and maybe I'll send um, our question about what do we win? How do we win? Um, Elise, I'm going to turn that one to you. What does winning look like in the values, the economic, and the military field? So, Carl, I'll go ahead and take the midterm question first, and then Elise, you can end, end for us. Well, I'm not an expert on US politics. There are better voices available on that. I would be more concerned with the 2024 presidential elections, uh, because who sits in the White House is, of course, critical to the credibility of NATO, to be quite precise. Uh, what NATO does in a crisis situation is very much dependent upon what the man and the, or the woman sitting in the Oval Office decides to do. So that is fairly fundamental. But then, of course, we Europeans need to do more. No question about that. And you see that happening. I mean, nation after nation saying we have to do 2%. Uh, we have to beef up different structures. You have seen quite impressively in this crisis the European Union stepping up as a security alliance. The leadership provided by Ursula von der Leyen and by Mario Draghi in giving candidate status, saying we take on a commitment to open our doors to Ukraine, to make it a member country of our union, is quite fundamental. Uh, but that will require further strengthening of European resources, and uh, resources both military and otherwise in the years to come. Thanks. So well beyond, we do respect, to the midterm elections, well beyond that. Well, Europe has got to stay strong no matter what. Elise, a very quickly in our last few seconds here, what does winning look like? Very difficult to answer that question. I think we have to be here rational and concrete. Winning is first and foremost military victory because we are facing war. And uh, I mentioned before communication war. I mentioned also ideological wars. I think these are very much ongoing. And I, I really dare to, to mention the word ideology because um, I, I, you know there is question about to what extent we are facing a war between democracy and authoritarian regime. Uh, it's a question that is asked to us, but it's also a question that is asked uh, from another perspective. And from Beijing perspective, because I'm a China analyst, so I have to, to wonder what, what with Beijing perspective, is that yes, we are in a war of political system. In 2014, Xi Jinping mentioned that he believes in, a, uh, a, in the superiority of uh, communism over capitalism and the ultimate victory of communism over capitalism. You may disagree of, what, you know, of the definition of it, and we may ask him what does he mean by communism or capitalism, but he sees the current global tension, not just in Europe but elsewhere in the world, as a battle between political system, and he believes that as a matter of survival for the, his own political system, it's important not only to resist democratic threat but to fight back and weaken democracies. I'm, I'm sorry to say, but I'm convinced, there is no doubt about it, that China is engaged in a normative uh, competition that is not just about uh, competition for influence and, and for you know, uh, just becoming the number one economy in the world. Uh, China and Russia converge in terms of ideology because they share uh, similar political features and they believe that democracies are threat for their regime. So, that said, yeah, I believe that we are engaged in an ideological war, and therefore it's important to fully take that into account to shape uh, future strategies on, uh, on member state side and uh, institutional side as well. Well, to win great power competition, you have to know why you're in the fight, and uh, normative is it doesn't get any more important than that. Colleagues, I have to confess to you, I have never moderated a two-city panel, so I think I've just I've hit that on my bucket list. Uh, just a quick uh, shout out and farewell to Brussels Forum. I had to leave my own conference uh, to come down to Madrid, so a fair, uh, wonderful farewell to all my colleagues there, and special thanks to David, to Carl, to Elise for, for really uplifting and insightful conversation, and then to my Madrid team here, to Julia and Luis, 
thank you all so much for a rich discussion. I am so much smarter now than I was when I started this morning, thanks to you all. And with that, please join me in thanking our fantastic panel. God, I'll clap. Okay.
it's always like... So, good morning again, and if I can all, if I can encourage you all to take your seats again for the next session, please, ladies and gentlemen. We would be very grateful so that we can get started. You can please join us in the room again, take your seats. There's a bit of a disruptive group over there. <laughs> if I may encourage you to take your seats, please. Thank you very much. Please feel free to occupy the seats in the center, which I think are free. Don't be shy. Yeah, okay. Well, let me welcome you back then to this session on advancing NATO's technological edge, which, as you know, is an issue that's going to figure very prominently in the new strategic concept, and one which was being discussed at great length, uh, at least prior to the 24th of February, which slightly interfered with many of our pre-existing plans, as you all know. And we have a wonderful panel, which is going to be moderated um, by Natalia uh, Drozdiak, and she works at Bloomberg, where she currently covers NATO and EU foreign policy. But prior to that, she specialized in uh, technological issues for some six years. And so I'm, I hope that she doesn't mind us dragging back into her <laughs> former field of expertise. 
Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I, I have the pleasure to introduce a wonderful panel. We have David Van Wiel. He's the Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges at NATO. Um, down the line from Brussels, we have Kaspar Klinge. He's the Vice President for European Government Affairs for Microsoft. Back here in Madrid, Alejandro Romero. He's the Chief Operating Officer for Constella Intelligence and the board member of Telefonica Tech. Um, we also have Francesca Bria, who's running a bit late. Her flight was delayed. Uh, she's the president of the Italian Innovation Fund, and she should be joining us um, any minute now. But uh, we're going to get started right away, and I want to uh, start with David. Um, you know, I want to take a bit of a step back and, and get your sense in terms of what we can expect um, and how, how tech will revolutionize uh, the military going forward. I mean, is this, can we expect like robots fighting robots? Paint us a picture. Well, it's very difficult to look into the future, but if I look back into the past, which is easier to do, uh, then innovation has always won wars. Uh, from the first man-made weapons uh, to the invention of gunpowder, the use of horses, uh, later the introduction of aircraft, uh, innovation is critical when it comes down to maintaining the edge of your adversary in a conflict. Um, and for years, we've been very well placed to have that uh, technological edge. Uh, because a lot of the inventions, the great inventions that we all know from the 20th century, originated in the military domain. Uh, think about the GPS, the global positioning system, uh, the internet, uh, or something uh, uh, simple like duct tape. Uh, they were all military inventions that later got a commercial civilian use. Uh, now we have an issue at the moment, uh, as, as NATO and as militaries, that a lot of the innovation nowadays comes out of the private sector. Uh, so it is being developed by uh, startups, uh, scale-ups, larger tech companies, uh, academia, um, and it is predominantly uh, designed for commercial use. And, and that's great. I mean, if you look at the innovation potential that we have in the Alliance, it, it's huge. We have nine out of the ten best universities in the world on our territories. Uh, we have 80% of all living Nobel laureates uh, living in allied countries. 65% uh, of all the venture capital going around in the world is being invested in, in allied countries, so we have a great basis, uh, but we have an issue with translating that into the defense sector. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that, and I'll start with one of the obvious ones that uh, I think uh, our colleagues from the private sector will recognize. Uh, we're easy, difficult to deal with. Uh, we have long procurement processes. We have very strict requirements to what we think we need. So we leave little room for uh, um, uh, the creative minds, the innovators, to actually give us new technology. Um, there's also a lot of unknowns, both sides. So a lot of the military operators don't know what's out there uh, in, 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 in the field of technology. Uh, and a lot of the technology developers don't know what the military would actually need uh, in, in times of warfare. So we need to connect those two worlds. Um, and, and, and I think that's what we're trying to do at NATO now, is to transform ourselves into an organization that is more connected to the innovation ecosystem, the private sector, academia, uh, and uh, the small startups and, and, and innovators that are making a difference in the world of tomorrow. So to finish off this, this first intervention, the two initiatives that the leaders are endorsing these two days in Madrid uh, are the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, uh, or DIANA in short. I still think it's one of the best acronyms in NATO because it, <laughs> it actually sticks to your mind. Uh, and, and the other one is the NATO Innovation Fund, uh, which is a $1 billion uh, uh, venture capital investment fund that will invest in dual-use deep tech. So what DIANA does is reach out into those innovation ecosystems. Don't come to us. Uh, will come to you. Uh, it will be making use of accelerator sites that are existing in all the other countries, reaching out to the innovation community with military problems. Uh, for example, how can I communicate underwater over a distance of 100 kilometers? Uh, and then let's see what comes out of that, uh, that, that first uh, contest that we do. And if we get great ideas out of that, then we will actually sponsor startups. Uh, we will give them grants and we'll coach them, we'll mentor them, we'll uh, expose them to end users in order to mature their product. And if they make the second cut, 
will give them even more money to mature their project, product, uh, and then we'll make sure that we advertise that to all the allies and the industry. And the NATO Innovation Fund uh, is a venture capital fund which can then at that stage come in and provide uh, pre-seed and Series A financing for these startups, which is very difficult if you're working in the dual-use defense market because private capital is very hesitant to step in. So I'm not saying that we're going to change the world with these two initiatives. I would love to say that, uh, uh, but it is only a small first step uh, in order to regain our uh, contact with uh, the deep innovation that we've, uh, we've, we've lost over the years. So Alex, I mean, from the private sector, what are your thoughts uh, on NATO's um, new initiative here? Is this, you know, what, what type of impact could this have? And um, I mean, just generally speaking, what, what gaps uh, do NATO allies have when it comes to tech and, and securing that competitive advantage? <clears throat> okay, thank you uh, for inviting me to this panel. And, um, you know, I want, I want to, to build up on, on what David just said. I think that the initiatives that the NATO is taking along the lines of the Diana Initiative and the NATO Innovation Funds are, you know, really relevant and I believe uh, from a private sector in the right direction. I encourage NATO to be more, more aggressive. If, if I take the example of, uh, of the NATO Fund, uh, it's around one billion to be spent over 15 years. And if I take only one industry, cybersecurity, and only one country, Israel, and he, if I add the aggregate of all the funding rounds uh, of the last year is 8.8 .8 billion. So this gives an idea of the order of magnitudes that um, you know, we need to attract um, in, in, in this space and in a critical area like, like cybersecurity. And then in terms of uh, further collaboration, I think that there are multiple areas in which um, collaboration with the private sector can be improved. You mentioned a very important one, which is procurement. But I believe that, uh, you know, in the private sector and also in the defense sector, uh, we are facing uh, talent search, uh, lack of, of talent. Uh, so, for example, in cybersecurity, there are as many people working as uh, open positions in the industry. So being able to access uh, talent at a scale um, is something that is also an area of concern for us and uh, where we could be collaborating with, uh, where we could be collaborating with, uh, uh, with NATO. I think also cooperation on threat analysis. Um, if we look at, for example, critical infrastructure, a significant amount of the critical infrastructure is owned by private companies. A collaboration or a close collaboration between private companies and uh, allies uh, and, and, and NATO uh, could be also relevant. And then finally, I would like to uh, <clears throat> bring the attention on uh, public awareness. Uh, I believe that especially in the younger uh, generations, raising awareness about the relevance of defense uh, raising awareness about the potential uh, dual use of technology is very relevant in mm. order to understand uh, the role of NATO and how critical this is for uh, the defense of the allied, allied countries. So I'm going to see if we can check in with, uh, with uh, Kevin in Brussels down the line. Um, Kevin, can you hear me? Can, can you, you hear us? Yes, we can. Yes. Um, yes. Excellent. Um, so tell us. Uh, Thank you. And <laughs> yeah, so we're, I'm here with Casper Kling, the vice president from Microsoft. So we just heard a lot about NATO's efforts for innovation, which are often focused on startups. Uh, and it's assumed that's where you know, the creativity is coming from. But you know, you're, you're here from Microsoft. That's not a startup. That's one of the largest firms in the world. So uh, how, does that, how does that music play in your ear? Is that, uh, and how does Microsoft respond or fit into uh, a future that's focused on, on innovation and, and startup uh, land when you're coming from something a little different. Yeah, no, thank, thanks a lot, Kevin, and, and good to see everybody on, on the Madrid end. And, and I'm going to disappoint you because it's going to be very difficult for me to disagree with what David said. And, and I know I've been enormously annoying towards David in the last two years because I've been knocking on his door to try and sort of get a, a conversation going. Because I think one of the aspects that David laid out so well was, of course, that in today's world, you know, civilian companies, including a company like Microsoft, the technology that we develop and deploy you know, again, whether we like it or not, is used also in the military domain or in the military space. And if we just use a couple of minutes to talk about what we've seen in Ukraine with the Russian invasion, I think the interesting aspect is that even before the first missile or the first shot was fired, the war had already begun uh, through severe and significant cyber attacks that only increased 
in, in, in the months and in the days uh, before the 24th of February. So I think it also shows that in today's world, it is not only about territorial sovereignty in the traditional sense about having soldiers on the ground. If we want to protect our societies, our institutions, our, our democratic values, we actually also need to make sure that we have a virtual defense up and running. And this is where the private sector comes in. Um, and, and I think you know people around uh, the room or, or in Madrid will probably know that we've been incredibly engaged in also trying to support the Ukrainian authorities uh, with state-of-the-art technology to try and defend them against cyber attacks. And I think, you know, again, if we talk about artificial intelligence, quantum computing, cloud computing, many of these issues will have an impact on NATO, which is why I think, you know, what we will see come out of Madrid uh, today and tomorrow is going to be, you know, quite a dramatic and a quite an important step forward in bringing uh, NATO from the London summit, focusing on emerging and disruptive technologies, to actually creating a framework where NATO will align more with the new digital reality, reality but will also enable NATO to work closer together with the private sector, even big startups like Microsoft. Yeah, and, and even, if, if I get a quick follow-up before I throw it back to Madrid, um, even if the new strategic concept says, okay, we also believe that cybersecurity, supply chains, um, AI, those are all you know, important tools, weapons, whatever you want to call them, well, what does that mean? How does that help uh, foster new technologies, get the solutions faster to the tip of the spear, to the warfighters and the commanders who need them uh, immediately? But, but, but I think, you know, as David mentioned, there are some specific steps being taken. I think Diana yeah. is, is an important step in actually creating a completely different approach to procurement. Instead of saying, you know, here's a problem and these are the specifications for the solutions to that problem. I mean, NATO is, in my view, or in, as far as I understand, going to say, here's a problem come with a proposal how to fix that. And I think that brings back the innovation to sort of the collaborative efforts around NATO, but I think it also brings more awareness, not only to a big company like Microsoft or some of the other big players, but also to startups or small and medium-sized enterprises that there is an opportunity to work and fundamentally support NATO with you know, technology that is going to be absolutely decisive, not only in terms of building, you know, the jobs of tomorrow or creating economic growth, but actually also in making sure that NATO will defend the societies that we live in. That's good. Diana is a better acronym than Wonder Woman, I think. <laughs> but, but good, good Thanks to, so much, good, both good of you. Memory, I'm going to so, take so, it back you, now. Back to you. And uh, uh, I'd like to, to introduce Francesca. Um, she, she managed to join us. And I want to get your thoughts. Um, NATO uh, has this innovation fund, uh, 1, billion, 1 billion euros. Um, but uh, the EU is also making uh, some efforts in this area. Um, you know, what, uh, why is there such a focus on deep tech in particular? And also, you know, Alex mentioned dual use. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Is that a better investment case from, from your perspective? Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. I think I will continue to emphasize what was already said in terms of the need uh, of innovation in dual use technologies because there is a huge opportunity uh, for these disruptive and emerging technologies uh, to emphasize not only uh, the ability in order to tackle our national security objectives, but also our broader objectives as societies. So the UN uh, development goals and the kind of human rights agenda. And I think broadly, really, the defense of our citizens' ability to be s safe, secure, and have their rights protected as a democracy. And I think there, um, there is a need not only to have those kind of standards and requirements and um, security, let's say, by design. So security-centered world. Imagine when we are talking about crypto quantum cryptography or smart cities or even digitization of energy infrastructures. These kind of IoT scenarios where it touches everyone's life. So there the alliance, this kind of uh, public-private partnerships, the kind of triple helix alliance between the private, the public, 
uh, and academia, society at large is very important. When it comes to financing innovation, I think if we do not see the need for patient long-term capital in funding deep tech, which is the disruptive emerging technologies that will lead us to reshape the future, uh, I mean, of course, it's capital intensive. It needs exactly patience, and we need to bet on the actual talent that can scale. So there we need to pull in uh, large-scale uh, public investments that can be um, like mixed funding. It can be a mix of grants, a mix of equity, or even uh, venture capital funds. So when it comes to the EC, uh, the European Union is becoming very, I think, ambitious now because it's always being seen as a kind of regulatory power for the digital age. So betting on the ability to regulate and to put democracy at the center of the future vision of technology but now, obviously, we understand we also have to compete on technology and innovation capabilities, and that's why we created the European Innovation Council, uh, which has a 3.5 billion venture capital fund. This is the first time that the Commission does something like this, and also 1.2 billion in mix of grant and equity funding for deep tech scale-ups. And another initiative that's very important to me and ambitious, which is the European um, Technology Champion Initiatives, which is a 10 billion uh, multi-partners and multi-governments fund, which is managed by the European Innovation Funds, with 50, 16 governments that are already part of it. And the ambition is to create the next uh, you know, 100 VC funds in Europe to grow um, Deep, uh, deep tech um, champions. And I think this is a great opportunity because uh, we can then create this pan um, alliance innovation ecosystem where we bring together, uh, of course, the defense capabilities because it has to be built with um, security, ethics, and uh, the capacity to protect our citizen in mind with standards that we need from the security community, and then uh, public investment that can leverage three or four times private investment. And that's, I think, where we're going to have a, a real um, capacity to protect our industrial uh, capacity, our industrial base. So we've been talking a bit about the gaps that NATO as an alliance has in terms of um, in terms of tech, but uh, from from the EU and from the US uh, in the um, fight against the, um, in the war in Ukraine, we have seen some sanctions against Russia um, on the technology front. And I was curious to get your thoughts, David. You know what uh, what are we seeing in terms of impact already on the ground uh, in the war there? Well, we're either already seeing the impact or we will be seeing the impact very soon because especially the ban on uh, sophisticated semiconductors uh, is going to have a huge impact on the production processes, the production lines of military equipment in Russia. So with sanctions, you, you, you always hope to expect that within 24 hours they will kick in. Uh, they don't. It takes time. Uh, but in time, they will hurt. And, and in specific technologies, uh, it will be very hard for Russia to build up that capacity on their own. Uh, of course, apart from the West, there are other producers, and of course, China is a is a is a big upcoming player in this field. Uh, but it takes time to 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 change your production processes. So I, I think we will we will see difficulties on the Russian side as a result of these sanctions. At the same time, it is. Uh, uh, heartening to see that innovation on the Ukrainian side has taken a huge flight. Uh, Kasper already mentioned the uh, cyber attacks and, and Microsoft has done some great work in mitigating uh, uh, the attacks and, and, and moving uh, Ukraine to the cloud. So just as an example of the role that the private sector nowadays plays in these kind of conflicts. Uh, but we can all now uh, uh, sing along the Bayraktar drone song uh, uh, as an example of new technologies, uh, rather cheap technologies if you compare it to a uh, uh, fighter jet, uh, that are having a huge impact on the ground in Ukraine. Or the use of artificial intelligence uh, uh, language processing to uh, translate all the intercepted Russian communications and then search for different uh, worlds. Uh, the use of, of facial recognition to identify uh, the human rights violators in Bucha. Uh, it is a, a great example of a whole of society effort 
uh, that is now going into uh, keeping Ukraine safe and, and upgrading and innovating their military as they fight. Now, I'd rather have we don't wait for a conflict like that, uh, but learn from what we see and make sure that we institutionalize that cooperation between the private sector, academia, and the government in order to provide safe uh, uh, technology, rightly said by Francesca, based on our values, because uh, that is what uh, uh, distinguishes us from our adversaries, is that we are dem democratic nations, uh, we have values and principles, and these need to be translated into our, our new technologies as well. Should we check in with Casper to get his thoughts on, on, um, on the war in Ukraine, especially on the, the cyber front? And also just more broadly, um, you know, what, where can NATO as an alliance improve on, on, on the cyber front? Uh, Microsoft had a report recently about uh, Russian cyber espionage. I'd be curious to get your thoughts, Casper. Yeah, no, no, thanks very much. But, but I, think, I think, again, we have a situation where there is a, where there has been sort of a, a pre-Ukraine and a post-Ukraine um, approach to how we how we look at cybersecurity, and there's nothing new about cybersecurity. I think most of us have been arguing for many many years that this is a threat that we have to protect ourselves against. I think what we've seen now is the coming together of cybersecurity attacks together with kinetic activities on the ground at a scale that we perhaps haven't seen before. And I, I think the fun, f f sort of foundational conclusion in this is that we have a hybrid warfare. Uh, in Ukraine, perhaps at a level we haven't seen before, and the response to that has to be a hybrid response as well that involves also the private sector. Um, and you, you mentioned before some of the work that we've been doing. Um, I think it's fair to say it hasn't been particularly easy. Uh, you know, one of the reasons it hasn't been easy is because uh, many of the Ukrainian authorities were actually hosting their data sets or their infrastructure on-premise, in other words, having servers in the basement that were easier targets also for, for Russia and trying to, to knock out the, uh, the sort of critical infrastructure in Ukraine. So one of the areas we've been invest investing a lot in is to try and migrate, uh, you know, in fact, 16 out of 17 Ukrainian uh, ministries to the cloud in order to try and defend uh, their ability to have functioning institutions and services uh, up and running despite the, the war on the ground. But, but you point to, to a number of other areas that are increasingly important as well, which is, you know, traditional espionage, We've seen uh, a rise in, in, uh, in attacks against, uh, in fact, 42 countries outside Ukraine uh, conducted from Russia, which has been sort of more traditional espionage, but I think also basically disruptive in its nature. And we've also seen an increase, a quite dramatic increase in what you could call sort of cyber influencing campaigns uh, that I, I think we, we don't need to talk too much about uh, what kind of impact it has on, on our societies. And I think when you put all of that into, into the same basket, you know, what do we need to do more of? And this is one of the discussions we've had with, with David and his team for, for many months and years is that, you know, if we look at cybersecurity, a company like Microsoft, like many other companies, we have access to real-time threat intelligence and making that available to NATO through some sort of interface mechanism, I think is one of the, one of the areas that we need, look, need to look into. I think we have an obligation as a company, similarly to what other speakers said before, about fundamentally helping to protect democratic institutions and the, and the values of the societies that we live in. And by the way, the values, that is also you know, the place where, where, where Microsoft originates from. And that's what we're trying to do by leaning into, uh, into the situation right now. Kevin, just checking if there's anything you yeah, wanted to, to add or if you wanted to jump in. Otherwise, I'll, I'll turn to Alex. The strategic concept that we're all anticipating today is supposed to, uh, supposed to reflect a lesson learned and, and change how NATO thinks and, and you know, physically what do you think of the traditional military hardware. The idea is that NATO shouldn't have just enough on the eastern border to absorb a Russian attack that might literally take over and invade the eastern countries, and then NATO can then figure out a solution to push back and, and respond. The new thinking is there will be enough firepower deployed to deter that attack to begin with. What's the cyber version of that? What's the technology version of that that you think is the future ahead where it's not enough to just wait for those attacks and play defense uh, as a defensive alliance, rather something new in the new strategic concept has to be put forth? So I think, I think the lesson learned from Ukraine, but of course also from some of the previous major cybersecurity attacks that we've seen in the last couple of years is, of course, that 
no industry, no government is going to be left untouched by that. And I think building up appropriate resilience is going to be critically important. I mean, in, in my past life, when I was still working for, for government, I was uh, stationed in Southeast Asia uh, when NAPETCHA uh, happened back in, in 2017, almost exactly on, on the day we're sitting here. And I remember quite clearly how that crippled a number of very big international corporations in a way that they were unable to conduct business. And I think that was a wake-up call for some industries and some sectors. Uh, we can say very little good is coming out of the atrocities on the ground in Ukraine right now, but perhaps one of the things that we can use Ukraine to do is to build up more awareness of the need to do more. You need to protect yourself. We need to protect ourselves as, as, a, as a company, but we also need uh, you know, governments, uh, you know, academia, institutions to do more to protect, to protect themselves. And I think there is a technology solution to that. And of course, like many other companies, we're heavily involved in that part of it. But there is also a regulatory aspect of that where we're seeing the European Union, not least in these uh, months, actually providing, I would say, sort of a wave of different regulations that are going to increase uh, you know, obligations for all of us in, in having state-of-the-art technology to protect ourselves against cybersecurity attacks. There might be another as aspect to this, which, which I think is interesting when we look at, uh, at NATO and the discussions that are ongoing, which is sort of the more normative dimension of emerging and disruptive technologies. I mean, can NATO, similarly to the European Union, create a Brussels effect where you actually help set the standards around the application of new technologies in the battle space, in the military domain. And, and I think that's a really interesting way forward. I don't know whether that will be in, uh, in the communique or in, in the strategic right, concept, right. but it might be an area where NATO could look into in the, in the coming years. Well, we can send it back to Madrid, and yeah. maybe David can tell us. He's, he's from NATO. He knows what's in the strategic concept, right? Yeah, but I can't tell you yet, because then I'll be spoiling uh, the, the news coming out today. But I, I can promise you that uh, all that's been discussed here uh, is featuring very prominently in the new strategic concept. We realize that this is a critical part of the future uh, of warfare and defense and deterrence. And, and, and to make it concrete on the normative front, um, we're already starting to do that because we realize that these technologies need to go regulated, especially if we use them in the field of defense and security. So last October, for example, we published our uh, AI strategy. So that's an AI strategy, but only focused on the use for defense and security. Uh, and a, a large part of that consists of principles of responsible use. Um, and, and for those who work with AI, they're not uh, mind-boggling or groundbreaking. They're about fighting bias, they're about uh, meaningful human-machine interaction, they're about lawfulness. Um, but these principles are key to uh, uh, our innovators that are working for uh, defense and security because they want to design technology that is actually aligned with our values and not being misused. Uh, it's key for the end users because military end users working with AI want to have a level of trust in, in what the technology that they are operating uh, uh, will actually do. Uh, and thirdly, and that's what Casper said, the Brussels effect, it also sends a signal to all the Western uh, 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 companies and hopefully beyond uh, that these are the standards for new technology that we expect uh, all to adhere to. So that was only AI. Uh, the strategic concept will mention that in more broader terms as one of the roles that NATO can, can play. Uh, we, we don't do hard law like the EU, uh, but we can set standards and norms uh, and, and, and make sure that if we at 30, or since yesterday at 32 uh, soon, uh, agree on what we find the acceptable standards, uh, then hopefully that will have an effect far beyond the NATO territory and, and make the world a safer uh, place. Alex, I'm curious to get your thoughts. I mean, from, from, from your point of view, where do you think NATO can improve uh, on the cyber front? And just secondly, I mean, since we're, we're talking about the strategic concept, we know that China will be mentioned, um, and we expect that NATO may call out uh, the, their control of critical infrastructure. And I'm curious to get your thoughts. I mean, given that telecom is such an important aspect of that, you know, is this threat exaggerated? Uh, should, and I mean, if it isn't, what can NATO do to reduce um, that reliance? Thanks. Okay, <clears throat> I would like to build up uh, on what has been said by, by Casper and, and by David and add three key learnings uh, we are having at the cybersecurity space uh, 
based on the on the war uh, at Ukraine. The first one is, I believe that NATO and the allies should be doing much more in terms of awareness on cyber civil society on the threat uh, in the cyberspace. Um, different research shows how the perceived threat of uh, civilians uh, changes significantly uh, based on the distance to the border with Russia. Uh, but in the internet, uh, we are all neighbors. So we are all neighbors of, of Russia or ch of China, of, of Iran. And, um, you know, cybersecurity uh, on the digital space, it's, uh, it's certainly a threat that should be perceived by civil society regardless uh, of where you are geographically uh, located. The second uh, key learning, uh, I'm building up on what Bon Casper said, um, the move of a lot of the infrastructure that was on-premises to the cloud has really made it uh, life more difficult for the bad actors. So what we are observing in the cybersecurity space is that bad actors are going to areas or towards areas of less friction. And the areas of less friction are humans. So basically uh, trying to uh, replace the digital identity uh, of uh, politicians or executives is one of the key uh, vectors attacks that we are observing both in uh, APTs, in advanced persistent threat actors, and also uh, cyber criminals. I'll give you one example. We released recently an analysis on, the, on uh, critical infrastructure on energy, and we discovered that 45% of the top executives of the largest 20 companies, uh, energy companies in the world had credentials exposed in deep and dark web. Uh, and more and more we see how this can be weaponized and can be used to first penetrate an organization and then move laterally um, uh, in order to, uh, to, to attack this, uh, these organizations. Uh, we have also some interesting examples, but actors like Lapsus are poaching employees of critical infrastructure companies, offering them 20, 30K a week just to provide credentials to access critical infrastructure. So, I think identity is going to be definitely as the security in the cloud increases an area of interest. And then finally, I want to you know, raise awareness on a third element, uh, and Casper was talking about the coordination of kinetic, ac kinetic action and cyber security and cyber, cyber action, you know, wiper attacks and destructive attacks. We see a third element that we believe is very, very important, which is disinformation and malign campaigns. More and more, we are talking about uh, APTs, uh, Advanced Persistent Threat Actors in the cybersecurity space, but we are also uh, coining uh, a term of APM, Advanced Persistent Manipulators. Um, in the Ukrainian war, uh, we have seen how Russia has been very effective crafting very divisive, divisive uh, narratives against the allies and NATO outside the Western world especially in sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. And that represents uh, an important threat that also needs to be um, taken into account. And on, on the telecom front uh, with the China threat, can you tell us what your thoughts are there? Well, I think um, in general, uh, you know, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, limit this to, to, to infrastructure, but obviously supply chain is going to be a critical um, element because supply chain can be significantly uh, weaponized. And we have recent examples. Uh, the solar wing attacks uh, are a very, very good example on the impact that the supply chain can have um, you know, across, across a country, a region, or, or the world. And definitely, as we jump into 5G, and we are already talking about 6G, as IoT is becoming a critical um, you know, foundation of our industries and our lives, uh, supply chain, and, and that includes obviously uh, telecom infrastructure, are going to be very, very relevant and definitely needs to be an area of uh, very deep focus from a regulatory perspective, but also from a defense perspective. On the capability side, I just want to check in with Francesca and then we'll go to questions um, in the room here and, and in Brussels. So why don't you can start thinking about them while I um, ask. Francesca, on the capabilities side, um, you know, China and Russia, I mean, how far behind is the EU and the US on, in certain areas? And like, what, are you, what is your main concern? I think uh, what was said uh, for me in the panel is very important, that is to push the higher level ethical direction and then get the democracies uh, through also international regulation and agreements 
to set the principles and standards, also via experimentation, testing, uh, standard settings, and then get the investment behind. Because I think this is our strength. Our strength is that we recognize how those um, disruptive and emerging technologies can bring lots of benefits. I mean, not only for the defense um, industry and in kind of war scenarios, but also broadly. But if they are misused, they can be detrimental to our democracy and our fundamental values. Mm -hmm. And what was mentioned, for example, threats around disinformation and around kind of pervasive manipulation of data and technologies, I think this will become also a key issue. It has been mentioned, the cybersecurity regulation, the information security regulation, the AI act and also what NATO is doing in that front, but also the data governance act when it comes to people will need to have trust. They will need to feel that they can own their digital assets. They can own, uh, you know, their data and their identity. Uh, we, we also have to understand that this is linked to kind of massive digitization of people identities, payment systems, uh, you know, cryptocurrencies, all kinds of new services are being introduced in society. So this goes beyond, you know, only the scenarios uh, that we are talking about. And I think for me, this kind of vision that we may have as, as allied as democracies to make it happen um, with those very strong ethical direction is what I think we should use as our competitive advantage. So I don't think that, you know, because usually we say regulation makes it slow and we need to agree all together in a democracy and we're going to be beaten uh, because China, it's going to be faster and they're going to outperform us. But you know, those technologies are being going to be pervasive throughout society. They have to integrate to the institutions of society we have today. So if we do it right, and we are, if we are convincing people that we may keep the open and safe um, society, yes, with our technological improvements, then I think we will have an edge. We will have this edge that is not only technological, because digital sovereignty is also economic, political sovereignty, and of course, um, the military sovereignty. I think that's a very optimistic uh, <laughs> note to wrap we up on. To, we have to, <laughs> because otherwise we know, I mean, all the rest, it was said, you know, uh, material scarcity, uh, food crisis, um, supply chain disaster, supply shock, I may say, but also, again, the data is going to be a big fight because there is a lot of power asymmetries and we have the fight for talent also, because we need these STEM capabilities to be here. So we need to attract the more talented people. We need to be a better university, better education, better public sector in order to, to, you know, to uh, leverage the capacity throughout society. So the challenges are many. I think we need to be optimistic that as democracies, we can have an edge. We can have a competitive um, capacity here. So let's check in with um, with Brussels. Kevin, is there anyone um, in the crowd there that wants to, to ask a question? Uh, yes, I believe we have a question set up for you right here. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Owen Daniels. I work at Georgetown University's uh, Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Uh, technology literacy is a key challenge in both the civilian and defense sectors. Uh, particularly so policymakers can know the levers that they have available to them when it comes to emerging tech. I was wondering what the panelists think about how NATO can or should promote tech literacy both within the alliance and then also among member states. Thank you. Thank you for that, right here in the room. Um, I, I think the first thing is to say, I think it's a really great question because I think you're pointing to one of the areas that I know, you know, David, uh, the rest of the NATO organization is focusing on and increasingly also we're focusing on the private sector, which is to make sure that the gap between where policymakers are and where the technology is, that that gap is being reduced uh, as, we, as we go along. So I actually think one, one of the interesting aspects of your question is, why do we want an interface between the private sector and, and NATO? You know, what's, it, what's the interest for Microsoft in this area? Well, I think we have a couple of different interests. One is to make sure we help educate you know, a very important defense organization about where technology is today. 
And you know, I'm a simple political scientist, I'm not an engineer, so it's been a steep learning curve for me to come into Microsoft and sit in front of our engineers and understand how fast the deployment and development of AI is or quantum computing. And don't ask me any follow-up questions because I will fail completely on that one. But, but I, think, I think the interesting aspect is even for those of us that are working in the private sector, we see in many ways an unprecedented pace in the development of new technologies that is going to have a profound impact on the world, on geopolitics, on the opportunities to create the jobs and, and the growth of, of tomorrow. And that requires us to work closer together. But I actually think I just wanted to come back to, to the point that I just made. Um, you know, one of the areas we're investing in, in, in Microsoft, but many other companies are doing the same, is in fact on skilling. Um, and we do that for two reasons. One's, one is a very selfish uh, thing, which is we can't attract the number of cybersecurity experts that we need for our own business today. So the, to those that are uh, a little bit younger than I am today, go into that area. There are huge opportunities in terms of employment. But the other, the other reasons, of course, we live on the basis of trust. Now, if you don't have trust in our technology, you're not going to use our technology. And the problem with cybersecurity, and if you want me to be a little bit tedious, if you look around the room here today, because what we say is so incredibly boring, most of you are sitting with your device in front of you and probably reading emails or tweeting or doing something more interesting. And that, of course, also shows you know, the vulnerability we have because we are connected today and cybersecurity is going to be one of those aspects. So in order to increase awareness, we also need to invest in skilling and developing more competences in, in those areas. And I know that, uh, that our friends in NATO do not disagree on that one. And, and by the way, we're here to help together with many other companies, both uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, but certainly also here in Europe. So I think thank we'll you. have to leave it back with, to you. With, uh, with Casper. And I just want to thank all the panelists, David, Alex, Francesca, and down the line, Kevin and Casper for this wonderful panel. Um, just a note to uh, the crowd here in Madrid, we'll take a short break now. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just quickly add to that? We keep hearing that this is a historic Thank you very much. summit, and as indeed it is, and this is also a historic public forum, and we are now going to make history here in Spain, because this is, this is the earliest lunch break that has ever been announced in Spanish history, okay? So we're taking a lunch break from now until one, so please reconvene at one, and at one o'clock, we are very fortunate because we will be able to listen to Minister Andre Yarmak, who is the head of the presidential office in Ukraine, coming to us live from Kiev. So take this historic lunch break, or perhaps a brunch break would be more accurate, and reconvene at one. Thank you very much.
8, 8, 8, 8, vale. Hola, sí, este es el 2, ¿vale? Hola, este es el 2 de la manguera. Se queda diadema 3, por favor. 3, diadema 3, diadema 3, 3, 3, vale. 3. Hola, sí, 3, es el 3, ¿vale? Diadema 4. Hola, diadema 4. Vale, tenemos aquí 5 y 6. Chequeamos todas las líneas. Ah. Ok, diadema. Es una, es una AUDAC. Es una, es una AUDAC. Hola, 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 Diadema 5. Vale, esto... ¿Es eso ahora? Sí. Pues... Eh... Esto es lo que es. Otro... No, no. Hola, Diadema 5. Córtame, eh, ábreme, ábreme. El 8. 8, ábreme, por favor. David, corte. Corta, eh, corta el 5, que está una duda, vamos a poner una, una DPA. Abre. ¿Esa dónde ha salido? ¿Esa que estaba allí en la mesa? Esta es la que estaba por ahí. Ábreme 5 y a ver qué tal. Y hola, 1, 8, 4, 5, 6, 7, diadema 5. El 5. Y 5, 5, 5, diadema 5, ¿ok? Ahora el 6. Hola, diadema 6. Hola, 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 AC, AC. Hola, hola, diadema 6. Esta es la 6. No, no hemos cambiado el... Espérate, te lo chequeo.
¿Eh, David? Seis, 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 es este. Ah, que se quede la coca atrás. Ya de más cinco he cambiado el micro. Ok. Micro siete, micro siete, de de más siete. Diadema 6, hola, 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 diadema Se queda el 3, David. El 3. Habla por el 3. Habla por el 6. 
Habla por ahí, Edu, por el otro. Hola, 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 hola. Vale. Voy a ver qué de este. Mutea el 2. Mutea el 2. El 2. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear us? Yep. Yeah, I can hear you. Estás probando desde ahí. Hello. Manu, ¿te sacan el audio si lo escucho? No, ahora. Can you hear me? Can you hear us and can you see us? Hello, can you hear me? Sí, no, el, el, su audio está abierto, el problema, el problema es... 
Sí, se, 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 se lo escucha abajo. Eh, ¿Me puedes subir un poquito el, el audio de, de Zoom? Un pelo. Eh, um, ¿Tienes un in, uh, interpreter, un gran interpreter there in en tu site? Hola, hola. Hola, hola. Check, one check, one check. Hola, hola. One check, one check. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry, can you hear us? Ah, que no, que no nos puede escuchar. No, ahí sí. I can hear you. Can you speak now? Guys, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? One, two, three, four. Can you hear me now? Yeah. One, two, three. Perfect. Yeah. So, okay, so we would like you to put while our head of office will speak Ukrainian to put um, English channel in your interpretation uh, settings. You can you can see that there is a globe. So. Okay, we we, we are going to try that now. Uh, just a minute, because we need to put our interpreter. Just a second. Okay, no problem. Hello, these are interpreters. Uh, these are you. Hello, this is a Ukrainian interpreter from um, Madrid. Can you hear us or not? The the. The meeting doesn't, uh, it wasn't created with the option of uh, translation. So can you repeat the, the meeting with that option to send us the, the, the channel of uh, interpreter? You know, uh, we're, we would like to have our own uh, who will be joined uh, via the Zoom. Can, can, can we do that?
just in case. I am speaking into English channel. Do you hear me? But who is telling me if... if who is listening? No, I, I am speaking into... Uh, this is this open remarks afternoon at three часа, да, или сколько там? Боже, скажи мне, когда. Ирочка, ну посмотри. Программку, да, я уже, ты знаешь, я так не люблю. Рафик, и давай так, вот четко знаю, кто куда идет. Там большие эти open remarks, а сколько там? Не, 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 вообще не, 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 One, two, three, this is English Channel. One, two, three, four, English Channel. Testing, 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 English Channel. One, two, three, four. English Channel, okay? English, English, vale.
Okay, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Can you okay, can you so uh, we just need you to put uh, English channel. There is a special globe in the settings. So you just need to choose English channel and then uh, we can try vice versa with our interpreter. Okay? Okay, it's already on our English mode. Here the interpreter, one, two, three. Uh, so now I will speak Ukrainian and I hope you will receive uh, English. Um, Hello, I'm speaking Ukrainian right now and I do hear that you're getting interpretation into English. If every Yes, yes, okay. English, English is provided. There is an interpretation into English from Ukrainian. So I'm speaking now I am speaking now into the English channel, channel A. I hear you, yes, I hear you and I see you, yes, I hear you and I see you. Do you hear me? I hear you, the one, you're on the podium, so I, I see you and I hear you, so do you hear me? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Well, there is an interpretation booth, and I am active at the moment. Can we ask uh, during the presentation to use our interpreter uh, from Interpretation. You hear us? Так, я вас чую. Yes, I can hear you. There is a bit of delay, but we can hear you too. Everything's perfect then. Okay, then we will work as uh, follows. We will leave our interpreter, and I do hope you can you can hear the voice of our interpreter very well. Perfect. That's good for us. Thank you. Then I propose. Під, uh, залишатись на лінії і uh, хвилин за 10 до початку Then I suggest that we stay online and then about 10 minutes prior to the event itself we will make run another test if you don't mind You want to stay online until 1 o'clock? Як ви скажете, я би рекомендував просто виключити відео, а так можна було. As you say, I would recommend just to turn the video on and then stay online to make sure that we don't have problems later on. No problem on our side. We can stay online and we can communicate prior to, to the session. We will be punctual because it's after the break, so there won't be there shouldn't be delays. Добре, будемо старатись. Дякую. Yes, we'll we'll do that. Thank you. Just to confirm, uh, there will be also some questions, right? Oh, he's not. Uh, 
Дякуємо за питання. Сподіваюся, що зможемо відповісти на всі питання, які ви будете задавати нам. I do hope that I will be able to answer all the questions that will come. We're just discussing this question right now. Thank you very much. Thank you.
sind dann fünf. Okay, gut.
Well, this is the English channel, number one. We'll it's okay, it, now we interview. Hola, ¿me oyes? ¿Me oyes? ¿Oyes? Hoy es el canal de español que, por cierto, te íbamos a preguntar, nosotros cogemos relé de la cabina de ruso, ¿no? Que no, será no. en este número uno, ¿no? No, no, será en el 3. En el 3, ¿no?
Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Welcome to the afternoon session of the NATO Public Forum. Um, we are um, waiting for Kiev. Um, we uh, are very happy to already have part of Kiev here, and that is the deputy head of the presidential administration, Mr. Um, Shovka. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming and, and being here. <laughs> President um, Zelensky gave a very impressive speech to the heads of state and government of uh, NATO this morning. Um, for this session, he has volunteered the head of the presidential administration, um, Andrei Jermak. Um, he will be with us in a second. We just heard from Kiev that uh, President Zelensky is just still giving instructions to Jermak what to say. No, they are in a, um, they are in a, in a meeting um, that takes another couple of minutes, um, and then we'll have him on the screen and we go directly into the discussion, but I'll ask you to um, just um, for a couple of minutes more of patience. As soon as we have him on the screen, we will start our discussion. So, see you in a minute.
Good afternoon again. Um, my name is Christoph Heusken. I'm the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, and uh, I already introduced you, Mr. Jermak. It's wonderful to have you here with us, the head of the presidential administration. Um, nobody is closer to the president than, than you are. Um, Andre, there have been three summits now. You had the EU summit where um, you were, Ukraine was granted the candidate status. You had the G7, which expressed its solidarity with your country. We now have the NATO summit, and uh, we were all very impressed by the speech that the president uh, gave to the heads of state and government of NATO. How do you see the international community set up right now in support of Ukraine? How satisfied are you with these summits? What are your expectations um, to the international community um, here, in, in, um, here in Madrid and beyond? Good afternoon, Christoph, and the participants of the forum. First of all, I would like to uh, apologize for this delay. I would like to start by saying the most painful things. Uh, Russia uh, understand, understands more and more they, they cannot win over Ukraine and the battlefield. They were, this is why they are destroying our infrastructure, killing our civilians. Dozens uh, and, and hundreds of missiles were shot at Ukrainian cities. Uh, our housing blocks are hit with uh, hundreds of shellings, uh, kindergartens and educational institutions. This is done on purpose. Everyone knows about Ukrainian city of Kremenchuk, where day before yesterday the missile hit an ordinary mall. There were about 1,000 people there. They were shopping, children, elderly people, women. What else can you call this? Uh, 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 but, uh, but not as the um, as the terrorism. Ukraine, all the terrorist methods, mass killings, torturing, the energy and food crisis that has been planned in advance and is negatively impacting all people on the planet. And this is done only to break the resistance of certain countries and to exhaust uh, pressure on the international community. And the last argument is blackmailing with nuclear weapons. However, any uh, suggestions of negotiations uh, is viewed by Russia as a weakness. So they want to destroy our country because of their weak external policy. They want to even erase the name of the Ukrainian people in the textbooks. But we know for sure, if we step back tomorrow, they will go further. After 2014, Ukrainians have paid with their own blood to prove the axiom that Russia always violates the treaties that they sign. We are dealing with the ideologies and practices with remind us the worst examples of the previous centuries. The history taught us that the appetite of the aggressor is only growing. This is why it is not only Europe that is under threat, but the whole humanity. And we think that unless we stop Russia here in Ukraine, NATO will have to be dragged into this war. Uh, and the aggressor, which is not punished, gives a possibility to other criminals to build their and develop their occupying plans. The, uh, more uh, and more politicians now think that Russia should not win in the war that they started with Ukraine. That is very good, but unfortunately not everyone understands that it is Ukraine that should win in this war. Where is the guarantee that the Russia will not be able to do the same with some other country? to destroy the economic and military potential of the aggressor, we need to join forces of the majority of the countries in several areas. First of all, efficient weaponry supply. Uh, 
ammunition and shells in sufficient numbers and as soon as possible in order to s save as many people as possible who are dying on a daily basis. Women, children, elderly citizens. Second is the uh, incremental sanction pressure without any doubts or pauses in order to reduce as soon as possible and deplete the resources of the aggressors. The International Working Group spearheaded, co-spearheaded by me and uh, McFall have uh, published the fourth sanction document. This time around, it will be about strengthening financial sanctions, uh, building a fair international order that would guarantee the adherence to the human norms and, and law. I do agree with you, Christopher, that the world is not divided into communist world and capitalist uh, West. Now, there are those who want to stick to the civilized rules and aggressors who are violating all sorts of rules and any order. The war in Ukraine speeded up many processes in the world. Life will not be the same as it used to be before. We're seeing the real crisis of international security system. This is why together we have to build a new one. Before that, North uh, uh, Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization was the most, most secure um, umbrella of the, of the world. And if in 2008 Russia view would not prevail, in Ukraine we wouldn't have had this horrible war today. So we are not satisfied with just the illusion of the open door. Ukraine will not divert from its path towards the full-fledged membership in NATO. Ukrainian army and Ukrainian uh, people with its bravery is proving on the daily basis that our membership will only strengthen the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And uh, we are very glad that NATO is becoming stronger and is including such friends of Ukraine as Sweden and Finland. But yet another important step towards a secure world is establishing an effective mechanism of guarantees for Ukraine. For that purpose, with the former mm, Secretary General, Mr. Rasmussen, we created an international consultation group. We are preparing a set of activities that would uh, strengthen the defense capability and military uh, capacity of Ukraine, uh, maximum integration of Ukraine into international and political economic formats, long-term economic and financial sanctions that will uh, make it impossible for new aggression to happen. At the same time, we also have to strengthen international law and reform international uh, structure. The violators of the fundamental principle should not immediately lose their vote right in the Security Council but should also be excluded from UN and other international platforms. We need the full-fledged isolation of the criminals. I want to express the words of biggest gratitude to the United States and other partners of Ukraine, to the real friends of Ukraine for your support. We are very grateful to the countries of the European Union for their big trust and for providing Ukraine the candidate status. We all together have to win over Ukraine and punish the aggressor and make the world a safer place to live for our people and for the future generations. I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity to address such an honorable audience. Slava Ukraini and glory to the protectors of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Great. Do you still have a couple of minutes? Yes, yes, of course. It's a pleasure. So, thank you very much for a very powerful statement. I um, gather from what you said that first importance is weaponry ammunition. Second, increase of sanction pressure. Third, integration into international community, full membership of, of NATO, support, again, of international community. Now, you have, and I think this is um, a very important 
um, very important event today. You have invited the G20 president, um, the Indonesian president, to your country. Um, he is in Kiev today. Um, this brings me to, to a question. Um, you know, I was ambassador at the UN before, and at the UN, of course, um, we see, and you have the full support, you had the 141 countries that condemned Russia's aggression. At the same time, you do have, when you look into some other, um, into some other votes, uh, you see that there are a lot of countries um, that are abstaining. You have a lot of countries that follow the narrative that the increase of food prices and energy prices are due to the sanctions that the so-called West is uh, imposing on um, Russia, and therefore um, they are the victims of it. There is some um, equidistance in, in many, many countries towards this conflict. How, are, how concerned are you about this? Um, what do you um, do about it? What is your advice to see to it that we actually do, as you said, that we work and implement and fight for the rules-based international order for the Charter of the UN to be implemented and not um, be f that we don't follow the, the narrative that is, um, of course, um, followed by or the propaganda by Russia and, we have to admit, also China. What is your advice there? Thank you very much, Christopher, for this question. Well, first of all, Ukraine doesn't have any other way uh, out but only to continue and fight for our sovereignty and territorial integrity. For us, there are no any other compromises as regards to our independent sovereignty and territorial integrity. We think that the whole world has seen for themselves and the world has divided into those who are on the side of the good and those who are on the side of the evil. And what we're seeing is that in many countries we can hear and see not only from international uh, leaders but rank and file citizens who gather together in hundreds and thousands and dozens of thousands in the streets of the cities that they understand that this is not just Ukrainian war. Uh, this is the war for the values that I'm sure are uh, lying, uh, are underlying uh, values uh, for the democratic society. And uh, therefore, today, President Zelensky and our whole team works 24-7, and I'm speaking from the office of the president today. We came here uh, at night from the, on the 23rd and slash 24th of June, uh, oh, sorry, 23rd and 24th of February, and we're not leaving this office until we win. So we're doing our best so that our partners in different continents of, of the world would understand what is happening. And thank, thank you, Christopher, for reminding me. In a few minutes, we are, we are starting the meeting with the president of Ukraine, with the president of Indonesia, but I already know that he is under big influence. He is even shocked of what he has seen in the cities around Kyiv, where civilians were killed, where women were tortured, where children were killed, where indeed there is a big tragedy which is happening as we speak. And uh, therefore, we have to speak out the truth. People have to come to Ukraine and, and see for themselves and uh, as I said, we have to be united in the effort to win over and to bring back the international law and respect to any country, no matter how big the country is, how small the country is, no matter where it is situated, 
geographically, we have to come back to a civilized way of coexistence. And again, I would like to say that Ukraine really requires a reliable security system, a reliable guarantee system to make sure that this would never happen again. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dre, for this very strong um, statement. And uh, I can, from my side, only confirm, and I speak for everybody in the room here, that indeed you are defending the values of democracy. You are um, defending the rules-based international order, the charter of the UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we are with you. Um, it is very important that um, you have with Indonesia, the head of G20, I think it's a very important meeting that this spirit, the spirit of respect for international law, of the rejection of the war crimes committed by Russia, um, as you said, the terrorism, the mass killing, that this is um, stopped, but also that we call a spade a spade. Um, in, with these words, I would like to um, say goodbye to you. I hope that next year, at next year's NATO summit, we'll have you, we have President Zelensky in person here, that you can then describe how you were successful and how you actually are an example for um, the fight against um, 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 mass murderers, the fight against those who commit war crimes. Um, Andrea, I would like to um, give you, with um, all the people in the audience, a hand of applause. Good luck to you. Um, we, are, we are with you. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you very much. I think we can start, yes. Um, it's my 
pleasure to uh, moderate this wonderful panel with Kaiser Ollongren, the Minister of the Netherlands. Wonderful to have you with Kalle Lanet, Minister of Defense of Estonia, and with Pekka Havisto, the Minister of Defense of, of Finland. Um, Pekka, if I may, can I start with you? When, when you learned last uh, night that um, Erdogan gave up uh, the blockage of your um, uh, membership, what did you feel, what did you do, what did you drink? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, we had a, quite a sweaty four hours in the meeting room when, uh, with the Turkish delegation. I have to have full respect of their uh, uh, strong views and strong points, but we also had some strong points together with Sweden, and, and the first two hours felt that it was not going anywhere, and then after the coffee break it started to move a little bit. What did I drink? Uh, well, I, uh, I was uh, with the Swedish colleague Peter Hulkvist at the hotel lobby, and uh, uh, we were actually raising our glasses for the fact that Finland and Sweden, is, uh, we are doing this together. Yeah. It's a, there, there was a moment when, when there were issues that, okay, Sweden maybe have more problems or different problems than Sweden and so, than Finland and so forth, and it's, it was very, very important since we looked the map and understand also about our defense. And we have a very close cooperation already now with Sweden. It's very important we are doing this together. This was historic for you yesterday? This was historic. And, and uh, of course, the whole spring, well, it has been historic for Europe. But, uh, but the 24th of February changed the whole security thinking in Finland. Earlier, we had maybe around 30% of the supporters of the NATO membership. We are thinking that the European security architecture is working, preventing the wars. And then after the 24th of February, we realized that despite of all that we have created in Europe to be secure and to avoid a war has failed. And we are in a new situation. And Finland, as you know, has had since 2004 this kind of what we call a NATO option that if the security environment changes dramatically, we are ready to consider uh, NATO membership. And after the 24th of February, 75% of our people changed, started to come to support the NATO membership, and, and we had a parliament voting where 188 out of 200 MPs voted in favor. Actually, even those political parties that in their program are against NATO membership voted in the parliament in favor. So that's something. Yeah. No, thank you very much for this. If I may ask, Kalle, for uh, Estonia, what does it meant, uh, what does it mean to you right now to know that Finland and Sweden are part of NATO? Good, uh, good afternoon to everybody. And, uh, and maybe I can make one remark uh, direction uh, Pekka, that uh, when he explained that uh, there was a four hours huge discussion, but the first two hours was uh, so silent or slowly, but there is nothing special. It's a Scandinavian way, warm up, warm up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, but uh, what does it mean uh, for Estonia? And of course, uh, it is uh, very important for Estonia. And, and of when we received first time, when, when we started to hear from uh, over the bay that, uh, that Finland would like to join the NATO, and then it was a, we applauded, and then it was a very good news for us because, uh, of course, if Sweden and uh, Finland will be members of NATO, then Baltic Sea will be internal NATO Sea, and then it gives also extra security uh, for, for us. And, uh, and if we are looking uh, how to cooperate together in, in exercises, training, exchange the information, it gives immediately extra possibilities. Mm. And, uh, and uh, as shortly to explain that it, it gives uh, extra security to the whole Estonia. Mm. Can I ask you, um, the, the uh, decision of the um, council that is going to be t uh, taken, that is the um, rapid reaction force going from 40 to 300,000 more um, uh, stationing directly on the eastern border, are you happy what is planned, what, it, what will be, be decided? Is it enough? Um, what, how is your view on what will be the outcome of the summit? Of course, it's several times repeated that uh, this is historical summit. 
at first uh, what we said just now, uh, Finland and Sweden. The second thing, uh, uh, of course, everybody declared that uh, Russia is a main threat. Thirdly, of course, uh, we need to strengthen eastern flank, and, uh, and uh, everybody knows how to do that. Uh, it was uh, several times explained already. Uh, we will move from enhanced forward enhanced presence to enhanced for forward uh, defense. That's the main exchange of attitude, and this is uh, so important that we can defend immediately from the zero how uh, our NATO states. And, and of course, uh, if the security situation is totally changed, as Pekka said also, that after the 24th of February, all the world is changed. That means that we have to also change our attitudes. And all these decisions are very important uh, on that case. Um, now, for Estonia, you have your direct border, you have your experience with uh, Russia. For Pika, he said that, you know, how the public changed from 30 to 75 percent. Now, uh, the Netherlands, um, I'll speak for my country, Germany, we are a bit um, further in the center of Europe. We now see this sea change, what is happening. Um, how optimistic are you, Kaisa, that um, over time um, our populations um, are ready to actually support this um, change of time? How ready will our population be to actually spend what we committed in 2014 already, the 2% on defense? Um, when we have to now see that the energy price goes up, food prices, how confident are you that the Dutch population says, yes, we have to do it, we, we have to um, also um, you know, make some concessions also with regard to our standard of living because we need to defend our freedom? Yeah, I think it's a very good question. Uh, and I think that, f first of all, you see broad support in the Netherlands and I think in most countries in Europe now for Ukraine, for helping Ukraine with weapons, uh, for sanctioning Russia. Uh, for helping Ukrainians who are fleeing their countries, uh, etc. So, so people are seeing what is happening and, and they want to be part of, of helping, helping Ukraine. But at the same time, uh, it also means that, that it, it costs us something. Uh, and I think the important thing for us ministers, politicians in general, is to have this debate with our general public uh, and to keep um, talking about the war in Ukraine as something that we are also part of. We're not part of the war itself, but we're, we're part of taking care of that this war doesn't spread in this way. We're part of the international community that has to respond if a country is behaving as aggressively as Russia is, if a country is not you know, uh, bound apparently by any uh, kind of international agreement or, or, or treaty. Uh, and that is the debate we have to have in our countries, that we have to continue to have in our countries, and it does come at a cost. Uh, and we are feeling it because of energy prices, we are going to perhaps going to feel it in food shortages, especially in, in poorer countries. So uh, we have to be honest with our public, uh, and then I think we can keep their support. Yes. Um, let me announce that we'll, um, after the next question, go to the public um, and uh, there are microphones on the right and the left and you can ask questions. I don't want to dominate this here. One question I would like to, to ask you, um, Kaiser, on actually the question I indirectly asked um, Andre Jermak before. And that is while I think all of us here, we are convinced that what we are doing is right. We, we, we fight for democracy, we fight for international law, we want to prevent that you know, somebody who is um, committing war crimes can win this. But when you leave Europe, when you go to the UN, when you, when you look at African leaders, when you look at Latin America, there's much more distant. You see it in the votes in the, in the UN. Um, they say, well, you know, double standards, where were you um, when, um, you know, the Americans invaded Iraq, which was a violation of uh, international law, and now we are again the victim of this fight against East and West. We don't have anything to do, look after a solution, and they abstain. What is your recipe? How do we, how do we cope with this challenge, which is a real challenge? 
I think we absolutely have to reach out to them yeah. because we, it is too easy to talk about, sorry, about democracy against autocracy. It's too easy to talk about our way of life because if you live in a country in Africa where there's already a hunger and food shortages uh, and where you have terrorists that you have to fight but you cannot buy the weapons from, from us, uh, then you're in a completely diff different situation. So I think we have to reach out to them, we have to deal with the issue of food shortages, we have to be there, we have to be present in, in those countries, uh, and, and we have to also to try to understand their point of view, and at the same time, also make them aware of the fact that there is also a lot of fake news and disinformation and propaganda going around that they're also going to be the victim of. Yeah. Before I ask Pika, um, when you go to a average country in Africa and you go to into the Dutch embassy, you have about, I don't know, an ambassador, a couple of other people, same here. Across the street there are Chinese with 100 Chinese people who um, are all concentrating, pouring money in, you know, a new stadium for the president. How, how, do, we, how do we do that? How do we actually get across there? Yeah, that, I think that is a almost a million dollar question. Mm. Uh, and, and now you mentioned the Chinese, but we also know uh, that uh, Russians are there with paramilitary, the Wagner Group in the yeah. Sahel region, etc. Uh, and it, it's, it's difficult to deal with it, but that doesn't mean that we don't have to deal with it. So if we know one thing for sure, if we turn our backs, uh, then later on we're going to say, why didn't we do something when we still had the time to do it? So we, we have to be there, we yeah. have to be there with our people at the embassies, we have to get our companies active uh, there, we have to remain present. Of course, we have historical ties and, and let's use it and yeah. also use the economy. Yeah, you're right. Pick up. Yes, we also, of course, have a big fight over the narratives currently and it's interesting how, which are the winning narratives in which part of the world. First, maybe a positive remark of the Central Asia, for example, that countries there are reacting to the Russian threat and so forth. But we, have, we were hosting actually one week ago in, in Helsinki, Nordic Africa Summit, where we had uh, 20 African colleagues, 20 foreign ministers from different African countries. And it was extremely interesting when there were those who said that we want to stay neutral. And we actually, as Nordic ministers, responded to them that, for example, South Africa, when you had apartheid in South Africa, we didn't stay neutral. Why are you staying neutral now on when you see a conflict in, in Europe and so forth? Then some countries are going, there's always need of those who are mediating. So that's the reason why we are staying neutral. But, but unfortunately, I think the mediation processes are not going so, so much now on. And, and we, we really have to fight over the narratives. But many of the African leaders raised the issue that it's, it's also a survival game for, for them with these food prices, with these energy prices. And, and really, there can be security threats in their own countries. And, and then again, this could trigger migration issues which are very sensitive from the European point of view and, and so forth. So I fully agree with Kaiser that we have to really address those root causes also in these countries and find ways to support, particularly on, the, on this food crisis issue. Yeah. yeah, totally agree. Now, I turn to the audience. Um, yes, please, if you could go to the microphone and introduce um, um, yourself. Hi, my name is Michał Baranowski. I'm a senior fellow and a director of the Warsaw Office of the German Marshall Fund. It's, it's great to be not on the eastern flank or front, but deep on the, to the west. Uh, first, uh, to, to Minister Havisto, we are so excited for you joining in Poland. Uh, it's great, it's gonna be fantastic to have you and, and Sweden in the alliance, uh, strengthening the northeastern flank. My question goes uh, to, to Minister Lanet. Um, you, you mentioned uh, forward defense. On, um, a, what would be in the transformative nature of today's summit? But if you were to imagine NATO's posture that really offers the full version of forward defense that would protect Estonia, other Baltic states, Poland, what would it look like? Um, and if I may turn a question also to uh, Mr. Heusgen and maybe others. I mean, we have in the title Site Avenda. Um, so what would be Germany's role in deterrence on especially the eastern flank of the alliance? Thanks. Thank you for the question. Yes, it's a, it's a quite great possibility to explain what this forward defense in our means, in, in our Estonia means. Uh, it's uh, at first plans, 
Secondly, of course, important part is command structures, pre-positioning equipment, and of course, readiness, the crisis time readiness to act, to protect, to defend Estonian soil immediately. It, that means that situational awareness, that means that uh, good intelligence and quick reinforcement forces allies to Estonian soil before Russian or other states will attack Estonia. That means that we will have in Estonia to our own brigades and, uh, and we wait extra brigade from uh, early side. Of course, right now there, uh, there will be the um, leading uh, UK and also we have Danes and uh, French troops. And that means that we, we, we are waiting crisis time, divisional size together, troops in Estonia to immediately to act. Uh, of course, extra enablers, uh, air protection, sea protection and all these elements. And uh, that means that the readiness should be immediate, immediate. Not just troops on Estonian or Baltic soil, but, but the readiness to act. And that means that uh, they exercise together, they know our uh, nature, they know everything about Estonia. Is it clear explanation or? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, um, I'm the moderator here. I'm no longer in German government, so <laughs> I uh, can only tell you what, um, what I believe um, is, is important. We use the word Zeitenwende, um, which means, you know, turning off tides, turning off times. And um, I believe what we are witnessing here for my country is um, as much a break in history as was 1945, as was 1989, um, a change um, in, in the course of history. Our policy that after 1989, when we thought that you know, eternal peace would break out in, in Europe um, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, um, and um, where Germany really tried very hard in all different um, fora to see to it that we bring um, partnerships forward, that we have a partnership relationship. We have to um, admit that um, with regard to Russia, these efforts failed, totally failed, and that we have to now um, get into another gear. And this other gear is, as we um, also, I think, Kaisa uh, has the same in the Netherlands, we have it even more in, in Germany we have to have a different um, mindset. And uh, Chancellor Scholz gave a historic speech on the 27th of February, where he said, um, and where he broke with, with German tradition so far. Um, and now we have to follow up. We have to follow up, number one, on defense spending. Um, also, Germany has to um, follow up in, in terms of um, you know, leading the way um, more in international fora, um, leading the way when it comes to sanctions, when it comes to uh, support. Germany, after all, is the fourth uh, largest um, um, or fourth strongest economic nation. We are already the second donor to the UN, uh, the second largest giver of ODA. This gives us some responsibility and we have to assume this responsibility. This is because of our past, we have been reluctant doing this, but we have to assume this um, leadership role. And we have to do the same thing, as you said, uh, necessary in the Netherlands. I don't think it's that necessary in Estonia and, and Finland, but we have to um, get the people, the ordinary people understand that their freedom, their well-being is at stake and, and we have to assume um, um, a leadership role. Um, I think we are on a good track, but um, there, um, we have to be very uh, clear that there may be some fatigue. Um, there will be some Ukraine fatigue, there will be some fatigue when all of a sudden the energy prices go up and uh, uh, food prices, inflation, we may have a recession and then it's a question of how, is, how coherent is our society, how coherent is our political class that they all send this strong message because they have to do it, it doesn't come from itself. So I'm optimistic. Um, that we can do it. I think the show of unity at the EU, at the G7, here at this summit, I think gives a, a boost to this. But as I said, this is not a given and we have to work on this. 
Okay, next question. Um, we can, yes, go ahead, please, sorry. Charlie Sloan is Pasternak from the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Um, so to deliver deterrence and stability in and around Europe requires more than just military capabilities. Um, I have some idea about how Finland approaches this, but I would love to hear your others' perspectives on how do you get citizens, NGOs, the private sector, and maybe even organizations such as the EU and NATO to deliver, I won't call it total defense, but a stronger national resilience, which is required for deterrence and stability. Well, that's what we have been discussing. Who wants to start? You well, I, I can start. I can yeah, start. And then uh, in Estonia, of course, um, interest after the 24th of February to, to protect own state or our own soil and land rise dramatically. For example, we have a voluntary um, defense league. That means that you can, uh, you can join to that league and then you can be voluntarily as a crisis time soldier or, or whatever fight for the Estonian freedom. We have right now uh, in that defense league about uh, 20,000. We, we, we try to rise that number during next two years extra 10,000, it's almost uh, 30,000 then, but already after these some months we have um, almost uh, four, 5,000 people who joined to that defense league. That shows that uh, they are very much interested to protect Estonia voluntary way. This is a one of the examples, and then of course they will be trained, they will have uniforms, and then they are, they are like uh, soldiers or troops. And on the other hand, uh, of course, on the political level, we have a very strong decisions also, and then uh, we, we decided uh, to, to put additional money to our defense budget. Uh, for example, uh, in January we decided uh, free 340,000 uh, million euros and the second decision was already in March 470 million euros to buy ammunition and uh, of course extra capabilities and we we are making quick and strict decisions to make our defense more stronger these are just two examples yeah. Perhaps just to add uh, very briefly, because I think Finland, Estonia and other countries are showing uh, the way that you can deal with this. And the nearer you are to being threatened yourself, uh, I mean, the stronger I think the resilience is that is already present. In other countries, like in my country, uh, where we have not been in a, in a war-like situation and a direct threat for a very long time, that is different. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, resilience grows with uh, having uh, the actual example of, of a war near to you and having a war in Europe, in our own region, uh, that we are actually seeing and hearing of every day, is making our resilience in our society grow. And I think the, the person who posed the question rightly said it's not only about the military built up, it's also about the whole society uh, being, uh, being resilient. Uh, and as a defense minister, I already noticed that, for instance, the respect for the military, for, uh, for our military, ha has grown since the 24th of February. Uh, people are much more interested in what kind of work it really is, and they're paying their respects also uh, to, to our soldiers, and th that's also important. So being part of society uh, is making the society more resilient. Pika? Maybe to explain the Finnish system, we, we are a little bit old-fashioned people. So we have the conscription army, we have a reserve, almost 300,000 men and women, which might be one of the biggest in Europe. We are investing to traditional military equipment. It's just order 64 F-35 in December and, and so forth. And our will of defending our country is very, very high among the population. But then we have a new layer on this old-fashioned uh, defense system, of course, with all the hybrid and, and cyber threats. And there we need a cooperation with NATO. We need a EU cooperation and a global and international uh, cooperation. And then, of course, we have the totally new type of threats, the climate issues and others, which we are also looking as, as uh, security threats to us. And we have to work 
with these old layers and with the new layers. So at the same time, when we are building bomb shelters in Finland, we are one of the few countries that is still doing it. Uh, so we have to respond also to all these new threats. And, and I, th that's why we also welcome the thinking into NATO, also addressing these new topics like the climate, which is very important. Yeah, very, very impressive. Um, I would like to turn myself against to Kalle just to praise him, if I may. I have a statistic in front of me about donors um, to um, Ukraine and um, by um, GDP. Um, Estonia spends 1% of GDP in support uh, to Ukraine. So this is really very, very impressive. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you, um, Estonia is um, a country, um, same thing with Latvia, a bit less with Lithuania, where you have a large um, ethnic Russian minority. Um, how do these people um, behave in these days? How, what um, is their view? I mean, many speak Russian, many probably watch Russian television, they see the propaganda, but they are part of the European Union, they have passwords, allow them to travel, and they enjoy, of course, a wealth that they would never enjoy in Russia. How is the, can you share a bit with us, how is the sentiment, the atmosphere, right now in, in those corners of your country where you have even sometimes the Russian um, majority in the population. Thank you for this question. And, and it, it, it is quite interesting that, uh, for example, the eastern part of Estonia, where uh, we have, uh, let's say, 80% is Russian-speaking people, uh, young people are saying that Putin and Russia is aggressor. But elderly people are saying, no, 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 no. Putin is fighting against Nazism. Why? Because uh, elderly people are looking uh, Russian TV, Russian TV channels, but younger people are looking other channels. But uh, of course, uh, our government decided to close these uh, Russian propaganda channels. It helped, but, but of course, uh, you have to explain, explain, uh, inform them. And uh, our government uh, made uh, several visits to the eastern part of uh, Estonia and to, to explain what is the real situation. And uh, of course, what is the, not interesting, it's right, not right word, but uh, sad that uh, even inside the families, it's a quite uh, strict conflict between elderly people and, and the youngsters because uh, they are different information sphere. And, uh, and the youngest, as I explained, uh, supporting, uh, understanding that uh, Putin is aggressor and, and the elderly people, our parents, are saying that uh, no, 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 he's uh, doing the right thing. And, uh, and why we started to make decisions that we have to support Ukraine any means. It, we, we made that decision already last December when, uh, when we, we decided to, to send also practical help uh, to Ukraine because our clear understanding was that Ukraine is, is uh, fighting also for Estonian freedom. They are standing on the front line and they are fighting for us also. Of course, at first, uh, in December, there was uh, people also in Estonia said that, why you, you are doing that? Because uh, you are making um, Putin worried about that, and maybe he will attack also Estonia. But um, as uh, we said, Putin accepts only power. And, uh, and that means that we have to give extra power to, to Ukrainians who are fighting for our freedom. But uh, I believe that uh, today already elderly people are understanding more and more that, uh, that uh, Putin is not doing the right thing, that he is uh, more or less evil. Okay, this is a bit encouraging because I w was a bit worried if um, part of your um, population, Russian population, live in the wealth. I mean, your country has developed enormously and, and I mean, they live so much better than across the border that they still believe the Russian narrative. You know, how, how is it in Russia? And I think you explain a bit um, because of this disinformation how, you know, for us it's unimaginable that 80% of the people in Russia believe uh, Putin's narrative. And, and this is very alarming. Pick up. And then maybe, maybe to this point, uh, we have already 
for several years having our national broadcasting company, Russian-speaking news, actually for that minority that lives in Finland, maybe around 80,000 Russian speakers. But we have found out that the media actually in St. Petersburg follow very closely this Russian-speaking news. And sometimes when they cannot produce their own news, they refer to the Finnish news that has been telling this and this fact. So actually it's very important. And, and some newspapers now during this conflict have started to publish their Russian speaking news so that in the internet you can at least find the, the real information. But I think that's what you told about the color, about the support to Ukraine. I think at least in Finland also the feeling is very much in favor of the solidarity to Ukraine. We have received more than 20,000 refugees, but also this is the first time we are really giving lethal material to the conflict area. And, and I think there's a full, full support of the population of, of doing, doing that and, of course, trying to find ways and means to support Ukrainians at the moment, like we all are doing. Thank you. Kaiser. Just to add one thing, that, of course, there are also Russians that left Russia after the invasion, who went to Finland, to Sweden, to Turkey, uh, especially young Russians. Uh, and this is, uh, I, I hope that their voice will eventually also be heard back uh, in Russia, it's uh, up till now, of course, it's uh, these are not impressive numbers, but these are important people it, that can play a role in the future uh, in countering uh, the propaganda from the Kremlin. Yeah, thank you. So we have time for one more question. Um, please go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, sorry, um, you want to take the microphone because this is streamed and people don't um, behind the camera. And if you introduce yourself, please. Sure. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. My name is Julia Yaffe, I'm with Puck. Uh, my question is more for the defense minister of the Netherlands and for you, the moderator. I think you know the Estonians and the Finns understand more viscerally and better than most, I think, what, uh, what the Russian threat really means. Whereas Germany, the Netherlands, France, are farther away, let, I mean, the US as well. And there seems to be some fatigue setting in, especially with high energy prices, rising food prices. Uh, you mentioned being honest with your population, but how is the population responding? And are you seeing that fatigue set in this early in the, um, in the conflict? And how do you propose to deal with it? Well, the fact is, of course, that, I mean, it, it was front-page news every day for uh, the first two, three months. Uh, and now there are also other issues that our societies have uh, to deal with. Uh, and uh, th things that concern people uh, more directly. Um, and, and I think that is th that's a fact. Uh, and then you can say it's fatigue, but perhaps it's not even fatigue. But I, th I think people are still very concerned about what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, but people are, are getting used to it, uh, but that's also a risk, of course. So that's why I said we have to be honest and we have to ha keep having this conversation and this dialogue with our own uh, public and uh, also uh, make sure that they are aware of the fact that it is not something between Russia and Ukraine, but that we are part of this, because if we don't help Ukraine anymore and if we don't apply the sanctions that are already in place and even more sanctions uh, towards Russia, uh, this type of aggression that, that, that can never be rewarded uh, is, is going to, to happen in the future and it can happen to us and it can happen to our children. So I think the main thing is also, of course, we're, we're not there only to deal with this war. We, uh, we are uh, governing our countries also to deal with the other issues that are important to, to our public. Uh, uh, employment, uh, housing, for instance, issues that are in the Netherlands are very important right now. Um, but at the same time, always connect what is happening in Ukraine to what is happening in the Netherlands and what is happening in the rest of the world. And I think that is really uh, what, what we can do. Uh, and of course, there are, you mean, for, the, for, the, for the, those in our societies who have the, really the, the most difficulty getting around, we just have to make sure that we also help them with these rising energy prices. Uh, and at the end of, end of the month, you, you, you don't have anything anymore, then we have to step in. Uh, so being concrete in, in that kind and that type of help is also important, I think. Yeah, not, not much to add. I totally agree with you. Um, you know, um, I think your question is the most relevant right now, and Putin counts on our fatigue, and we have to be aware of this. And um, 
You know, it's up for our democracies now, for our societies. We need leadership, and um, um, Putin must not win this. And, and therefore, it is a lot of responsibilities that we have. Um, and um, I know, Pekka, you have to, to you have another um, appointment. And um, I think let's let's close on this note. You know, we are in this together. Um, welcome, Finland. I hope tonight you have a chance to have um, some of your wonderful um, uh, Finnish vodka to celebrate. <laughs> but um, we, we are in it together. NATO is more important than it was ever. We have to work together. We have to work with the public. And this is why I also believe this public forum is very important. And we have to go out to our societies because we are all convinced, but we have to bring the message to the people who now have to pay higher prices for their energy in our country. So thank you so much. It was wonderful to have you here and um, hope to see you at the Munich Security Conference. Thank you. Never say never. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome back. I'm sorry to break into the what you thought was the coffee break, but it's actually afterwards, so uh, be with me. Thank you um, for being with us. Good afternoon for this session uh, on uh, NATO's role in the neighborhood. And please join me in welcome this stellar panel. Um, Elena Carreras, Defense Minister, Carreras, Defense Minister of Portugal. Um, Dragomir Zakov, Defense Minister of Bulgaria. Um, <laughs> Slavyanka Petrovska, Defense Minister of the Republic of North Macedonia. And last but not least, Rob Bauer, Admiral Rob Bauer, head of the NATO uh, military committee, chair of the military, military committee. So um, join me in giving a hand to our panel as a nice welcome now after lunch. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, the Alliance has firmly refocused its uh, uh, on, on, uh, on territorial defense in the East, yet um, it also still continues to face security challenges in the South. Um, the Western Balkans and the Southern and the Middle East and North Africa are two, uh, two different pairs of shoes. Yet they do have in common each in their way, the quality of the soft underbelly of the alliance in, ter in the terms of having structural vulnerabilities that are easily exploited by external powers. Is the southern neighborhood turning into another frontier of uh, the strategic competition with Russia, with China, uh, while we're not looking? Um, and what is NATO's role in mitigating those risks. So these are some of the questions we're going to discuss today. And I, if you allow me, I'll start with you, uh, Minister Carreras. Um, so the big picture question is here. I mean, we know the southern, the, the southern uh, NATO member states, of course, they stand firmly behind Ukraine. Um, but there are also legitimate concerns that the southern neighborhood is not to be neglected. So perhaps can you, uh, Minister, tell me a little bit um, where do you see the challenges? That what are your greatest concerns with regard to the South? What could happen? Well, uh, let me start by thanking uh, the invitation to be here and congratulating the initiative uh, NATO, uh, in partnership with Elcano Institute, the Atlantic Council, the German Marshall Fund, and the Munich Security Conference, for the fact that we are here um, uh, trying to share our views with the public. And this is absolutely crucial, not only because we are accountable to our publics, but because this is uh, at the core of the values we are standing for and fighting for in the present context. So openness and uh, making clear our positions. And, and going uh, directly uh, to, your, to your question, um, there are, of course, of course concerns. We, we know that NATO uh, is uh, looking at uh, the East because of what's going on, but we cannot forget that threats come from uh, uh, very different areas, and uh, we, we should not uh, forget about that. And I don't think NATO is forgetting about that, because we have this 360-degree concept, which is well um, uh, described and, and uh, reinforced, I think, in this uh, our new NATO strategic concept. And so the idea is that we should not forget that uh, the threats are coming from all these areas. As far as the southern flank is concerned, um, I would underline the fact that we are witnessing uh, uh, different security challenges coming from food insecurity, uh, the, 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 which is affecting uh, African countries uh, uh, due to this uh, disruption of uh, supply chains. We are uh, witnessing uh, a variety of other other um, threats related to economic and social conditions, the cost of living, and all these poli uh, social and economic circumstances are uh, should be taken into consideration, as well as the political instability there, 
which has given uh, a space for a growing influence of Russia. This instability and the, the fact that uh, paramilitary groups are uh, uh, increasingly present, as well as hybrid campaigns that are pitting us against our original partners, are creating uh, the true challenges we should monitor and be ready to face uh, within this uh, new approach uh, that the, the strategic concept and the NATO policy will, will definitely uh, reinforce. Thank you, Minister. Two follow-up questions on this. One, you, manage, uh, you mentioned the 360-degree approach. Um, how do you think Putin views uh, Europe's periphery? Do you think he has two drawers, one in his, on his desk in the Kremlin, one says southern neighborhood, one says eastern neighborhood? Does Putin have a 360-degree approach? Well, I guess so, because uh, Russia is present, uh, present all over in these other areas. Uh, in the MENA region, in Africa, uh, also, uh, well, in the Atlantic. So we should not lose sight of all these other challenges. And we definitely should think of uh, reinforcing uh, our partnerships. Mm -hmm. It's not that NATO uh, should be there. We are, NATO is a regional uh, alliance, uh, but it should be concerned about the stability at our borders because our security depends also on the stability of our neighbors. And so this means uh, that uh, ch uh, strategies should be developed in order to uh, face uh, these uh, challenges, to help our neighbors, uh, being realistic, but helping our neighbors uh, through uh, the reinforcement, the strengthening of these partnerships. And of course, uh, I think that the partnership between the EU and NATO is absolutely uh, crucial. Um, and uh, it's also being referred, but also uh, reviving uh, formats and uh, strengthening our partnership with the African Union, for instance, or reviving existing formats uh, uh, that we, we had and we should uh, now, um, uh, I think, uh, also um, commit to, like the Mediterranean Dialogue or the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative. Uh, so there are a lot of things I, sh I think we should be doing. Uh, and there are uh, now tools to develop uh, this, uh, this strategy to, to uh, promote and contribute to a more secure southern um, uh, neighborhood. And Minister, second follow-up, are you happy with the prominence the Southern Neighborhood has in the strategic concept? That's a difficult question. Uh, uh, I'm happy that it's there, uh, and I believe that the, m the most important will be the follow-up actions uh, after the, the, the strategic concept is a framework document. It is very important. But what we'll do together, uh, the way how we'll be able to um, um, raise awareness about the challenges and the threats at the South will be the, the decisive development, I believe. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister Zakov, I'll come to you now. Um, I can't help mentioning yesterday Bulgaria expelled 70 Russian diplomats on claims of espionage. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And perhaps in that context, can you explain how uh, the cumulative aggression from Russia has raised Bulgaria's, the Western Balkans, vulnerability to Russian influence? Yeah, indeed. Uh, it was an un unprecedented decision yesterday uh, in Bulgaria. But let me say first that uh, both in Bulgaria but also in our neighborhood, uh, we see a new reality actually. There is a conventional warfare, there is a, also a hybrid warfare. Of course, the conventional war is outside the territory of NATO, but the hybrid war is actually also inside the territory of NATO. And Bulgaria is actually in the forefront of this, of this war uh, that we are fighting, uh, have been fighting for, uh, for, for years, I, I should say even. Uh, so yesterday, indeed, we, we took a very difficult but important decision uh, to declare, to, to actually to, to expel 70 diplomats, uh, Russian diplomats, and also to limit the Russian mission to up to 20, uh, 24 diplomats and 20, around 25 technical staff. Uh, I think this will limit the abilities of Russia to disrupt the normal uh, political life, if, if you wish, of, the, of Bulgaria. 
Uh, and it's, from this point of view, this is an important step. Uh, I have no illusion that Russia will try to, to strike back, absolutely, uh, in, many, in many areas, including cyber, by the way. Uh, so I, I can expect, actually, um, even uh, worse hybrid uh, activities in the, in, the, in, the, in the next months. Uh, so, but uh, you know, uh, this is not that much different in Bulgaria if you compare with the neighborhood of Bulgaria. And uh, you, you mentioned the Western Balkans. Uh, Western Balkans are subject of such kind of uh, hybrid, uh, Russian hybrid warfare, and also from Russian proxies as well in the region uh, for many years, for, for decades, for centuries, even uh, if, if we have to be absolutely precise. Uh, so, uh, uh, I think that. Uh, in the current circumstances, uh, we have to really put a great emphasis on the on what we have to do with the Western Balkans, uh, and uh, also I have no illusion that if we want to achieve long-lasting peace and security uh, in the Western Balkans, we have to engage with all the countries there. Uh, and in this context, let me say that we I think we all tend to forget that, for example, Kosovo is also part of this group of countries, and I think that. Uh, in my view, this is my personal view, uh, that people in Kosovo also have the, the right for European and Atlantic uh, perspective and, uh, and future. Uh, and uh, th I think this is the essence. We need a strong political and practical vision of what we have to do with the Western Balkans. And this is not only a bureaucratic approach. We, have really, we need really a vision. And I'll, I'll stop there and I'll leave for, uh, some room for questions maybe in this context as well. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the, um, you mentioned how the Russian aggression has put the integration of the Western Balkans at, at the top of the agenda in, uh, in, in, in the integration into the Euro-Atlantic community, yeah? uh, which includes, of course, NATO, but also your membership. Um, I wonder, so Bulgaria has been vetoing North Macedonia and EU accession candidacy. What, I mean, I know this is a NATO conference, but I think this is, I, mean, I was just wondering, since you both are members uh, of NATO, how do you navigate those differences within the alliance? Uh, I even have a, had a meeting recently with, uh, with Slavenka just a few weeks ago in, in Sofia. Uh, and we realized that uh, when we speak about defense, collective defense, security, uh, we're absolutely on the same page, 100%, 100% allies. Uh, and there should be no doubt about that. Uh, and we have excellent cooperation, regardless of any, any kind of differences we have bilaterally or, uh, or regionally, if you wish, as well. So uh, in terms of uh, cooperation in the field of defense, we have no issues at all. And this is the role of NATO. And let me remind that uh, NATO was the first place where we, uh, we had declarations uh, on one of the sensitive issues uh, with, uh, with our, our friends uh, uh, from Skopje. So uh, I think now we have a clear perspective how to overcome um, the, the difficulties also within the European Union. And I, I'm absolutely optimistic that we can do it in the next uh, days or so. Minister Petrovska, I'll, I'll let you come in on that in a, just in a second, but I have one follow-up question uh, uh, to Mr. Zakov. Um, maybe in, in the broader terms, we also heard the news about uh, the successful negotiation with Turkey this morning. Um, in broader terms, um, I'd like to ask you, who benefits from internal divisions within the alliance? What kind of message does it send to Moscow or Beijing if NATO uh, unity is subject to political bargaining in a constant way? I think this is an easy, easy answer, I guess. Uh, why? Because I think regardless of the differences we have in NATO, regardless of the nature of these differences, uh, we always manage to overcome them. And uh, we have a very interesting uh, sentence in room one of, of the North Atlantic Council room, uh, which says uh, animus in consolendo liber, which means we are free uh, in our minds in consultations. Uh, and I think the consultations, the dialogue is the main thing that we have, the main uh, weapon we have, the weapon we have in our hands. Uh, because through dialogue, we always find solutions, the solutions for good, the solutions for, uh, for, the, for the good of our people and for the, for the, in the name of the collective, collective defense. Thank you. Minister Petrovska, um, perhaps you would like to come before I come with other questions on the, to come in on the navigating, navigating differences. 
Well, yes, as uh, Minister Zakov mentioned, uh, we had an excellent cooperation in the field of defense, and practically this shows that we are acting as real ministers for defense uh, <laughs> on the NATO alliances, uh, which I really want to encourage the heads of our states, the prime ministers, ministers of foreign affairs, who are dealing with current with the, the dispute that we have with Bulgaria, to see this positive example, actually, what this show means that uh, we are seeing the bigger picture. We are seeing what we have to achieve together. We are uh, fighting together for the common security, which is now the challenge, the, or priority number one uh, in, for the NATO alliances. Uh, this means that despite the dispute that we have, it's open issue, and we are trying, we are giving our best from both sides to be solved as soon as possible, because this is something that is blocking our European perspective, the European integration of North Macedonia, but as well of of Albania. Uh, in the circumstances in the world that we are facing now uh, with, the, with the conventional war happening in Ukraine, which we all condemned, and of course we don't see any, any basis for, for that, uh, we think that we have to stay united as NATO alliances cease, but also the European integration process of the countries in the Western Balkan especially should continue as soon as possible. This means that the Western Balkans, which is practically one of the topics that we are discussing today, is very important for the Europe, but also for the world. Uh, the influence of Russia is present, and this is something that we are all uh, having, we are witnessing every day, I will say. Our responsibilities as the governments of the states who are member states of NATO and are willing, in the case of North Macedonia, we are willing to become a member state of European Union, is to develop and to increase the capabilities, the national capabilities to fight against the hybrid threats which are present in, even in North Macedonia, despite the fact that North Macedonia is a member state of NATO for two years, but since uh, apparently that Russia has a huge interest in the Balkans. I will mention uh, in this way also the situation in Kosovo and relations between Kosovo and, and Serbia, the, the open issue that they have which we strongly support them to solve these open issues. Because as more as you have open issues on the Balkans, the security challenge is bigger. So uh, seeing from the perspective of North Macedonia, we, are, have been, we, we have been as a country several years ago, and where are we now? I think that every effort that we, are, we did invest in our future mm -hmm. was paid. Uh, I mentioned when we were preparing for this uh, session, on the 24th of February this year, with, when the uh, Russian U uh, invasion in Ukraine started, the people in North Macedonia were asking, are we safe? Mm -hmm. And that, that was a question that they were, uh, they were asking to the Ministry of Defense, of course. I had a very easy answer to give, because I was sure what we are. And I said, yes, we are safe because we are a member state of NATO. But how we achieved that? It was a long path. It was a path full with uh, political sacrifices, of course, but it was something that was worth to invest in. So this is a pure example of what all the countries in the Western Balkan especially should do. I know that we know as uh, people from North Macedonia that uh, solving an open dispute is not very easy. But first of all, you have to uh, to be willing to do that, mm -hmm. and second of, of all, you have to be very reasonable when you're solving these issues. So this is maybe advice or a message to my colleagues from Kosovo and Serbia, but as well to the politician Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm -hmm. Since we have this, I will say, main spots on the Balkans who maybe become uh, challenging uh, for the security and safety. So. You were saying you, had, you could unequivocally say to your people, yes, you are safe, but you're safe on the, uh, in the area of conventional warfare. warfare. Are, the, are your people safe in this area of hybrid warfare? And, warfare? and the other, the other question, uh, follow-up question I would have is, um, you mentioned the hotspots. What would be your, let's say, top three wish, wish list to NATO for the Western Balkans? Uh, yes, I mentioned that we are not uh, uh, put on site on the list of uh, mm -hmm. Russia from uh, the hybrid threats. We are dealing with, with that, I will say, on everyday basis, on different issues maybe. Mm. Uh, mainly, uh, we are now focused on, on uh, building 
and uh, strengthening the capacity of, of national level. When I say building capacities of national level, it doesn't mean that we are only working with the governmental institutions. Because fighting against the hybrid threats and dealing with them actually is the whole society approach. And it's very important that the whole society is included and is aware what are the hybrid threats and what they are, why they are happening. Probably uh, so far, I must say that we have a huge support from the society, which is a very good um, uh, point. And of course, together we are continuing to work on with them. Thank you, Minister. Um, Admiral Bauer, um, in a recent interview, you quoted military strategist Zum Zu's The Art of War as saying, speed is the essence of war, take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness, travel by unexpected routes and strike him where he has taken no precautions. Um, Admiral Bauer, as of today, which do you think is in Putin's eyes the weakest spot where we haven't taken enough precautions and what precautions must NATO take? Allow me to say one thing about this unity, because I think uh, it is uh, extremely important yes, also please. from Mr. Putin's point of view. Um, we, we often get questions about this, and, and the question is always like a, a worry question, like uh, how is the unity in NATO? And actually, what we are defending together is that we are 30 sovereign states. We defend the fact that we are sovereign states, and therefore we should actually cherish the fact that we have differences of opinion. Because that is actually what makes us so much stronger. Once we agree to something, then actually nobody is able to get between us. So I think it is, it's very seen as a concern, but actually, yes, it is probably di more difficult to reach an agreement at 30, and soon, I hope, with 32. But once we agree on all these issues, and on a daily basis, we agree, we have consensus in the NATO headquarters amongst the 30 allies on a daily basis, not only leading up to the summit, but on a daily basis, an enormous amount of subjects we agree upon. So I think <coughs> it is e extremely important to underline that because I think our unity is a center of gravity for Mr. Putin. And therefore, we have to work hard on that day in, day out. And I think once the alliance as a whole is attacked, we will close ranks. That's actually what you saw when Ukraine was attacked. Then there was enormous unity, then there was enormous unity between the EU and NATO, and there was an enormous unity within the EU. And then the combination of EU and NATO is an enormous powerful instrument. And that's what the world saw, that's what Mr. Putin has experienced, and I think that is what Mr. C is now also watching. And yes, it will be difficult uh, when time progresses, but this is what we have to work upon. I think all the statements from the leaders today uh, point into the direction that we will continue to support Ukraine. We will have to, because this is not only about Ukraine. This is about our freedom. This is about our way of solving issues. This is how we have uh, agreed to basically solve an issue between nations. And if we are letting this go, the rules-based international order, if we let that go, then that is the beginning of the end. And I think that is why all the leaders now say we will continue to assist uh, Ukraine in its fight against Russia. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you say what is the most important mm -hmm. issue, I think that is the unity. Uh, I think um, President Putin has been most likely I don't know entirely, of course, but is most likely surprised by the enormous unity, by our enormously, by uh, our quick response to the new situation. Within days, we started to move troops. Within two weeks, we had 40,000 troops under command of uh, Secure. So I think he saw that we are able to respond effectively. Mm -hmm. And the things he will see now is the eight battle groups along the eastern flank. He will see the strengthening of our readiness up to 300,000. All the things that are now being um, uh, announced in, in, in the summit here in Madrid uh, lead up to a conclusion where actually all the things he, he had nightmares about will actually going to happen for him. Yeah. Well, thank you for reminding of us what I think is a very valid point that we should cherish that the, the, the 
the differences uh, also as an expression of uh, uh, the consensus building between sovereign nations. So thank you for that. Um, we're going to take questions now, both from the audience here in Madrid and, from, and online, as far as I understand. But before we do that, you please go frame your questions. I, uh, Admiral Bell, I do need to ask you one more question about the southern neighborhood, because in the Middle East and Africa, the, the broad range and diffuse nature of the threats um, makes an effective response difficult, and it also limits, um, realistically, the role NATO can play as a military alliance. So um, what can NATO realistically do in the South and what not, and how would you like to see the division of labor with partners going forward, with the EU regional partners, UN, and so on? I think you could distinguish two sorts of um, a cooperation that we have either with nations or with organizations. First is that we assist nations in their defense um, uh, sector or security sector reform uh, efforts. Uh, and that is, for example, being done in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, in, uh, uh, in Kosovo, and in Iraq. Those are uh, places where we work together with the local governments, where we assist most of the time based on their own request in making, themselves, making those uh, nations and those governments stronger in terms of resilience and their ability to actually, uh, with civilian oversight, have a proper functioning government with regard to security uh, uh, and, and defense. Uh, so that is what we're doing. And then there's practical assistance in terms of the secure and safe environment, uh, which K4 provides in Kosovo, the freedom of movement that K4 provides in, uh, in Kosovo, but also uh, that we are now have agreed with Mauritania, where we um, support uh, the Mauritanian government with uh, border control or in their efforts to counter terrorist uh, organizations. So it is always a combination of strengthening and making uh, governments and organizations more resilient on the one hand, uh, on their request, it's not forced upon them by us, on their request, and on the second, uh, uh, on the other hand, it is practical assistance also during the pandemic or during floods or in other situations where NATO is always able to help uh, uh, as, as an alliance. So it is um, not necessarily a grand strategy where the whole of North Africa and the whole of Middle East is being uh, served by NATO. That is not the case. I mean, it is always a combination of a discussion between a nation and NATO, and then yeah. the nations will decide how they can help. Yeah, and since most of the threats in the South are not necessarily of military nature, the, main, the big things that maybe, is there a limit to what, what NATO's role is there? You know, I mean, because in an earlier panel today, somebody said, I'm worried about any, uh, um, was it like uh, anything that deludes our focus on uh, China and Russia to my energy. Would you, would you see that, that risk in the South, in NATO's activity in the South? Yeah, I would say more in general, without being specific, is that anything that threatens our security and stability should be of interest to us. Mm. Uh, wherever it comes from, that is the 360 degree approach. That's why we are not only focusing on Ukraine, however important Ukraine is, but that's why we have to look at the, uh, at the uh, high north. That's why we have to look, as the Portuguese minister said, to the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. There's cables underwater from uh, North America to uh, Europe, where a lot of our uh, money is being earned through the, the data uh, that goes through all those cables. Um, and uh, so we have to look at that. We look at the South in terms of terrorism and all the instability that comes from that. Yeah. And we look, of course, to the, to the, to the East. So I would say not, uh, um, we can rule out any possible involvement because we, it, it might change over time. And yeah. therefore, we have to respond to that. Thank you. Time for questions for the audience. Uh, Oh, there's already some back. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question. Thank you to the panel for um, such interesting remarks. Um, it builds a bit on what Admiral Bauer was just speaking about. Uh, I understand that it's quite evident that deterrence and defense requires ready, credible, and lethal conventional armed forces. The threat to the alliance, though, is much more complicated as a strategic concept, which for the audience is now online, mm. <laughs> as states. Uh, we are now in an era of strategic competition, and that competition goes beyond one of conventional warfare, but across many aspects of society. 
What is the role of the military in addressing the threats under the threshold of armed conflict? How should our armed forces adapt their capabilities to face the complexity of types of attacks beyond just the conventional approaches? Thank you, Ramat. Thank you. Thank you. And for the remark on the strategic concept, I can see you all taking your phones, so don't be guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, this question was directed to Admiral Bao or anybody in particular who would like to take this. Yeah, I, I would yeah. like to answer. Um, yeah. I think the military uh, and the armed forces in, in general will play uh, a very important role in addressing many of those issues is because we are used basically to work uh, under conditions where there is chaos or where there is uncertainty. And I think in the so-called so gray zone phase of a conflict between peace and war or conflict, uh, you have the hybrid threats. And therefore, it is very important that a combination of intelligence to make sure that you understand where the threat is coming from, where you actually recognize the threat, one, try to find out where it's coming from. Uh, intelligence services can play a role there. Secondly, if there is chaos as a result of hybrid, then the military can play a role in, assi in assistance of local uh, uh, police uh, forces to assist the governments of the nations where this is happening. Uh, if uh, it is moving fastly towards conflict, then the military will evidently uh, play, play a role. Uh, the military uh, or, or the armed forces have uh, significant cyber uh, experience and capabilities with which they will be able to assist the governments when it comes to cyber attacks. So there is a, um, a, a large, um, uh, there's a, a large variety of, of tasks and um, expertise where, where we basically can assist the governments of the nations because resilience is a national responsibility in most of the nations still. And therefore, uh, 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 we, can, we can help the, the governments when it is necessary in support of. Thank you. Um, we also have questions from the online audience. And there's one question here, um, which points, which goes to um, which points to um, the role of China in the Balkans. Um, I'm just going to read the question. The BRI could provoke a conflict of interest between economic commitments and military commitments of member states in NATO. Is there a way out of it for Balkan countries that already counted on BRI advantages for financial improvement? Mr. Petrovska, yes, I, I, can, I can make a short comment on this. Um, I think that we should be aware of the new situation uh, in Europe, which was, of course, um, posed on what was happening in the in the Ukraine. And regarding, I will refer just in shortly to the strategic concept, which actually shows practically that NATO is aware of the new circumstances, but also predicts what will happen in the future. And this is how I connected the, the this uh, the answer with with uh, the China. Uh, the things has changed in the past several years, of course, and the position of China as well. So I think that all of the countries, especially the ones who are member states of NATO and are on the Balkan Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but of course, and the rest of the countries should take care of this because apparently it's possible that maybe China will take some step, steps which are not on the same line with NATO alliances. I'm not claiming anything, but this is something that we should be aware of. Uh, this situation with Ukraine has clearly shown what side we are taking as NATO alliances. I don't think that uh, there should be any country who can justify what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Killing innocent people, for example, what happened yesterday and the day, day, uh, then day two be uh, before that, has shown yeah. that, uh, that the life ha doesn't have a price. So, so, this is so something you expect the same unity with regard to China? I don't think that we will have the same unity, but this is a message that we have to send, mm. that we are not justifying and that we cannot cooperate with someone who is doing what he's doing in Ukraine. This is a very strong message that we are sending, mm. and all the actions that NATO alliances have, have taken so far is actually showing this. I think yeah. that we should, be say, we should stay on the same line and actually sing, send the message. Uh, we are treating uh, China North Macedonia as a friend, of course. We have a good diplomatic cooperation, but this is something that we should be aware in the future, of course. Mr. Zakov, you'd like to come in on this question? 
Yeah, just to add that, I think, in, in my view, uh, we have to be worried about uh, growing Chinese uh, soft power's influence uh, in, in the region. And uh, if you take the current challenges we have, uh, of course, the war is, uh, is a threat. Uh, but also, uh, we have to add to this the economic challenges uh, that we are facing already and we will be facing uh, in the near future. Uh, I mean, inflation, even stagflation, maybe recession in the worst case scenario in the region. And from that, uh, from that point of view, I think uh, uh, we have to be worried about uh, possible Chinese growing influence to try to come in and uh, be a kind of a balanced power in this time of uh, economic turbulences. Yeah. Uh, but I absolutely agree with um, uh, Mr. Petrovska that uh, we, have to, uh, we have to show unity. And this is, I think, the most important thing. And we have to continue to engage closely with our partners in the region in order to counterbalance this uh, growing Chinese influence from, from outside. Yeah. I'm delighted how on this panel we discussed unity in all its shades and forms. Um, I think we have time for one more question from the audience here. There's a spontaneous arm going up, so I'm just going to snatch you. Thank you. It's a very interesting session. My name is Velizar Shomano from Bulgaria. Question is about an issue that uh, we identified already in Wales, but still not solved. Uh, in Eastern Europe, many countries are relying on Soviet-made uh, military equipment, and defense industry is still linked with, uh, with Soviet legacy. So how we could address this on NATO level, or it will stay only national issue? And uh, with this uh, current tension and uh, real war, it is uh, quite a vulnerability that is not helping for deterrence. Thank you. Is there anybody in particular who would like this as a question? Yeah. I, I want to ask first uh, yes. Admiral Bauer, because uh, military equipment comes with tactics and even culture and command and control habits. So I see this not only as a technical problem, but operational one. Of course, when it comes to industry and uh, procurement, and other mechanisms, it is for the ministers. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a good question, actually. And um, part, partly uh, it will be solved by uh, the present war uh, between Russia and, and, and Ukraine, because a number of nations are giving away the Soviet-type weapons to Ukraine and are, as a result, requiring a, a replacement, which will not be a Soviet-type weapon, but a, a, Western, a Western system. And uh, so the issue is then that, in, uh, that there might be a, a time delay between the giving away and having the new systems as a result uh, of uh, the fact that uh, production uh, is uh, slower than uh, we all want at the moment. So basically, uh, I think the, the thing you are addressing is basically happening. I think there is a transition ongoing, uh, and, it, uh, and we basically uh, reached the point where the Soviet systems, even without the war uh, in Ukraine, could no longer be sustained for, for, for many, many years because of their technological age. So I think it is, a, it is, an, it is a, 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 an issue, but at the same time, I think we will see in the next 10 years most likely a transition more and more from those systems to Western systems. And then hopefully we have also addressed the uh, uh, production capacity issue, which is there at the moment. I mean, money is less and less becoming a problem in NATO. But what we see now in terms of how strong is the chain, that is always the weakest link, the next uh, uh, thing we need to solve is production capacity. Because the industry has not uh, basically uh, uh, sped up the same way as the money is increasing. And therefore, we now see that we see uh, the um, demand goes up, but uh, the capacity is unable to live up to that demand. So the prices go up and the delivery times go to the right. And that is actually not good because we want to see defense as a result of more spending, more security as a, res as a result of the, the spending. So I think that is uh, uh, the next sort of issue that we mm -hmm. will have to solve together with investors, because it's not only the governments that can say to industry produce more, because there's, um, there's like banks and there's pension funds and there's investors involved who have to um, look not only at dividend, but also at national security. So I think this is an important topic that needs to be addressed in the coming uh, months, actually, basically. 
Thank you. Unfortunately, we've come to the end and uh, other meetings are, are, are starting. Perhaps uh, um, just as I give the final word to you, Minister Carreras, uh, perhaps just as a, as a, a one-minute reply, what is it that you want to take home? What's your from this, from this summit? Yeah, Especially uh, maybe for the Southern agenda. Yes. I think the idea of uh, the need to cooperate to reinforce partnerships would be the, the one I underline because uh, it's not, it would be on, uh, about uh, political dialogue and reinforcing political dialogue, but also about cooperating uh, in very practical operational issues. You know, these new domains, the space, cyber, being able to, um, to, to tackle issues related to maritime security, to climate change, to uh, all these uh, uh, new uh, areas to face the new challenges. Uh, that would be the most important thing, uh, and we can learn from each other. It would not be only about spending more, but as in the European Union also is being underlined, uh, spending better and uh, together, doing it together uh, in order to uh, uh, be more effective. That would be my take. Thank you, Mr. Carreras. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a day of happy news, and I'm told that uh, as we go out, the coffee break is now open. Let me mean though, I will thank uh, all our panel. Thank you, everybody for your contributions. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you still getting coffee, uh, we're about to start now. Welcome back to this panel um, at the NATO Public Forum here in Madrid. I'm Lily Bayer. I'm a reporter at Politico based in Brussels. I'd like to welcome both our audience here in the room in Madrid and those of you following us around the world. Um, as a reminder, if you're following online, you can submit questions at any time for our panelists. And if you're in the room, you can just raise your hands when we get to the Q&A session. We will also have a polling question, uh, a very interesting one, that will be open online during this session. So please feel free to share your thoughts. Um, today's discussion will be on a very timely issue, that of hybrid threats. Um, just earlier today, uh, NATO leaders meeting here in Madrid endorsed a declaration where they said, among many other things, that they will accelerate adaptation and boost resilience to hybrid threats. And to discuss this issue with us today, uh, we have uh, three panelists, two of them on stage, one may be joining us uh, a bit later on. Uh, we have Lieutenant General Hans-Werner Wiermann, uh, Director General of the NATO International Military Staff. And we have Anna Wieslander, who is the Director for Northern Europe um, at the Atlantic Council. So to start off with you, Lieutenant General, what do you see as the top hybrid threats facing NATO at the moment? Well, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I hope it was not me. Uh, I tried to continue. So the main hybrid threats, I mean, they are daily in the newspapers, I would say. We are facing a number of cyber attacks. And as the internet becomes even more important and the internet of things grows i think cyber attacks have the potential to spill over from your computer uh, to the hardware uh, and the hardware is very important for our societies and you can even imagine uh, that it's possible today to switch out your electricity i hope this was not a cyber attack you heard in the background but still it's theoretically possible uh, so this is an issue which we have to deal with and attribution clearly is a huge issue. So who is the perpetrator? Uh, you have some uh, nation states being active in this, no question. And of course you have some nerds as well trying to uh, find out how powerful they can be. And then you have criminal activities. So there's a broad field of activities in the cyber arena. But then you can go on and the question is what do you find is hybrid? I mean it's a kind of flavor of the month's year, I would say, and many activities are covered by hybrid. Um, if you talk about uh, fake news, uh, that's an issue. Uh, you can pay uh, political parties to become difficult in your own society. Um, so there are many, many ways uh, to influence societies, and I think that's the big issue of hybrid threats, besides what I talked about, the physical threat to our societies in cyber arena, I think a key strategic goal of our potential, at least state actors, is to undermine our free societies. As democracies, we are probably more vulnerable uh, than more autocratic, uh, already uh, governed states. So they want to exploit these weaknesses. And of course, that's where we see most of the activity. And I would say that's the region and that's the area where we are currently most threatened. And clearly, resilience in many, many forms is the answer to it. Yesterday we had a, a very historic agreement. Turkey lifted its block, paving the way for Sweden and Finland to join. Um, but their applications also raise questions about potential new hybrid threats. So my question to you, Ms. Wieslander, you work on security issues um, in Northern Europe. Uh, what do you think NATO can learn from Sweden's total defense model at this point? Well, thank you and uh, thanks for having me. Um, does this work? Yes, good. Uh, I think uh, that uh, there is a lot of international interest in uh, both the Swedish and the Finnish total dis defense concept or model, if you want to say so. It was also touched upon in a panel here earlier today. That sounds better. Um, and uh, what that is, is, uh, I mean, from the start, two non-aligned countries with uh, relatively big territory compared to small population and, and widely spread. 
So we have developed this approach in which every citizen is important for the defense and has a role, and all parts of society has a role in planning and preparing for war. And that's even part of the legislation, actually, where everyone in Sweden from the age of 16 to 70 can be drawn upon in case of a major crisis or war. Uh, not uh, all for military service, I should underline. Uh, it's not a total militarization of society, but it would be three categories, uh, military uh, or civilian, working in hospitals and so on, or, or, and the third even for ordinary people that are not part of this conscript uh, assigned to a certain kind of production, for instance, that would be needed or requested. Um, but I think, uh, and this is a very complex way of planning, uh, which, is, which is interesting for many, and I think within the context of what we are di discussing today, hybrid threats and resilience, uh, this is interesting because it builds deterrence into peacetime society, and that's really what we are looking at when we talk about hybrid, because hybrid is not, does not exclude the military, but we want to, to capture it and counter it before it becomes military, so to say. Um, so that is one important factor of it, creating robustness in society in various ways. Uh, and the second uh, dimension, which I think uh, is of great interest, uh, is also the way that the total defense uh, concept or model uh, engages the population uh, into defending your country. And we have seen that so much in Ukraine. I mean, it's one of the absolute keys for rallying the support among Western countries for Ukraine is what we see the Ukrainians doing to really fight for, for the democracy for their country. Uh, and this engagement uh, in, uh, in defending freedom uh, of your country, you can build through the total uh, defense concept. And we heard earlier here uh, Finnish defense minister saying that the will to fight is, is, is high in, in Finland, and I think it's the same in Sweden, even if Finland has preserved their total defense model uh, to an even larger extent than Sweden has. So I think these two dimensions, both the deterrence dimension and the engagement factor in, in this uh, total defense approach, uh, it's a whole of society approach, but it's a, it's a tough one, I should say. It's, it's legislative and there is n nothing stopping the whole of society to engage in case of war. That's, that's the fundamental of it. That's super interesting. Um, Lieutenant General, with the expansion of the alliance uh, northward, um, do you think we will see a surge in hybrid threats and new types of hybrid threats, especially targeting mm -hmm. Sweden and Finland? I mean, uh, the tools will not change. I think innovation is fast, but not that fast. Um, but uh, of course, um, our peer competitor, Russia in particular, will have uh, an interest to slow down the process or undermine the process. Uh, I think uh, Russia just has failed today uh, because uh, there was a decision uh, very clearly taken today by uh, the summit uh, that uh, Finland and Sweden are invited to become members of NATO. So this hybrid activity we have seen before and with a lot of information, disinformation, uh, even threatening uh, nuclear options, uh, which is also part of hybrid warfare, I would say, have failed so far. Will this stop? Uh, no, it will not stop. Will it uh, apply new tools? Probably not. Will it succeed? No. Um, we have seen, and I think a lot of experts are increasingly concerned about, you know, fake news and attempts to um, influence populations in, in parts of the alliance. Uh, Ms. Wieslander, what would be your recommendation to, to leaders meeting today um, when they're grappling with this problem, um, maybe not necessarily in places like Sweden, but in other parts of the alliance where maybe, um, you know, some populations are, are watching TV segments that uh, um, include fake news? Well, that's, it's uh, an ongoing and a very important uh, topic to address. Uh, I think that's, it's really a leadership issue to have that communication and to dare to take that conversation over and over again uh, to, to outline the argument and, and counter the facts. Um, I think also education is, is extremely important if you look at it, how you can approach it from a, a societal uh, approach, having critical thinking, um, learning. Uh, in Sweden we have uh, 
developed a range of instruments in this regard, uh, which is targeting uh, young people. Uh, and I think that's, that's really also something that you have to do. And, uh, and you should not, um, you should also listen to society and, and have, a, have kind of an, a monitoring of the information space, which is very important, I think, to see what's going on and to take uh, st some stories and some concepts seriously and, and, and to have strategies to, to counter them back. Um, in Sweden now, we have established a psychological defense agency, <laughs> which is, um, uh, I, I think, really interesting in this regard. And it's built to address the digital society in this regard, both by monitoring uh, the information space, but also then uh, uh, putting forward strategies to reach out with knowledge, uh, uh, which is fact-based, uh, to address what we see and can, and can encounter in the information space, and to collaborate with various um, actors such as journalists or media houses, uh, uh, social media companies and others. So um, I think by doing it systematically, but you cannot only leave it to agencies. You really have, to, as a politician, you have to look at it um, as a leadership issue. I really think that's important. Um, Lieutenant General, you talked about how some actors are trying to exploit weaknesses within our societies. And I know the word resilience has become somewhat of a buzzword, um, but it is uh, a very uh, broad and important concept. And from your perspective, how can you know, NATO governments, but maybe not even governments, but also civil society, you mentioned education systems, how can we build this resilience and make maybe the, the average citizen, someone who is probably not watching this panel, um, more aware um, of the uh, ways maybe some malign actors might be trying to target them? Well, first of all, I think resilience, again, has many, many aspects. Um, and uh, you can take resilience as the need to have uh, a backup solutions for your most critical uh, data connections you have in your country. You may wish to have uh, electricity uh, redundancies. So you can tackle a, re a resilience from a very traditional point of view, protect your critical infrastructure, but uh, where we are right now in our discussion, and Anna, I'm grateful that you said this is mainly a, a civilian effort, and I fully sub subscribe to that. Uh, we are more in the information space. Uh, and uh, I think what we have experienced over time is the more open we address these issues, the more clearly we manage uh, to communicate to our own people and to tell them what is true and what's not true. I mean, they don't believe us in the first glance, I would say, but the more we continue and the more credible we are, the better our chances uh, to dismiss, dispel um, fake news and to actually strengthen the resilience of our people. We have to make them aware it's a fact and not everything you hear is true and not every picture is not manipulated. Some of them are. And social media are not uh, uh, the source of final wisdom. Uh, they are just a source of many, many different views, uh, which uh, you may subscribe to or not. So if you can actually make people more critical about what they read, uh, that would go a long way to strengthen resilience. We will not stop this information because the cyberspace is global by nature. We are not going to wall on, uh, wall in, wall out, whatever uh, you say, our uh, cyberspace uh, in our countries. Uh, so you have to, well, make people aware and make them more critical about what they read. By the way, this is not only in the global context uh, useful. I think this is in the more individual and private context also very important because we have some dangerous developments there as well. And just to, to follow up on that, um, as you said, this is mostly a, a, a civilian effort and, and one that is done on, on a national level, but um, what can NATO as an institution do to, to help institutions you know, uh, in the allied states um, better deal with these challenges? Are there any programs, initiatives, know-how that you can share as an institution? Yes, of course. I mean, there's something NATO has, and NATO has something which I call a convening authority. So if we have an interesting topic, we can invite countries, and countries will come, and they will provide the best specialists. And I think we can offer a venue, not only for our allies, but also for our partners, and even for the public, where we can exchange best practices. And I think that goes a long way uh, to help 
uh, nations to do better, to learn from each other, because we are 30, soon 32, and if you incorporate our partners, even many more, uh, from which we can learn. So I think this convening platform, this uh, option and this chance uh, to actually share information about these developments, that can go a long way. At the same time, of course, we have uh, a lot of expertise in the Alliance. Uh, we have centers of excellence in Finland about hybrid warfare. Uh, we have centers of excellence in Estonia about uh, cyber security. Uh, we have, I think, a great experience and knowledge in NATO headquarters on communication, our own communication, but also hostile communication. So I think we have something to offer and we can use this convening authority. Yeah, I think I see some uh, NATO communication experts here in our audience. <laughs> um, as a reminder to the audience online, uh, you can submit questions for our panel. Um, but for now, uh, maybe let's take a few questions from the room first, if anyone has a question for our panel. Anyone? Oh, it's, a, it's a quiet audience today, maybe after, <laughs> after lunch. Um, so maybe, oh, yes, I see one. Great. If you could just introduce yourself. Sure, uh, Johannes Hui from Stanford University. Um, I guess, yeah, thank you so much for speaking about sort of some of the resilience building measures that um, NATO has been taking recently as against hybrid measures. Um, but I guess as we've seen that these um, deterrence by denial or resilience building measures haven't really necessarily reduced the, the quantity of of hybrid attacks in, in recent years, whether that's with cyber, whether that's with disinformation, or even some sort of uh, military components like drone overflights of uh, civilian and critical infrastructure. I guess, is there any appetite within NATO, you think, for more robust measures that impose costs on, on hybrid threats and hybrid threat actors um, that will actually change behavior as opposed to just, um, I guess, <coughs> protect infrastructure and, and sort of existing societies against hybrid, uh, future hybrid attacks? Would you like to take this one? I mean, first of all, but that's uh, very well known to everybody here in the room and uh, on, in the audience uh, around uh, as well. Uh, we are a defensive alliance, uh, so uh, that gives us our values. We protect our democracies and we share our values. So that's our guideline. Having said that, of course, we have to think about how we can increase the cost for cyber attacks. Um, when you look at the cyberspace, particular at, uh, at, at viruses and interference uh, with our cyber systems, uh, attribution is a key factor. Um, if you can say, okay, this was the following actor, we name you, and ideally we even find out what happens time to time, the individual who did it, and pu put this into the public arena, that goes a long way over time to deter people because you want to do your cyber attack, but you don't want necessarily to be known that you have done it. Uh, but there's a difference uh, because this forum uh, was also talking about Ukraine. Um, and Ukraine cyber attacks are also uh, increasing in numbers. Uh, and uh, there you don't have to care about attribution uh, because Russia is uh, already conducting a conventional war. But if you want to use cyber to undermine our societies, if you want to use uh, cyber uh, to, to, to do harm to us without being known, then you are afraid of attribution. So I think attribution is a key thing which we have to tackle. Um, we have to tackle it by uh, technical means. We have to do better uh, in investigating who is the perpetrator. But it's also about the political will actually to do it because if you uh, make uh, the perpetrator public, you share also something about your skills and your abilities to find out which you may not want to do. So it's a set of things you have to consider when you go for attribution. But for me, attribution would be something to increase uh, the level so that not people do easily use this tool which they have available. Ms. Fieslander, do you also see attribution as a key factor when fighting um, hybrid threats? Yes, I think that's uh, both the, the attribution is is important because it can it makes um, the engagement uh, 
the understanding of what's going on uh, among the public so much e e more easy than if it's just an, an attack against a company or as we have seen uh, various systems uh, because uh, it puts it up in the air and you can also rally with countries uh, aligning against uh, uh, the, the uh, aggressor or whatever you call it, the abuser. Um, and I think those, when we have seen those things happening, when we knew that oh, it was actually Russia in this case uh, hacking uh, the Norwegian parliament as has happened or uh, Bundeswehr, that's, that's important, it matters. Uh, so I think um, those, those things are important. Even if it's proxies and even if there is a little bit of, of risk, I think uh, it's better to indicate than to be too, too careful uh, because it serves a broader purpose. Um, and on Ukraine, I think also what we have seen, uh, we, have, we saw uh, Russia attacking the bank systems uh, earlier on, I think it was even before the invasion. Um, and whatever you can ex assist there with the cyber experts, so these kind of teams that are, I think that's very much appreciated and something that we can work on very concretely to have these kind of experts uh, ready to go wherever that is needed. Um, that's super interesting. We're very lucky to be joined by our third panelist, um, Irene Felin, Special Representative of the NATO Secretary General for Women, Peace and Security. We have been discussing hybrid threats and how to tackle them, and I was very curious what sort of hybrid threats you come across in your work on women and security. So thank, thank you very much, and so I apologize for being late. I was uh, hosting a meeting with uh, female ministers of uh, Defense and Foreign Affairs, uh, and we had to reschedule due to the uh, length of the night this morning. So very sorry, I apologize to just joining a bit later. But it's a very interesting question indeed because we discussed this as part of our conversation uh, just uh, half an hour ago. Because uh, it comes uh, very often that uh, cyber attacks are done against women in politics and the, the images and the role of women and the language that it's uh, used to undermine uh, the contribution of women in politics uh, is uh, very much widespread. And this is really an attack against uh, the physical and personal security, but it's also to undermine the role and contribution that women can have when it comes to uh, the field of uh, defense and security. And this is happening right now. I know if you heard that Norway is under attack right now, and the minister had then to leave the meeting because she is personally uh, attacked, and since there are some pictures going around. And the way in which women are attacked, it's completely different. The language and the use of the body, it's really uh, to humiliate and undermine. And this happens very often when women run into politics. It happened to Hillary Clinton, it happened to Annalena Baerbach, the minister of, current minister of foreign affairs of uh, Germany. And so this is particularly relevant when we want to look uh, uh, at a society and where the values of gender equality and equal opportunities are part of our democracy. Those are the values for, at NATO, for the alliance. And this is something that it needs to be taken into account in our policy. And this is also why, for me, as a special representative, as part of my work at NATO in our policy, when we talk about uh, including a gender perspective in everything what we do, because this is the reflection of our common values, this involves also the, the dimension of the, the, the cyber and then so to prevent this kind of attacks. It's a new field for the, gen, the nexus with gender, but I think it's extremely relevant because as I said, it goes hand in hand with the uh, objective to have more women being visible and actually participating in, in the world of peace and security. Do you see gender-based violence as something that could be categorized as part of this umbrella of hybrid threats? We were thinking about this and discussing yesterday where to put it. So uh, I would say that we should maybe use the terms conflict-related sexual violence, which is some different from the gender-based violence that I can also cover other phenomenon that are domestic violence or the based on, on gender or there are other um, female genital mutilation, it's connecting more with cultural traditions. So when we look at here at what we define as the conflict related sexual violence is the use of sexual violence against mainly women and, uh, and girls and children, but also men and boys, because this happens uh, less than against women, but it's happening again and it's happening in Ukraine uh, as well. 
this is part of what's really a, a, a strategy of war. We have seen this and witnessed uh, very often in the history. In the past, it was categorized as a consequence, as a natural, uh, collateral damage of, of a conflict. It was not taken into consideration as something that it was inevitable, so it was really part of what happened. It happened uh, all across the 20th century. But it was with, uh, in the Balkans in the, uh, in the 90s when this became really part of the conversation, and this has become now really one of the highest topics on the, on the agenda of uh, women, peace, and security, but general on security. And we have this conversation at NATO. We have this conversation a part of the NAC conversation when we uh, look at the analysis of the uh, Ukrainian, the conflict in uh, Again, the Russian aggression. This is becoming more normal as part of the analysis when I also invited to uh, update and uh, what is happening now. So it, it is part of the conflict. Sometimes it's, uh, it is now not clear if what is happening is really a strategy or sometimes it's like connected to a lack of discipline of the armed forces in Russia. So this is also part of this. It is also what makes a difference between the NATO standards, how we develop our gu military guidelines and our policies. NATO has a policy to combat and prevent conflict-related sexual violence, and the military guidelines to prevent this have recently been updated. Because there is a standard that all our armed forces want to respect to prevent this and to combat this phenomenon, which is not the case when it comes to other contexts and other armed forces. Do we have any other questions in the room for our panelists? Yes. If, if you could, um, there, there's a mic over there, and if you could please introduce yourself. And also let us know which of our panelists your question is addressed to. OK. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this public forum. Uh, my name is Patricia Martim, and I'm an intelligence analyst. Um, my question is related to the information sharing, and I would like to ask if taking into consideration the relevance of collective defense and collaboration with our partners, how important is for NATO and those NATO contemplate to increase the information exchange with other international organizations, such as the European Cybersecurity Organization or others? in this field on other to face cyber attacks or hybrid threats. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is one for you. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I talked about it already. <clears throat> uh, when we are more, we are better uh, because we have different practices. We have better uh, procedures. Some of them are better, others are not so good. And if we come together and exchange our experience, we're getting better. So therefore. Uh, cooperation between institutions is very, very important. You mentioned uh, NATO-EU cooperations. Uh, you know that there is a quite ambitious program uh, on the staff level, and we cooperate in particular in this field, which are common to uh, in, in our interest. But at the end of the day, we have to recognize that I think 22 members of NATO are also members of the European Union. Uh, so therefore, there is a great coincidence of interests. And uh, of course, we work together to share the information. Um, we use uh, the Center of Excellence for Hybrid Warfare in Finland together. Uh, we in NATO use it, but Finland so far was not a member uh, of NATO, so we used the EU facility basically. So we do it on a day-to-day uh, -day basis, and that's absolutely vital. And uh, again, uh, information sharing and transparency on information is a remedy and increases our resilience as well. Uh, yeah, I, I also wanted to actually ask you, Ms. Wieslander, um, uh, well, do you want to respond first? And I have a question for you then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to fill in. I think, I mean, when we address hybrid threats, uh, the EU-NATO cooperation is so central. And one step that is, uh, I think, very much needed there is to move forward on um, security arrangements in order to be able to exchange even more uh, information between the organizations that would really take us one step further in, in order to, to counter hybrid threats. Um, 
because that's the very much needed. And the other dimension that I wanted to point out that we haven't really touched upon is the one between private and public uh, actors, because if we talk about cyber domain, this is especially, I think, an area where private uh, actors are very much uh, in control, you can say, both of the operations and uh, targets <laughs> of these attacks uh, uh, within a country. So when it comes to energy or telecommunications and all of this, we really need to think about also um, that dimension to a large extent and, and work forward. And uh, coming from the think tank world, do you feel that there's sufficient information sharing between academia and think tanks, people who do a lot of intense research um, into hybrid threats and government military institutions? Well, I think we, um, the Atlantic Council and many other think tanks are working uh, a lot with projects uh, related to this. So I think. Uh, uh, this is an area where we, we do a lot, but we can, of course, do much more. Uh, and one of the, the hurdles is, is, of course, the security, uh, the information intel exchange in, in order to get, get deeper in that. But what we can do is, for, for instance, to facilitate discussions like this, where you have actors from uh, various sectors coming together and, and just getting a, a, a common view of, of uh, the threat uh, and how to address it. Uh, I think that's, that's one, one hurdle we can facilitate. And uh, Special Representative Feline, do you feel like there is sufficient information sharing about issues um, like challenges facing uh, women in the public sphere, threats to women? And do you feel that governments and, and think tanks are putting uh, sufficient emphasis in your view on this issue? Well, I think that's uh more research and more communication on, uh, on those uh, subjects is needed. Very often they are discussed among women contexts, uh, but what we don't need an echo chamber. We need to really address this topic as part of the society challenges. So this is the only way where we can overcome them. Lieutenant General, I was curious, in, in your work, does the issue of uh, threats to women and gender-based violence uh, come up in discussions about security and hybrid threats? I mean, <clears throat> uh, we have, as Irena just has laid out, we have a policy on uh, preparing and preventing uh, and educating our soldiers uh, uh, what not to do and how to behave. There's no question. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, we have to face the fact that war is uh, ideally uh, regulated uh, by the uh, law of the international armed conflict, but we see and it's a pity that not even the most basic things like the protection of the Red Cross is being adhered to uh, in this conflict we are facing right now in Ukraine. Uh, and so, therefore, what do we expect? Uh, I think we have to simply see this as an element of violence, which we all condemn, and we have to do our best to stop that. Uh, but I would not say this is related to uh, sexual abuse. Uh, it is just the use of abhorrent violence to undermine and uh, to, yes, to undermine the will of the opponent. Uh, before we wrap up, we have one question from the online audience. Um, cyber giants like Google, Microsoft, or Amazon are uh, as important as the UN and NATO in this um, uh, person's view in the world of security affairs. Um, are there new perspectives on the NATO agenda to put major tech companies in a more strategic position or take them into account? Uh, if, if anyone on the panel has any thoughts on that. Yes, uh, we have been discussing this for quite a while because we all use the systems of these uh, uh, software gi giants. And one thing is for sure, without them, we won't protect our systems because we cannot afford to do our own uh, operating systems. So we, we, we have to work closely together. Uh, we are just now considering to build a platform where we can actually improve our cybersecurity through a kind of routine, established, geofix, whatever you call it, dialogue with industry because these actors are extremely uh, important. Uh, I mean, to, 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 to put a sarcastic uh, aspect to it, they open the doors for our enemy uh, because mainly it's patches in their server software which we have to do in order to protect our systems. So if we want to succeed, we can only succeed together and therefore we need this dialogue and cooperation. 
Uh, in the meantime, I think our audience has filled out the poll. Um, I don't know if you, we can uh, maybe show the results here on the screen. Um, the, the question was to, to rank which hybrid threats they're most uh, worried about, and it looks like cyber attacks um, are, are the ones that our audience is most worried about, followed by disinformation <laughs> campaigns, followed by um, food security crises. So that, that, that's quite interesting. Um, but in a way, I feel fits in with, with, with what our panel Analysts have been saying um, with cyber attacks and, and disinformation being a, a major concern for um, policy makers. So unless we have any further questions from the audience, I'm, I'm looking around. Any final questions for our panelists? Um, yes. We have a few more minutes. If you could introduce yourself. I think there's a microphone right there. Hello. My name is Viola Ginger. I'm Washington Senior Editor for Just Security at New York University School of Law. It's great to be here, and thank you very much um, to all of you for, for this forum and for your presence and your comments. Um, I wanted to ask about the connection between Russia's war on Ukraine and some of the, not just cyber attacks in previous years, but also actually kinetic attacks, um, not only the assassinations over the years in some NATO countries, but also attacks that um, got renewed attention recently in the Washington Post on arms depots, for example, in Bulgaria and in the Czech Republic. So those were Russian military, attributed thusly, attacks on arms depot, depots in NATO countries. What is NATO's role in those sorts of situations, what should it be? And do you think that those kinds of attacks might get a different response today after this escalation in Ukraine than they did at the time? Um, maybe uh, Ms. Wieslander, would you like to take this one first, or Lieutenant General? I can go ahead. Well, <clears throat> uh, you're referring to the recent incidents where uh, the Russian Secret Service, GRU probably, uh, did brazen attacks in our territory. Uh, and uh, we only have to state, or well, we have to state that obviously uh, the Russian government uh, is uh, adhering to no rules and regulations and uh, actually using violence not only in the war, but also in the, uh, in the, in the, the run up to the war in our own countries. Uh, what we have offered and what we have seen is that the nations affected by these uh, uh, assassination attempts or explosions have taken the issue rather quickly to NATO. We had a debate on the Salisbury issue, uh, and the United Kingdom, the government, was very keen uh, to have a broad debate, and NATO and the North Atlantic Council was the forum for it. We had the similar thing uh, on the Bulgarian issue, and finally it led to the expulsion of diplomats, and not only to the expulsion of diplomats in the countries directly affected uh, by uh, the bombing or by the assassination attempts, but other nations agreed uh, to expel diplomats as well. So I think this is a very important function of NATO to take <clears throat> all security-related issues to the neck for discussion and then to think together uh, what we can do together to hopefully increase the level of deterrence in order to make these things things of the past, so they may not happen in uh, the future again, but that's wishful thinking. Uh, so of course we have to prepare uh, for such a situation again. But again, if you're not alone, but you can say, we 30 actually analyzed the situation. We all agree this is the perpetrator and this is what we do. This gives strength to the single nation, strengths in their position. I think that's exactly the role NATO can play. Ms. Wieslander. Yes, to add one dimension of that, I think NATO can do this important work, coordinate, uh, what, but what we need to do better, I think, and learn is to add for every incident, we need to, to look at them combined and see, oh, so we had cyber attacks, we have big disinformation attacks, we have the poisoning attacks, we have these this incidents happening, uh, but we have not 
we do not we do not aggregate them and act accordingly. And I think that uh, lack of action has also been a signal to Russia, which has caused uh, the situation that we are in now, because we did not react at several locations, a little bit by each incident, but not aggregated looking at this and what's actually going on. It's it's a it's a systemic challenge. Uh, which led up to a risk calculation by uh, Mr. Putin, which uh, nobody had anticipated that he would do, actually. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, but thank you so much for our panelists for joining us. Thank you all for your questions <coughs> and for participating in the poll. We will take a very short break, and then we will have um, a really interesting session on the view from Kiev. So please stay tuned. Because of the mic. <laughs> ah, yeah. right. microphone. If you could please take your seats. Uh, thanks so much, and welcome back to both our audience here in Madrid at the NATO summit um, and those following online. Um, I'd like to introduce the mayor of Madrid, uh, Jose Luis Martinez Almeida, who will um, give a few remarks. Thank you. And I should just also thank the mayor for his hospitality. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. First of all, 
uh, let me talk uh, personal desire. Enjoy Madrid, please. It's an outstanding city in terms of culture, leisure, gastronomy, shopping. And if you can't enjoy Madrid during those days, please come back soon. We are delighted to host you. These days, in these rooms, we have the most powerful, powerful leaders of the world making decisions about the future of mankind. And this conversation and the actions that I'm going to follow are going to settle whether our citizens will have the possibility to live in peace, and if they can't, how the rest of us are going to accompany them through achieving the most important aspect of victory, that is unquestionably freedom. But sometimes we tend to forget that mankind is not an abstract concept. When we talk about fellow citizens, it's the actual life of people what we are dealing with. Women that are leaders of their own companies, men who are raising a family, children who dream to become an astronaut, or a football player, or even a politician. People with names, with memories, with fears and dreams that are not only the sum of their nationalities or their circumstances, but most importantly, they are all individuals whose life must be our utmost and only concern. When you are a major, these concepts are learned by heart since day one holding office. Because that, because that is what we local politicians do. No matter if our constituency is just 50 people and one square kilometer, or there are three million citizens in town, as is the case of Madrid. That's why our next guest, Vitaly Kisko, has become a world leader, a hero, and an example not only to his fellow Ukrainians, but also to all the mayors in the world, particularly for myself, because we have been listening in the news for months how Russia could attack essential parts of Kiev, neighborhoods, hospitals, schools, how they could kill innocent people just because they were free and out to threat Russian tyranny. But through these months, Vitaly has not fought, held, or worried people in abstract. In this war, we know the names, the faces, and the tragedy of Ukrainians, because this leader had put the spotlight on the only thing that really matters. All the lives that are being ruined because of the war, and all the heroes that are emerging under these circumstances to show the world the honor and the dignity of an outstanding nation such as Ukraine. The Kiev City Council has been doing priceless work for months. On the one hand, supporting the weight of the protection and reconstruction of a city that despite the horror has never stopped seeing it signing. On the other, generating social awareness throughout the world, particularly in Europe, that we, not take, we, not, we cannot take freedom for granted because the lives of normal people with problems and normal dreams can change in the blink of an eye. And that example that they are offering to the world has the name of Vitaly Klitschko. The images among the rural in the middle of the street, hanging bereaved families, sending messages to the international community so that we fulfill our obligation to defend them have been spread around the world and have inspired generations of democrats who see in Vitaly the real fighter on the ground for the lives and safety of Ukrainian citizens who are fighting not only for their country, but also for all of us who live in freedom. Madrid is probably in the best moment of our recent history. We have never ranked like this in economic strength, quality of life, and sustainability. Today, we are one of the most important capitals of the world, as the celebration of this, of this NATO summit proves. But if we have reached this point, it's because we have never forgot one of our fundamental assets. I'm talking about solidarity. And this solidarity will always be within reach for Ukraine and Kyiv. That's today our commitment with these brave people, because in this war, we are all Ukrainians. Today, in this forum, I'm not only introducing a mayor, but a true hero, a leader to whom the people of Madrid are grateful for the work and example and the leadership that keeps us all hoping to know, to know that even in the darkest moment, 
Everything will end with Ukraine and Kyiv stronger than ever. With all of you, Vitaly Klitschko. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we have here with us uh, the Mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, and also Vladimir Klitschko, the Chairman of the Klitschko Foundation. And our guests, before we get into the conversation and the Q&A with the audience, have actually asked to show you a video. Some of those scenes are quite difficult to watch, I think, especially for those of us who have spent time in Ukraine in, in more peaceful times. Um, Mayor Klitschko, when I was in, in Kiev a month ago, one thing that uh, really struck me was that a lot of residents seemed really adamant about trying to go about their daily lives as much as they can, you know, still taking their kids to the playground, for example. Um, but over the past days, uh, we've seen that um, Kiev is not immune to violence. Um, do you believe that the capital is safe for civilians at the moment? First of all, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> um, great to be here in uh, NATO summit. Great to talk to the friends of Ukraine. I want to say from uh, Ukrainian citizens, thank you very much for everyone who support Ukraine. We need your help. Without your help, to be honest, we can't survive. Uh, it's uh, we stay front of one of the strong armies in the world and surprise whole world. We tough fighting against the Russians, and simple explanation why we surprise for everyone in the world, why we so good against one of the strongest army in the world. War. Everywhere the war is a kill the people, died people in the, during the war. And this war take thousands and thousands of people in Ukraine. We see right now, we saw right now in uh, images from, horrible images from Kyiv. In Kyiv just destroyed more than 300 buildings and <clears throat> Uh, more than 120 people died, but much worse the situation. Thanks God, we have international press in uh, our hometown. They immediately to, sh uh, to uh, show all the world what's going on, but we don't have international press in Mariupol. Whole city is destroyed. Kharkov, half of the city. Chernigov, and many, many other small cities. And uh, Thank you for, for your support. We need support, political support, economical, uh, humanitarian help, and also, what is very important, defensive weapon. We need defensive weapon. Defensive because we defend our country. We defend our cities. We defend our families and our children. And also, I hope everyone Every one of you 
have to understand. We defend values, the same values what we have. And we're defending you. And that's why we ask right now about defensive weapon, what we need so much. Why we successful? Simple explanation. In, uh, in the war, people died. Russian soldier paid good. Much more soldier from Russian side. Much more tanks, planes, rackets. Russians actually had lands in few days occupied Kyiv and in a couple of weeks occupied whole Ukraine. We destroyed, our soldiers destroyed these plans. Simple explanation. The Russian soldier fight for the money. The our soldier, very good motivated. I am as former fighter. I tell you small secrets. It's not important the size. It's not important how strong are you. Much more important will to win. Much more important the spirit. Russian soldier fighting for the money. Our soldier defending our families and our children and future our children. The question for every one of you, are you ready to die for the money? I'm more than sure everyone ready to give his lives for his family, for his children, for the future of children. It's simple explanation why Ukrainian soldier so successful against the strongest army in the world. But we need your help, and that's why we are right now together with Vladimir, coming from Kyiv <coughs> yesterday, and uh, participate in the uh, NATO summit and deliver very important messages to every one of you regarding our homeland, regarding Ukraine. Uh, Mayors, uh, Jose, if I can tell, thank you very much. We actually, a couple of uh, minutes ago, signed historical agreement that we make our cities capital of Ukraine and capital of Spain, sister city. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's historical document. We have to exchange a lot economically, politically, culturally, uh, tourism, so many directions to help to the others and this uh, important uh, period of time, critical period of time, important for Ukraine, thank you very much. And uh, I more than sure it's, we have huge future in our relationship. Self-government, uh, one second, self-government is very important. I am not just mayor of Kyiv, I am president of City Association of Ukraine, more than 1,000 communities in our association, one of the largest associations, and the biggest pressure and the target, the mayors. More than 30 mayors kidnapped. Just yesterday, mayor of Kherson was kidnapped. Nobody uh, no ways here. And uh, mayor of Gostomil, if fight was, uh, battles was close to Kyiv, bring the medication, the food for citizens, and was killed from Russian soldier. Actually, self-government is a target, target of uh, uh, aggressors, and uh, yes, of course, huge battles in Ukrainian cities. Mariupol, Kharkiv, Severodonetsk, uh, Chernigiv, Bucha, Gastomil, Irpen, I can tell about many, many other cities. And self-governance self -governance is, is a base of our country and uh, also still the target. And uh, it's very important to talk directly, mayor to mayor, city to city, and help the others. I very appreciate it. Thank you very much. Following up on uh, your point, your message to officials, and I, I see several senior officials here in the room uh, from, from NATO and Western allies. Do you feel from your conversations here in Madrid, 
that your message is being sufficiently heard. Um, do you feel that you're getting the kind of weapons and the quantity of weapons that Ukraine needs? Actually, uh, right now, the main message uh, in NATO summit, it's uh, not not main message, main tema, the war. One of the biggest war after the Second World War in the European continent. We don't know right now exactly numbers of uh, people who died, and thousands and thousands and thousands people. We don't know exactly uh, the numbers. The war is not finished and we have to do it everything what is possible to stop the war, to bring the uh, peace back to Europe is main priority for everyone. <clears throat> and uh, yes, of course, the main question right now, how we bring the peace, what we have to do, and Russians respect, respect just uh, the power. We have to be strong and we need modern defensive weapons. It's, uh, we stay right now and pay. Uh, we, we have not, not enough, I tell open uh, for that, not enough uh, artillery, not enough uh, weapons, and uh, we need much more support. And I hope the messages to a uh, particular person uh, I actually give and uh, still uh, uh, communication pretty well and everyone support Ukraine, but uh, we need right now, tomorrow, we pay huge price every day, the lives of our citizens. So you say you, you don't have enough now. Do you think the problem is logistical or is it political? Politically, uh, everybody uh, supports Ukraine. It's no question. Uh, I guess it's logistic. It's, uh, I guess, some, some bureaucracy. Uh, I don't know exactly. Uh, we, some declaration is there, but it's a uh, week, two weeks, three weeks, the weapon is not there. And I'm, uh, <clears throat> the, our soldier told to me, please, Vitaly, if you go there, Talk to decision maker. We need the weapons. Russians uh, have much more artillery, uh, much more tanks, much more rockets. We need modern anti-racket systems. Everyone, uh, I guess, uh, have received the horrible images from uh, a small city south of Kyiv. Um, Uh, uh, how the city, the rackets, uh, yeah, uh, it's not good. Kremenchuk, Kremenchuk, thank you. It's a Kremenchuk small city, south, 20, uh, 200 kilometers of south of uh, Kyiv. The shopping small was destroyed and uh, more than 20 people uh, uh, killed, uh, more than 40 missed and hundreds of injured. We need modern anti systems. Um, I'd like to uh, go over to uh, Vladimir because your foundation, the Klitschko Foundation, was originally founded to help kids, but as I understand it, you have now pivoted to um, help address the humanitarian situation um, in Ukraine, uh, which is maybe something that uh, we don't talk about enough. What is your message to the international community about the humanitarian aspect of Ukraine's troubles? Good day, Madrid. Good day, Mr. Mayor. It is great to be at this NATO conference, and there is a lot of issues. One of them is humanitarian, as you asked. During the war, Ukrainians been asking for a lot, and for a long time, 125 days the war has been going, and obviously, their struggle, struggle of people, refugees, people that still in the country under 
bombarding and if you just think about it, up to 3,000 rockets were launched and landed on the Ukrainian soil. Thousand children being killed, tortured, murdered, Ukrainian children. Thousands of children being removed by the Russian army to the filtration camps and spread out, and who knows where they are around Russia. So there is a lot of issues, and humanitarian help is one of them. With the Klitschko Foundation, for the past 18 years, we've been helping children, and all of a sudden, you ask yourself, how can we help it during the war? Because infrastructure is destroyed, you work with people. Ukraine is the largest European country. So you need to have other people to deliver some goods, find the issues, find the problem, find where the help is needed. And it's one challenge after the other, and it's very complex. But one thing that we recognized, we can not stop life. We cannot stop life, period. Even during the war. Even during the war, you're adapting to the environment, you're adapting your new kind of system, figuring out how you can help young mothers that just been giving birth to babies, and there are thousands of them, and they're in tremendous need as well. So you build with your allies simple issues, simple topics as baby foods that have been provided to um, young mothers, for instance. And uh, humanitarian side is extremely important, as well as weapons. But I'm not going to talk about the weapons on the humanitarian side. Without you, without allies, without understanding how important that topic is, and provision of the help and support is between life and death for us in Ukraine. And I will touch this extreme, extremely bothering picture um, that I saw this morning after rocket attack and um, in, in, um, um, in the city Krimchuk. south of Ukraine, in Kremenchuk, where a little girl been murdered uh, by the rocket, a six-year-old girl. And her sister and brothers are still alive. One of the parents got killed as well. And then you ask yourself, that child could be my child. Or child of my neighbors, or child of my relatives. How can I help and support? And I would say number one is definitely, during the war, weapons is the greatest support. We are at NATO conference. Weapons are extremely important in the war. And you're realizing it only in the wartime. And obviously, humanitarian side, continued supply of the goods, medicine, food, water, as, as in um, south of the country with spread up pandemic, or different viruses that are, are uh, affecting just living and existing. We can endlessly talk about it. And I just want to say that uh, with all the help that we, we received and we will continue, hopefully, get, and it's uh, going to be a very lasting process. And our endurance, on one side, our endurance, someone who is helping and supporting, and the endurance of the people who is receiving it and asking for the help, eventually we will defend Ukraine. We will defend peace in Ukraine and in Europe. Just please don't stop supporting us. I think we'll go to some questions from the audience. As a reminder to those of you uh, watching online, you can also submit questions uh, via the online platform. I think our first question in the room will come from Congressman Connolly. Thank you. Uh, if, if maybe you could go to the mic over there so everyone could hear you. Thank you so much, Congressman.
thank you. I'm not often accused of not being heard, with or without a mic. At any rate, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, I guess my question goes to, given what you're describing and given the horror we all watch on television every day that's unfolding in Ukraine, what is it you think Vladimir Putin is afraid of in Ukraine? Why the ferocity? Why the relentless brutality that he is unleashing in Ukraine? And to what extent do you really think it's about what you talked about, Mr. Mayor, self-government, that, that Ukrainians have put themselves on a path to a free society and that maybe he finds that very threatening? I'd love your views on that. It's very important to understand sense of this senseless war. Please, I need to tell that. Putin have idea to rebuild Soviet empire. They told that just a couple of weeks ago, they collected Russian uh, properties, uh, former Russian uh, in his opinion, uh, Russian empire, to rebuild Russian empire, to rebuild Soviet empire. Ukraine was as part of Soviet empire. Also, Poland, Baltic countries, Hungary, part of Germany, Czech Republic, Slovakia, part of Germany was also the part of Soviet empire. And this war beginning with just one goal, to rebuild, to make aggressive politics, to rebuild Soviet empire. And also Putin was surprised how tough Ukrainian soldier, uh, how good res uh, result we uh, Ukrainian deliver. And that's why they changed the commanders. So I guess right now the three or four times they change of commander uh, of uh, <clears throat> uh, military forces. And that's why they respect just power. We'll be, Ukraine will be powerful country. We, we Ukrainian will be strong. They respect just strong position. And unity, political unity, Economically unity, support of Ukraine, the unity around Ukraine, unity with Ukraine is a key for peace in Europe, key for peace in our homeland. But we have to fight for that. And everyone has to understand we fighting and defending not just our homeland. We defending every one of you. Because we don't know how far go Putin. They go so far as far we are allowed to go. And that's why support of Ukraine is the main priority, not just for our country, for everyone who have the same values as Ukraine, democratic values. Thank you for your question. I believe there's like two issues in that. First issue, you kind of uh, take, you're taking out the issues that you have in your country, in Russia. <clears throat> so you're pointing out that something that belongs to us, so to speak. Alaska, obviously, used to be Russian as well, and who knows how far the appetite is gonna go, just to mention. And then, so you're pointing out something on outside, and all the issues all of a sudden, that we all, stay tight and we fight the, the bad ones. And the bad ones is the West. And so on one side, on the other side, Putin or Russia in this case, Putin, Putin's Russia, they need Ukraine, absolutely. Because we're the gate geopolitically, we're the gate between the West and the East, but not Ukrainians. Ukraine, but not Ukrainians, because we think differently. We're very international, over 100, minority nations living, working in Ukraine for hundreds and hundreds of years. And 
the way we think that we're looking forward to live in freedom and making choice the way with whom we want to be associated and who, with whom not. Since 2014, we made this choice and we stand for it and we fight for it. And that's why I think these two issues are probably explaining why all of a sudden Ukraine became one of the big appetites of, of Russia, Putin's Russia. Do we have any further questions in the room? Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back, thank you. <clears throat> if you could introduce yourself, please. <clears throat> Good afternoon, and Gregory Mose, professor at the American College of the Mediterranean. One of the sad tendencies in modern warfare has been attacks on the cultural heritage of, of uh, target countries. I wonder if you could comment on the extent of destruction of cultural property in Kiev and, and in Ukraine in general. First of all, um, please, don't believe Russians, Russian propaganda. Actually, we both born in Soviet Union, sorry, in a communist family. Our father was a military general, Air Force general. He was, uh, we truly believe in uh, uh, the NATO and capitalism want to make slaps from us. And I remember as a child, small child, uh, Always I come from my house, I see big billboard, uh, not a soldier. Soldier with wolf head, with bloody hands, full with weapons. And always as a child I go out and I was, I was shocked. It was like uh, horror, horror uh, billboard and uh, I, I was afraid from, from beginning. And Russians told always liar. 1990, uh, 1994, the Russian Federation promising and make a guarantee if Ukraine has goodwill to give up our nuclear weapons, our territorial integrity and independence. They lied. They lied, uh, make a liar uh, if an action Krim, the green people with the green uniform without identification is not our soldier. Is it? It was Russian soldier. They told they not involved in a conflict in war in Donetsk, Lugansk, but everyone know where, without weapons delivering, financial support, propaganda. This uh, this war never happens. They told right now it's actually special operation because Ukrainians radicals, fascist, nationalist. They make a pressure in Russian. The Russians feel himself not so well in Ukraine, and that's why the Putin helped the Russian. I'm sorry, I am part of government, self-government. I'm in my body and body of my brother, half of the blood is Russian blood, because our mom is Russian. Our mom can't talk Ukrainian. And it's everything's liar. That's why, that why. We're talking right now about the weapons a lot. I want to uh, give uh, in preview stage, want to give a um, uh, question, but we have not, not so much time. The main weapons right now, the not the rockets, not the tanks, not artillery. The main weapons is media. And Russians zombed people. Can you imagine? Seventy percent of Russian population in Russia support this war against Ukraine because people is zombed, like in Soviet time. I remember that. Is that why it's very important to block the Russian resources and uh, they zombed people? It's uh, very very important to switch off the Russia today. By the way. TV channel have more, more budget than capital of Ukraine, just TV, one TV channel. And it's very important. The aggression against uh, culture. Uh, aggression is of all fronts. And uh, 
as my brother told, they need Ukraine, but don't need Ukrainian. Um, I just want to add, maybe, have you heard about uh, the winners rewrite the history? So let's not then win, because the history is going to be horrible. There's nothing healthy is coming out of uh, propaganda that is being spread for so long time. So let's not Russia win this war. And on that note, unfortunately, Thank the organizers you, told me we uh, absolutely must end this session, but um, there's a lot more we could discuss, and I'm sure you will be discussing with many of the officials in this room. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you for support of Ukraine. We win this war. Slava Ukraine. And we win this war. We're fighting and defending our country and everyone, everyone in Europe. We doesn't have another choice. And that's why the unity with Ukraine is the key for peace and freedom in whole Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Klitschko, for joining us. And now we will take a short break.
Greetings. If you could all take your seats, please. I think we're going to get started with this session on the transatlantic bond. I want to say to the Klitschkos, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, we're on your side, but I want you to know, I want you on our side too. Uh, I talked to Mayor Klitschko and I said, you know, your brother, you were both boxers, which one of you wins? And he says, well, he, he, we don't get in fights, but he's younger than me, so maybe he would now, I don't know. But in any case, thank you so much. Thank you for all you're doing uh, for the world. Uh, bless you. Um, They want Ukraine, but they don't want Ukrainians. Nothing could have been said better than that. So in the um, strategic concept, and it, it, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. This is about the transatlantic bond. The second item uh, in the new strategic concept reads, quote, the transatlantic bond between our nations is indispensable to our security. We are bound together by common values individual liberty, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, we remain fully committed to the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations North Atlantic Treaty. So that's what we're opening now is this session. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here. It's even more an honor and a pleasure because of the history that was made last evening. Uh, the MOU of Turkey, Finland, and Sweden, where Finland and Sweden got their path forward and Turkey's strategic interests were addressed. Um, uh, you've heard from an incredible lead, lineup of speakers the last two days. Uh, I'll just draw a couple of through lines before I pass uh, to a special uh, message from uh, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, Nancy Pelosi, and then straight from there to our panel. Um, th through line number one, uh, with Putin's war in Ukraine, we, we face what Christoph Hoiskin, my colleague at uh, the uh, Munich Security Conference called it Zeitenwende. Uh, we call it an inflection point at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Christoph, from the German perspective, said this is a moment as important as 1945, 1989. At the Atlantic Council, we think this is the fourth shot at shaping global order since uh, World War I. The first shot we got tragically wrong, League of Nations, Treaty of Versailles, uh, millions of dead, rise of fascism, uh, World War II. After uh, World War II, we got it more right than wrong. Liberal international order, the United Nations, European coal and steel community, NATO, the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, aberrational for the United States to build international institutions uh, at that time and then to stay the course in Europe as the United States did. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, there was a feeling that it might be the end of history. Even China seemed to be taking on uh, capitalist characteristics, and there was a hope uh, that that would lead to the rise of a middle class and uh, some change in, the, in, in how China would shape itself. We did get an enlargement of NATO. We did get an enlargement of the European Union, but now we are with uh, Putin's war in Ukraine at a fourth shot at shaping global order. And that's the context uh, for this summit. And it's also the context uh, for Putin's war in Russia. And that brings me to another through line. And that is a recognition that's one's hearing from all parties that Ukraine must win, from most parties that Putin must lose. But there's not a lot of consensus about what that means or how to get there. Um, and uh, even as we uh, have a G7 meeting in Bavaria and a NATO meeting in Madrid, missiles are landing on a shopping mall in uh, Kiev, uh, and hundreds continue to die every day. And that get, gives me to the next through line, which is we've talked a lot about the staying power of the West against economic headwinds now, 8% inflation in uh, Europe, uh, growing a possibility of recession. Uh, and with these economic headwinds, will our staying power uh, be as great as Putin's conviction in his war of attrition? So with that, it's my honor to kick off this session uh, on the transatlantic bond uh, by passing the virtual stage to the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Nancy Pelosi, and then we'll move on to our panel. 
As Speaker of the House of Representatives, it is my great privilege to bring greetings from the United States Congress to the NATO Public Forum. Thank you to Fred Kemp and the NATO Public Forum Consortium for bringing together so many leading policymakers and opinion shapers. This forum is an invaluable opportunity to not only celebrate but strengthen the transatlantic bond. NATO is a pillar of international peace and security in the world. It is a strong bulwark against the dark forces of autocracy. And it is a beacon of hope for freedom-loving people across the globe, particularly now as Putin wages his brutal war against Ukraine. Since day one, NATO has been an essential force in combating Putin's premeditated, unjustified, and inhumane war, coming together with outstanding strength, speed, and unity. The U.S. is proud to work with our NATO partners in this mission. Our commitment to Article 5 is ironclad, and we look forward to warmly welcoming Finland and Sweden into this alliance. Because it is our unity that gives us strength as we support the brave people of Ukraine, and it is our common values that guide us in upholding liberty wherever it is threatened. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not only an attack on their democracy, it is an attack on democracy everywhere. Such a vile act requires universal condemnation. As you address the Trans-Pacific Partnership today, it is also important to note that China has refused to speak out, instead questioning NATO's fundamental right to self-determination. This alarming challenge to national sovereignty must be met by a unified global commitment to peace and security from the Atlantic to the Pacific. As Secretary General Stoltenberg noted earlier this year, global challenges demand global solutions. As we move forward from this year's summit, let us continue strengthening cooperation with our Asia-Pacific partners to bolster cybersecurity, counter disinformation, and preserve our collective defense. When President Truman signed the NATO treaty, he spoke of a, quote, long step toward permanent peace in the whole world. Standing together, our alliance will never waver in defending that dream of permanent peace for all. Thank you and best wishes for a productive summit. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Frank Langford. I'm the London correspondent for National Public Radio from the United States. And I think Fred summed up the challenges uh, and, and the way this has all unfolded over the decades beautifully. And today we're going to talk in this session about how to keep up public commitment to NATO given rising inflation, recession. Uh, we, we've already had food shortages in the global south, lots of challenges. And we have a terrific panel today. Uh, we have two uh, senators from the United States, um, Senator Jean Shaheen uh, to the far left um, of me from New Hampshire, um, Tom Tillis of North Carolina. They're both co-chairs of the Senate NATO Observer Group, and they have just been in Finland and Sweden. And then uh, immediately to my left is um, Foreign Affairs Minister Rinkovich of the Republic of Latvia. And so um, I'd like to have a chat for a little while, and then we'd love to go to questions. And there are microphones for those who've just arrived in the back, and there's also a possibility to pose questions online. But I, I'd just like to start off with uh, the question um, as Fred posed it, and that is, given all of these challenges, and I'd like to start with uh, Senator Shaheen, how do NATO allies persuade the public to stay the course in the war in Ukraine and maintain, maintain sanctions against Russia? Well, as you and Fred both pointed out, this is a challenging time, and in my home state of New Hampshire, we have people who are paying higher gas prices, they're paying higher prices for their food at the grocery store, and they're sacrificing. And I think I have a responsibility as an elected official to talk about why this is worth the cost for Americans. And what I talk about is the fact that, as you've heard from so many of the speakers, that Courageous Ukrainians are giving life's blood to have their freedom. I mean, that's in the United States, we're a country that's founded on freedom and democracy. And we believe that's important for all people around the world who want to achieve it. And if we support the Ukrainians, then 
hopefully we won't have to send our soldiers to Ukraine um, because they will be successful. And so I try and make that point that this is, this is for democracies around the world. It's for the United States, but it's also for all of us who believe every human being should have the right for, to determine their own future, that countries should have the right to determine their own future, and that freedom should be part of that future if that's what people want. And I believe what we're seeing in Ukraine is true for people around the world. They overwhelmingly want their own freedom. They want to determine their own right to their futures. And so that's why we've got to continue to support this effort. Senator Tillis, what do you say to your constituents back in North Carolina when they're dealing with a lot of big domestic issues? We have midterms coming up in the United States. People are very focused on the United States and domestic politics. What do you say to them? Um, what I've said to them is that uh, our, our freedom, our economic security, our future is intrinsically linked to what happens in Ukraine. And they need to understand that Vladimir Putin is playing a chess game. He, he actually started his first move by thinking he was going to threaten uh, NATO, stress test NATO, and he failed. Now he's continuing to carry the fight, killing thousands of, of men, women, and children in Ukraine. And I explained to them that it doesn't stop there. It goes elsewhere. We were in the, in, in the West Balkans about two months ago. We hear the chatter and we hear the threat of Russia in that area. We hear it. He's trying to reestablish an empire, and it only starts with the success in Ukraine, and it continues. So yes, that constituent of mine in North Carolina, they may seem an ocean away, but they're not. And every time we turn our backs, we, in, we live to regret it. Let me ask one follow-up before I go to the, Minister Rinkovich, and that is, I was in Ukraine at the beginning of the war. And the interest in the United States was greater than I've seen it in almost any international story. You posted photos of people. I was in Odessa, and we were fleeing and uh, getting out of Odessa at the time. And you would post pictures. It would be tremendous interest. If you look at social media, it has plummeted in recent months. And so I'm just wondering, as senators, what do you do to continue to try to engage Americans and make them focus on this and the role of NATO? Well, we have to continue to remind them. I, I'm always reminded in North Carolina, um, our geography makes us vulnerable to hurricanes. And uh, when I go out to the coast after a hurricane and after devastation over there, the, the mines are glued to the TV set for about two weeks. <laughs> and then they think that, that, that the storm is over and things have gotten back to normal. We have people who have had hurricanes 20 years ago who are still struggling. So it's on us, on a bipartisan basis, to remind the American people the situation is every bit as threatening today as it was on February 24th. And we have to continue to have the resolve. The decision we made to provide additional support to Ukraine is important. And yes, we have to take care of economic challenges, but we also have to understand, if Russia succeeds in Ukraine, it puts us further away from settling the economy and getting back to where we were before inflation, supply chains, a number of other things that happened long before um, Russia invaded Ukraine. We've got to get back to that business, but this is, this is absolutely linked to us being able to restore order and restore economic security. Mr. Rinkovich, for a different point of view from Latvia, first of all, a very different history and geography than the United States, two questions. One is, what has support been like historically and most recently for NATO in, in your country? And also, is there a role that you and others in Europe can play to try to communicate to other countries in NATO, and particularly the United States, uh, the importance of why it's important to be protecting Latvia? Well, first of all, I would say that um, since the beginning of independence, the support for NATO in Latvia has been always very high because of our history, because of our experience with um, communists, Soviets, the Russians. And uh, I still remember that uh, 20 years ago, actually exactly 20 years ago uh, at Prague, during Prague summit, uh, seven countries, including Latvia, were invited to join NATO. At that point, we saw this is the end of the history. Now we are completely safe, secure, and we can live, you know, 
struggling about very um, different uh, boring problems. I was then State Secretary in the Ministry of Defense, and we thought that now we are going to have a very boring time. 20 years <laughs> later, I think that we have everything but boring time. Now, of course, with the Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine, the support uh, of NATO has again very high, but as I said, it has been always high. Also, the support to the European Union has been uh, considerably good. Uh, but now when it comes to uh, the second question, well, I think that uh, to some extent, uh, I've been traveling to the United States uh, in different capacities since the end of 1990s, meeting with different administrations, with uh, representatives in the House of Representatives and also with senators, and frankly, also talking with, with more general public, um, we have always heard and seen this kind of understanding that uh, you protect allies. There is a kind of uh, historic and, and moral also um, responsibility. But I do believe the point you just said is very important. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, uh, we live in a kind of uh, global and social media village. You cannot keep a lot of attention of the people because things change. Prices are increasing. You have to get your kids to the school. You start to calculate uh, how expensive that or another thing is. So what is important that uh, we engage uh, with all of our allies, especially uh, not only uh, in the region, because uh, there is no point preaching to Poles or, or uh, to Lithuanians, but uh, the farther we are from Ukraine, the farther we are from Russia, uh, the more basic things sometimes we need to explain about some things. But uh, I do believe that when I meet with uh, different officials, but also journalists and also uh, representatives of the public, that understanding actually is there. Terrific. Um, you were just talking about all the distractions. There are a lot of huge issues facing all of our countries. They're global issues. And I'm interested in knowing, first with the senators, in terms of big issues that are important to a domestic audience in the United States, I'm thinking about the role of China, I'm thinking about climate change. For Senator Shaheen, I was at COP26 in Glasgow eight months ago, and there was a lot of talk, certainly of activists keeping fuel in the ground. Boy, that is not the kind of conversation you hear right now publicly, and certainly from politicians because of what's, what's happening economically and in terms of energy. And I know uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg has talked about this a lot yesterday, but I wonder what kind of role do you see NATO playing in addressing climate change and its impact? And what kind of message would you give to younger people in the United States for whom this issue really resonates? To what degree could you connect that to the role of NATO? Well, we have a short-term challenge because of what's happening with the war in Ukraine in terms of oil and gas and making sure that the people who depend on oil and gas, the businesses, the countries, have the energy that they need. But boy, you don't need any stronger argument for why we need to get off of our dependence on fossil fuels, whether you believe in climate change or not. Look at the security challenge that's happening because Europe and parts of the United States and too much of the world is too dependent on Russian gas and oil. And if we can develop our alternative energy sector so that there are other choices, and, and for me, a big piece of that is also the demand side. How do we ensure that countries are more energy efficient? Um, because that will reduce the consumption in a way that's important. It, this is a security issue and much more than just an environmental issue. But as we know, it's also about whether we're gonna be able to continue to live on our planet. When we landed in Helsinki Sunday night, um, the temperature was actually hotter there than it was when we landed in Madrid last night. Now, it shouldn't be that way. We all know that. This, um, this is not the way climate should be operating. And so we've gotta think about, um, in the short term, we've gotta deal with the current crisis, but long term, we've got to address the longer term challenge that we're all facing because you know, it's not just about our weather changing, it's about um, what that means for our food supply, 
What does it mean for water? What does it mean for migration? What does it mean for conflict around the world? And all of that are affected by climate change. And boy, we better do something about it because time is running out. Senator Tills, I'd like to talk to you about another big issue that's here and globally, and that's, of course, China, one that's near and dear to your heart. And I want to read something from the strategic concept. The People's Republic of China's stated ambitions and coercive policies challenges our interests, security, and values. As, of course, everybody here knows, the first time we've seen the word China in the strategic concept. And I have a couple of questions for you. What role do you see European allies playing in addressing the challenge of China? And especially given the distance and limits of naval force projection, what do you think NATO can realistically and sort of in a concrete way bring to the table? Well, I think a part of it is the economic, recognizing the economic investment across the globe that China has made um, and coming up with a strategy to counter it. Um, we are aiding and abetting the ascendancy of China as the world economic and military power if we don't look at how they're using economic policy and investment as a strategic weapon. So we, uh, uh, and I'm glad to see China recognized as an emerging threat by our NATO partners and our allies. Um, what we need to do is have the same options on the table that China uses today. Their investments, I'll be traveling to um, uh, South America in August to talk about the investments that they're making in our hemisphere, in Africa, after that visit, or days after that visit, and to start educating the American people and I think our, our NATO allies on how those investments are a direct threat ultimately to NATO and the rest of the free world. And we have to be able to counter them. Uh, I think we also have to recognize that China's uh, silence and support for what's occur occurring in Ukraine um, is a, a message to the rest of the world about what could occur in the South China Sea. And so that, again, is just another, hopefully, a motivator to get the, the free nations, members of NATO and free nations around the world, like the AP4, who are here at the summit today, to recognize the global long-term threat that China represents. Can I ask you about the AP4? What kind of role do you see them playing? I mean, it's very interesting to have them here in Madrid. What kind of role do you think that they're going to play here and in the future for NATO? Well, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see as things evolve. Right now, when we get back to Washington, I think I, uh, Senator Shaheen and I agree, what we want to do is make history with respect to ratifying the treaty that will have Sweden and Finland be, be uh, members of, of NATO. Um, longer term, we have to take a look at what other alliances. One thing that China uh, clearly, uh, China's working on strategies to increase standoff distances and, and create military superiority. One thing that China doesn't have and they won't have are alliances. So we have to continue to strengthen those alliances, military alliances and economic relationships. Um, I, for one, think that the TPP and other agreements are critically important to integrate our, our, our free economies uh, as a weapon against China's investments across the world. Um, and then we'll have to see uh, what future alliances at, at a military level with, with countries we're already working closely with, um, uh, what role they will play in countering the military and economic threat of China. And I think that, they're, I think that they go hand in hand. Minister Rinkovich, first question is, how do you respond to that language in the strategic concept and what do you think it really means? And second is, how have attitudes in the Baltics and in your country um, changed over time regarding China? And as we look at sort of the approach that Lithuania has taken, uh, are there any lessons there? Well, first of all, the strategic concept is commonly agreed language. So this is now the position of of my country, and uh, we very much support this. Uh, let me say, uh, but we see actually what is very important when it uh, comes to addressing China uh, also through the alliance. I think that what China currently does, it very carefully monitors our response vis-a-vis -vis Russia and its war in Ukraine. If we are successful, and if Russia is defeated as uh, in the introductory remarks Fred Campbell just said, 
Of course, we still need to define what the victory or what the defeat means, what the victory for Ukraine's, the Ukrainians mean and the lot for Russians. But if they see that uh, the transatlantic unity is there, that we have a very strong partnership with uh, the nations in Asia and in the Pacific region, then most probably it is also going to ease some uh, pressures from um, the security situation also in that region. So that is critically important that we look at China not in an isolated way, but actually in a more uh, global way. Uh, second, uh, you know, I think that uh, there was a kind of period of uh, romanticism, a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, so-called uh, 16 plus one, then it was 17 plus one, now it's again 16 plus one initiative where there was a kind of high hopes for investments and, and trade relations. But what happened? A couple of years ago, uh, all the uh, investment proposals by China, for instance, in the port infrastructure, in uh, IT sector came with a lot of strings attached. And they were actually directly affecting already the security interests of the Baltic states. So that was the first flashing red line. Then of course, uh, all the 5G networks investments in, in IT, uh, and of course also human rights situation. Uh, the Hong Kong, all the protests in Hong Kong, uh, they very much actually resembled also what we had uh, 30 plus years ago, so-called Baltic uh, Freedom Way. And I think that now, especially after what happened uh, between Lithuania and China, uh, the people are very, very cautious. I would say that also this tacit support of China through votes in the United Nations Security Council, through all those announcements, uh, have actually changed both political and public attitude. And I do believe that uh, we still can uh, work um, uh, within NATO, but also when it comes to the EU-US cooperation on more uh, economic uh, sanctions sometimes if needed, human rights sanctions, and also we can work with Indo-Pacific partners. Uh, for instance, uh, Australia is sending equipment to Ukraine. Japan is introducing uh, almost the same sanctions vis-a-vis uh, -vis G7 as we are introducing. So I think that this is already creating a platform where we can also work uh, to some specifics also how to address some of the China's aggressive behavior. So um, there is a change, and that change actually happened uh, in the last five, six years. Can, can I add to that sure. as well? Because you ask about Lithuania, and I know the minister knows very um, mm -hmm. clearly the challenges that the Baltic nations have faced. But when a, a small country like Lithuania is willing to stand up um, and say, this is, um, you know, this is not right, what China is doing. And it's important for us in the United States and for Europe to back up um, Lithuania, to back up small countries when they're willing to stand up for the values that, the transatlantic values that we all support. Thank you. I have a kind of a cultural question. I can remember just two or three years ago speaking with a a member of the British Parliament, and he was talking about the future of the transatlantic relationship and, and the relationship between say, the United Kingdom and the United States. And that obviously the roots of the United States are in Europe and particularly in the UK, but it is an increasingly diverse and polarized country. And other you know, a lot of people in the United States might look more to the South, to South Latin America or to the East, to China and Asia. And he, he raised the question of, how do you keep up this alliance that had, is founded in some cultural connection as the United States becomes increasingly diverse? And I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about that, because I thought it, he made a good point. Well, he does make a good point, but the United States is diverse, and we have people who, I mean, my family really migrated to the United States before the revolution from um, someplace, and what is now the United Kingdom. We're not sure exactly where. But you know, we also have a lot of Americans who migrated to the country from Latin America, from Central America, who came from Africa. In my home state of New Hampshire, we're not as diverse as North Carolina, but we have a lot of people from all over the world. And they have an interest in um, 
the Transatlantic Alliance because of the security relationship we have with NATO and why that's important to us. They have an interest because of the economic relationship. And they also have an interest in seeing how we can all work together. And I don't think it's a zero-sum game. It's not if you support the Transatlantic Alliance, then you can't support relationships with other parts of the world. And more and more, we have to recognize, as NATO is doing in this strategic concept, that the relationships are interconnected. That's why we've got to pay attention, because China's a threat, why it's important to have um, Indo-Pacific countries here, and why we've got to look at the potential for economic and cyber and other threats to affect our future security. Thank you. So we have a, a question online. We'd also like to go to any questions uh, in the back. Uh, there, there are, I believe, microphones in the back, so if people want to uh, stand up here. But I'll, I'll ask one question online that we've got here. Between the 1997 NATO-Russia Act and today, what has gone wrong? Is there more NATO can do to encourage productive relations with Russia? I know in some ways this is probably a very unpopular question, uh, but I, I wonder, looking back historically, what, what, it, what people think. Minister. Well, okay. <laughs> you, you have the closest relationship. Yeah. <laughs> when, whenever it's Russia, then everything goes <laughs> away. But, uh, but, uh, but look, everything went wrong. But it was not NATO's fault. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, I'm, from time to time, even now, after uh, Russia's invasion in Georgia in 2008, then 2014 occupation of Crimea, and now since 21st of February, I very often hear this argument, look, NATO expansion, I prefer to speak about enlargement, not expansion, because countries were willingly joining NATO, not kind of somebody was mm -hmm. coming in and expanding, uh, that this provoked Russia to the, con to, to the current uh, aggressive behavior. Actually, knowing Russia very well, the whole neighborhood wanted to join NATO as quickly as possible. The first wave was 1999. 2004, uh, then we had uh, some smaller kind of additions, and now you see that countries that we were long hoping, we were kind of praying that at one point they will join, like Finland and Sweden, and they said, no, well, it's, it's fine, we can, we can wait a little bit. Now they are also joining, because that aggressive uh, kind of foreign policy, bullying of its neighbors, uh, actually uh, pushed all the countries to apply for NATO's membership. I don't want to speculate what would happen if, let's say, in Bucharest there was, they, they were a different language, uh, they were a bit different uh, situation, but I would say that uh, I do believe that Russia still does not dare to attack any of NATO members. And again, Ukrainian is to some extent litmus test. But I do believe that uh, this kind of ingrained uh, feeling that they need to restore either Soviet or Tsarist Empire. You, you hear different versions. Was all the time here. Uh, since the very beginning of 1990s, there were kind of frozen conflicts created and so on. So that's, that's where we are. And when it comes uh, what we could have done differently, uh, I don't believe that uh, we really had major mistakes because there was one huge issue. When President Putin decided that democracy is not something that he wants to pursue, and he started to push for an authoritarian rule, then actually uh, our, our efforts were doomed. I don't want to go down a historical rabbit hole, but I, I do want to ask if you think in the post-Cold War period, could the West have done more to take into account Russia's security concerns? Because uh, some people in Europe talk about that. Uh, the, the interesting question is then, what are those uh, legitimate security concerns? Uh, for instance, uh, what we have seen, and I think that many countries in my region have seen that uh, Russia was trying to impose its kind of way of living. More corruption, more control of, of resources, controlling political parties, and that is not something that you want uh, in a democratic society. Uh, if there would be the kind of uh, non-enlargement of NATO, would that let's say, at this current situation, uh, save this kind of military invasion? No, I do believe that at some point, 
uh, Russians would decide that they now want to recreate some kind of uh, Russian Federation plus or, or empire, and they would push those countries, including they would try my own country, to, to join some kind of uh, uh, greater Russia in that or another way. So that was why back in 1993, 1994, there was a very conscious decision in the Baltics to push as much as we can to knock on the all doors in United States, in Canada, in all the European capitals, trying to explain uh, our, our concerns. And actually, as many colleagues are saying, to some extent we were right, but we were I would wish we were wrong. Thank you. Questions from the floor, please. And please introduce yourself if you don't mind and direct the question where you would wish. Hi, my name is Sierra Kodiquit. I'm here on behalf of the NATO Youth Protect the Future campaign from the United States. And I wanna thank the organizers. This has been incredible as a young woman to be engaged on these very important topics. Um, I sincerely appreciate NATO's conversation and leadership on women, peace, security, and climate change. We know that empowering women, educating, and providing safe health care to women leads to a more peaceful world. The United States Supreme Court has just overturned our constitutional right to access legal and safe abortions. Senator Tillis, you've been quoted saying this is both historic and monumental. If you could please expand on how you feel this is historic and monumental, as well as how you think this kind of leadership and sentiment towards women's rights from the United States resi resonates with the rest of the NATO alliance. Thank you. Well, uh, first off, the, the Supreme Court decision doesn't change a single law in the United States. It leads it to the states to decide, and states like North Carolina, where uh, it may differ from what the citizens of Nebraska, or not Nebraska, Nebraska, New Hampshire, I'm, I'm thinking about some of the members that, that are in this delegation. It's gonna be a discussion that's gonna have to be had, held with governors and state legislatures. Um, the, the issue that the Supreme Court settled is whether or not it was a constitutional right or something that was a legal decision, a legislative decision that the states can make. And we'll see how that plays out over time. Another question related to the American domestic political uh, situation. We have online from uh, Shanna Horrigan. She says, President Trump has, had previously discussed withdrawing from NATO. What is your message to the transatlantic community about the US commitment to NATO after the 2024 presidential election? Well, I think it, it's interesting when uh, Senator Shaheen and I went to the uh, NATO summit in Brussels, um, I believe that President Trump, I believe when we were flying over, made the statement that we should withdraw from NATO. Uh, and we came to this forum in Brussels and we said, we're a nation with three uh, equal branches and the US Congress fully supports NATO and will continue to support NATO. Just take a look at what happened in less than 36 hours. We met in the Swedish embassy with the ambassador and the uh, minister of defense. And we were talking about what we could do to be helpful to expand NATO, uh, to have them uh, be a part of it. They said we would, we would like to see what the uh, American Congress's uh, position is on it. In 36 hours, we had 81 senators sign on to a letter. And quite honestly, if we hadn't want to get the letter out in the communication sooner, we'd have probably had 98. That's a very clear indication that the Article I branch, the Congress, is solidly behind this historic and transformational alliance, the greatest alliance that's ever existed, and one that needs to be maintained. And I, for one, think that uh, there's some discussion about whether or not any future change in the Article II branch should be even, la even legally able to contemplate the idea that they could withdraw from NATO. And I think that's a discussion that we'll have in Congress and potentially find ways to have Congress be actively involved in any future administration that would even contemplate that. This is an important alliance. It's an alliance that needs to exist for centuries, in my opinion, and continue to expand. And, and we actually have a bill right now in the Senate that would require congressional approval or Senate approval to withdraw from NATO. Right now, the Senate needs to ratify treaties. Well, this would say, not all treaties actually, um, with respect to this legislation, but just NATO, because we think it's so important to make that kind of strong 
bipartisan statement about the significance of NATO. Do we have any other questions from the floor? Not seeing anyone at the moment. Oh, please, and please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Corey Flesser. I am uh, one of the NATO 2030 Young Leaders and the U.S. Representative. Um, and this is a follow-up question um, related to the one earlier on the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Um, Senator Shaheen, you are a staunch supporter of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. And in light of the overturning of Roe v. Wade last week, many colleagues have come up to me and asked, so, you know, can the U.S. act credibly w within NATO to advance gender equality when we have this domestic policy challenge going on? Um, from your perspective, ma'am, how, how would you reassure our allies that we can still advance this important agenda item within um, our support to the alliance? Thank you. Look, I'm pro-choice. I don't support the Supreme Court's decision on Roe, and uh, I think that's a debate that will be an ongoing debate in the United States, in my state of New Hampshire, as well as across the country. But I think what is important as we think about our foreign policy and look at NATO is what, what is the role of women in our societies? What is the role of women as we think about security issues, as we think about economic issues? And, you know, we, several years ago, a couple, dec more than a decade ago, the United States opened an Office of Global Women's Issues to look at foreign policy through a gender lens. And we did that because what we know, if we look at the data, is how important it is to empower women around the world. To, um, we know that women contribute more to their families, generally. If we look at women in um, developing countries, they contribute more to their communities. And those countries that empower women are more, are more stable. So there are lots of good reasons why empowering women is important, particularly in the security realm. The United States was the first country in the world to legislatively pass um, a proposal that said women need to be part of the debate when we're in conflict areas, when we're looking at how we address security issues. And we passed this in 2017, and during the previous administration, we were able to get an, an outline that is now being followed in our Department of Defense and Department of State and in our foreign policy. Now, there's a lot more we've got to do, um, and we need to work with other like-minded nations. Uh, I was really excited when we were in Sweden to hear them talk about um, their gender-focused foreign policy, and I think that's something that they bring to NATO that's really going to be exciting. Um, but this is something that makes sense for all of us, and it's important for NATO to look at ways in which they can better engage women um, across the NATO countries and looking at how we continue to promote stability around the world. Minister Rinkovich, we have a, a question online for you. From the perspective of an eastern flank ally, what does the recent deployment of Canadian troops to Latvia mean for, to you as evidence of NATO's transatlantic bond? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, actually. Uh, since 2017, we keep reminding everyone that transatlantic bond includes both United States and Canada. And Canada has been a really great ally, and they have been providing a lot of uh, help. And uh, I think that as we speak, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and then President Levitz are witnessing also the signing of the declaration on uh, how to implement the, uh, the decisions uh, of, of NATO summit and how to bolster Group. So what it means, first of all, it means that uh, NATO is serious about its commitment. Second, um, we have, uh, I think, created uh, extremely good multinational working environment. I think we currently have, what, about 10 nations as part of Canadian-led uh, uh, multinational group. Uh, believe me, it was not very easy for uh, for a start, to create this kind of uh, multinational environment, but actually uh, now it works well. Uh, we now want to expand gradually from battalion size to, uh, first of all, brigade size elements like command and control, logistics, uh, enablers, and so on, and then hopefully also uh, to, to, to go further than that. 
So from that point of view, uh, this really provides real security, but also a sense of security. And the most important thing why we really love Canadians is that both Latvians and Canadians are great fans of the ice hockey. So whenever, <laughs> whenever we have uh, ice hockey championships, then um, you know that unites us even more. The trouble is when we play each against other, then, then it's a bit <laughs> problematic. We're almost out of time here, but uh, just a follow up on that. President Biden today talked about uh, forced posture for the United States and he talked about uh, destroyers here in Spain. He also uh, talked about a number of other things. Uh, obviously, he talked about head uh, co headquartering people in Poland. And there was nothing for the Baltic states from him. And I'm just wondering. Not true. No? Not true. Well, then please correct me. And just give me a sense, though, of what you've heard, uh, your reaction to what you heard from President Biden I today, and also what you're looking for from other NATO allies uh, going forward. Well, both I, I heard President Biden when he was addressing uh, leaders, and also reread the, the statement in uh, on the on the webpage of the White House. We are talking about uh, more robust uh, rotational presence of the U.S. troops, land, sea, air, uh, more exercises. That's true. Uh, but look, uh, we do believe, frankly, that nothing ends with the decisions here in Madrid. It's only beginning of transformation. I do believe that we will need to look how well we are proceeding within a year. Next summit is actually in our neighborhood, in Vilnius in Lithuania. So, uh, and then I think we will uh, see where we need still to cover some deficit. So, we are grateful to the United States already for all the help. Congress providing money, uh, administration and Department of Defense providing troops, but we also believe that uh, this is actually beginning and that we will need to uh, see where we need to address some of the deficiencies. From other nations, look, in the first hours of 21st of February, many of our uh, allies already sent reinforcements, Canadians, Danes, Spain, uh, and we are grateful and we will continue to, to work with them. So in general, yes, you always want to, be, to have more immediately because the public is a bit uh, nervous. But then you understand all the practical things and overall I think that we are on the right track. We need to implement what has been decided and then to look for the future. Thank you so much. Uh, we're out of time. We could talk about this for a long time, but to Senators Shaheen Tillis and Foreign Minister Rinkovic, thank you so much and thanks for the great questions.
it's not, it's not ample. Okay, here we go. If you, it could, uh, if you could take your seats, we're going to, we're going to get started. We're going to get started. <coughs> take your seats. Uh, that was just a terrific panel. We're continuing the discussion here of the transatlantic bond and NATO's role in a challenging world. I'd like to welcome uh, Minister De Mayo, Hello. Minister Colonna, Good morning. Minister Linda. Good morning. What an all-star panel. It's great to have you all here. Um, I'm going to just kick the conversation off. Uh, and I don't think it would be at all right if we didn't start the conversation with the foreign minister of Sweden. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes. Good morning. Um, so Foreign Minister Linda and I had a, a longer conversation in the beginning of February, and I don't think either one of us would have predicted where we were right now. Uh, in fact, you know, 200 years of history doesn't change overnight, but it seemingly has. So I wonder whether you could start us by giving us a feeling of what happened from that early time in February when we met at the Munich Security Conference, obviously the war, uh, but what happened inside Sweden? What, how did the domestic uh, discourse change? Uh, and then uh, what do you think this decision, you know, you've always been, I've been operating in Washington for a while leading the Atlantic Council. The transatlantic bond with Sweden's always been tight, but this is different. How, what does this change for Sweden? Well, let me start already in December, because in December, we as chair of the OSE had a ministerial in Stockholm and we were more or less uh, shocked by what the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov said there, that we don't believe anymore in the European security order, and uh, we need you to take uh, uh, responsibility for our security. And they more or less said clearly, we want to have spheres of interest, and uh, not anymore let countries decide for themselves. Then became, this became worse. And we got a letter, all the foreign ministers, saying that uh, we want you to guarantee that you will not expand NATO and that uh, our security is uh, taken care of. That meant for Sweden and Finland that we should not anymore be able to choose our own security. That rang uh, alarm bells in, in us. Then it came to Munich, where you and I had discussion, and. Uh, uh, by that time, we still really didn't believe that the Russia would be so aggressive and go in full-scale invasion. Uh, and uh, even Zelensky and my dear friend Kuleba, they said, please don't have this war rhetoric because our economy is, uh, is really doing badly um, of that. And that was like four, five, six days before the invasion. Then the full invasion came. And it was a military non-aligned, sovereign, democratic country that was just run over by Russia. And in the way they did it, I mean, it was with war crimes from the very beginning, uh, targeting civilians. We saw pictures of uh, maternity um, uh, hospitals, uh, children. Uh, I was uh, many times in Ukraine and uh, three times on the contact line just uh, before. I was walking the streets of Mariupol with this wonderful theater with a red roof. And then I learned that there were 600 people killed because the Russians sent a missile onto that red roof and killed 600 people. That shocked the Swedish people, really. And it shocked the Finnish people, who has a 1,340 kilometers direct border to, to Russia. And we started to say, are we safe? After 200 years, where we have tried to take tension down, not to have any in the puzzle, you know, military buildups. Uh, and then we came to the conclusion after discussion with all the parliamentary partners, so, no, we, don't are, we are not safe anymore. We need security guarantees because Russia has become totally unpredictable and they have warfare that is really dangerous. It was a very, very difficult thing to get into our heads because we have really, really believed that our military non-alignment has been 
very, very good for our security, and the same for Finland. Then when we came to that uh, conclusion, uh, we also saw that we have 85% of the members of parliament agreeing and 60% uh, of the uh, population uh, agreeing. And that is how it looks now. Then uh, we thought, after having spoken and having many meetings, that it would be rather quick. Now it was not that quick. One uh, uh, country, Turkey, had security concerns, so we had to take that very seriously. Uh, we have had many, many uh, negotiation rounds uh, with Turkey, and yesterday, finally, after four and a half hours tough negotiations, we came to a memorandum of understanding and now I hope that uh, it will be possible for us to, uh, to join NATO as full members. So uh, uh, there are a lot of people who are very interested in those four and a half hours. <laughs> uh, and, and we know you can't tell us everything about it, but can you give us a bit of the feeling of, of the atmospherics? Uh, because it's not normal to have a four and a half hour meeting on one issue at a NATO summit like this. So obviously, there must have been some uh, uh, feeling of history in the room, but give us uh, uh, your, your uh, I, I, I can't read, your, your Finnish colleague said earlier that you sweat through the drama or something. In any case, give us, give us a feeling of the atmospherics uh, uh, yesterday. No, we had the three leaders, two presidents and the prime minister, <laughs> and uh, the three foreign ministers, and we had the secretary general who was uh, extremely helpful, and we have some very, very difficult questions. But the atmosphere was uh, respectful of each other, uh, trying to get uh, a text that we could all agree upon. Uh, and uh, that is, of course, difficult. But I think because uh, all the three countries came with good intention to solve this, uh, with constructive discussions, uh, even if it's tough, uh, not everybody loves the text, of course. But we think it's, uh, uh, it's appropriate uh, text that we have and that we can live with. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to turn to the, uh, your Italian colleague, your French colleague, and maybe the first question will focus on this. Uh, there have been different stages of uh, NATO uh, enlargement. Uh, uh, there have been times when people think uh, the al uh, alliance is getting overextended uh, other times when people want it to extend even further and faster, and there's always been a debate here. How would uh, uh, France, sorry, how would Finland and Sweden coming into the alliance change the alliance for you as an Italian, for you as a French leader, please? I think that uh, the alliance will be stronger thanks to this new member state. And it's very important for me to tell to Han congratulations, because uh, we know very well what happened during the last months. And I uh, have to tell, have to say at the same time that Sweden and Finland participated to a lot of meetings in our past, in the past of uh, the NATO alliance, because we're uh, reliable partners of NATO, and uh, we faced together a lot of challenges during the last years. For example, we had a very important meeting one year and a half ago about the climate change and the effects of the climate change on the security in the northern Europe. But I think that uh, it's clear that Putin started this aggression against Ukraine in order to avoid more NATO borders at Russian borders, and the result is that two new countries are joining NATO, and uh, this is an effect of the decision of Putin against Ukraine. I think that we have to continue to be, to stay together, to work together, even with other... And uh, uh, the Russians who had, and they had 7% of Ukrainian territory before the war began, they now have 20%, uh, and uh, we have a strategic concept today, Putin's strategic concept, is a, a bit simpler, uh, and it seems to be hitting civilian targets, flattening certain areas, and creating certain facts on the ground, and perhaps liberating the, the rubble. Uh, is NATO doing enough? Are we doing enough 
if Ukraine is this decisive, and you can tell me whether you agree with this, with Nancy Pelosi is this decisive of an issue? Uh, the, the words of uh, Nancy Pelosi are really important because testify the common values that we have to defend. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not only an alliance in order to defend ourselves militarily, but we have to defend our values every day. And I think, and I fully agree with Catherine about uh, the complementarity of these domestic issues. We have to avoid to give argument to give arguments to the Russian propaganda. When we are speaking about the internal unity and the domestic unity of the countries, like the NATO countries, it's very important because when there are some political parties, associations, uh, uh, representatives of institutions that are giving to the Russian propaganda the opportunity to use some sentences, some statements, in order to explain to all the world that there are, even in the Western community, in the NATO community, there are people that are against Ukraine or against Zelensky, yeah. we are producing an impact on the consensus that Putin has, which Putin has in Russia, because he is using this propaganda in order to support and fuel the consensus for himself and in order to justify the, in a way, the war that is moving against Ukraine. Thank and this is very important in order to defend our common values and to defend our posture as countries, our democracies, as free world. Thank you. Minister Linda, the same question, are we doing enough? And if we're not, be as specific as you can. Uh, is it longer range weapons we need to do? Is it S-300s, is it MiGs? I, I agree with everything you're else saying, but will any of it make enough difference if we're not giving Ukraine more, more capability to stop uh, uh, the killing from the air? Well, I think it has been a um, uh, rather um, enormous effort from uh, both uh, Europe but also other countries, especially, of course, from uh, United States, UK and Canada as well, to give weapons to Ukraine. But of course, we need to have endurance in this. We need to continue. And you can see already how difficult it was to get the sixth sanction package through in the EU. We managed. But we need to go further. We need to have a seventh uh, sanction package. We need to target gas. Um, we managed first coal, then oil, and now we need gas. Uh, but that is difficult because it's also hitting um, people in, in the countries that are depending on, on gas. And then you need to have uh, you know, alternatives, uh, of, like any, any um, uh, responsible government needs to also take into account to get uh, the support of the people of, uh, for continuing. Uh, I think that also that you can already see that in the media, a little bit is going down. First, mm -hmm. it was like shock. It was every day new things. Um, now, the media attention has gone down a little bit. That is also affecting the public. And the public is affecting the politicians. So it's, it's really, really our um, responsibility to keep Ukraine and what Russia is doing high up on the agenda. Uh, as much as we can and use all, all kinds of forums, social media, trying to get it into interviews, trying to speak about it all the time, because we have seen this so many times, uh, that you have a catastrophe, you have a war, and then it just continue, but it slides away. And, uh, and uh, I, I think that we should also uh, be aware that Russia is not only um, uh, um, a threat when it comes to NATO's eastern flank, but it's, it's also for the southern flank uh, because of how they are now having uh, uh, actions in uh, Mali with, uh, for example, the Wagner Group. They have uh, Mali now kicked out the European troops and get in Russian troops or... Um, groups like mercenaries, like, like Wagner Group, mm -hmm. in Central African Republic, in Libya. All of this creates instability in NATO's southern flank. So we need to keep um, you know, our attention not only to what's happened there, but what's happened also uh, in the south. 
and that is uh, eroding our international security. And, and here we need, of course, to embrace the NATO's 360 um, degree approach. Uh, and uh, we hope that we can contribute to that by bringing a lot of new capabilities uh, and uh, our military um, forces also uh, in uh, cooperation with the rest of NATO. That's an excellent answer. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to ask one question for the three of you. Turn to the audience. I'm going to keep an eye open to see how much time we have. Um, but um, uh, Frank and the excellent previous panel, uh, my colleague from NPR, uh, underscored uh, the strategic concept reference to China. Um, and, uh, and this is new. And this gets to the transatlantic bond and whether it can be applied to the Indo-Pacific even at, at a time we're looking at Russia. He read the first part of the item. I'll read the last part. It says, China strives to subvert the rules-based international order, including in the space, cyber, and maritime domains. The deepening strategic partnership between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation and their mutually reinforcing attempts to undercut the rules-based international order run counter to our values and interests. When you, when you consider how many members there are of NATO, that's very strong language. Uh, um, you know, what does this actually obligate the NATO to do? And was everyone on the same page? Because people have vastly different economic interests uh, in China. And certainly China has not launched a war in Ukraine, even though it certainly hasn't acted against it. So maybe, uh, Minister Colonna, we can start with you and then, then have all three of you answer that as briefly as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be as short as I can on a touchy issue. The, the discussions have been long and quite complex, but the result is reflecting the nature of our common ground. China is a competitor. It can be also challenging the you know, rules-based order, maybe thinking about replacing it with its own. Um, then we have to be careful to address these issues, China being more and more assertive, not only in the Pacific, by the way, and you mentioned a few other issues. The, glo the global south, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, we, nevertheless, have to be attentive not to play um, that narrative that some would like to see brought on the front page of block against block. It's not, you know, the west against the east. We're just addressing a few challenges. We are partners in other areas, and namely for China, you know, climate change would be one of the areas of cooperation. There are others. So we have to answer in a diversified way to a series of multiple and very complex challenges. We try to do that, and I think the document does reflect the proper balance between what we have to address as an alliance, which is not China per se, but China in the respect where it could be challenging the Euro-Atlantic community, which is part of our job today. The rest is open to uh, different groups, different cooperation. Sometimes it could be EU, sometimes it could be you know, Pacific organizations. It's a multiple, um, multiple layer, I would say, set of relations. But the result is a good result. We are not simplistic. We are um, open to dialogue, and we are quite honest in the challenges we're facing as an alliance. Thank you, Mr. DeMaio. A few words about technologies, because I think that we have to invest more attention and to keep our attention on the technologies, because uh, technology is neutral. Uh, artificial intelligence is neutral, but there are some countries in the world that are using artificial intelligence in order to reduce the human rights. In the past, they uh, needed uh, huge organizations on the military side, on the police side. Now they can instruct an artificial intelligence in order to reduce the human rights in some areas of the world. So as NATO, as allies, but even as European member states, we have to introduce new policies and new, a new attention about this kind of issue because it's crucial. There are artificial intelligences that are learning how to reduce the human rights for some areas of the world or some areas of the countries. And I think, I think that the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, path that we are 
creating with, between NATO and some partners, it's very important in order to reduce the effect of some technologies in countries that are looking to the free world. Uh, thank you for that. And, and to quote the uh, strategic concept, underscoring what you just said, Mr. Minister, the PRC seeks to control key technological and industrial sectors, critical infrastructure and strategic materials and supply chains, uses its economic leverage to create strategic dependencies and enhance its influence. <laughs> By the way, my compliments to anyone from NATO in the room. Some of you know I was at the Wall Street Journal for 25 years. I'm a recovering journalist. It's really terse. It's sharply written. It's well argued. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this will, uh, this will stand up to scrutiny. Uh, on China, Sweden has not gotten a totally uncomplicated relationship with China. Uh, how do you view this? You're not yet in NATO, but how do you view uh, this, uh, this statement on uh, China in, in the strategic concept? Uh, well, I, I think, it's, uh, as you said, it's, it's uh, uh, very important we have it. We can see now that uh, China stands against the NATO expansion, that China has uh, supported uh, Russian security interests. Uh, that shows the tension has, has growing, is growing. The, the very, very uh, tough rhetoric on anything that has to do with uh, Taiwan, the issue of, uh, um, like Luigi say, about uh, uh, the technology. We just had a case in, uh, in our courts about the 5G and the Huawei, which I think many countries are having these uh, discussions. And uh, uh, the Chinese-run company is uh, using all the means in the judiciary system to get into also a very delicate uh, infrastructure. Uh, and here, I think, from the EU side, we woke up a little late when it comes to investment uh, screening and having also a security uh, perspective on um, uh, investment and infrastructure, because we need uh, Chinese uh, trade and Chinese investment but we, we need also not to be naive to let uh, Chinese interest into things that are uh, um, for, for, uh, sensitive for the, for the security. Uh, we also need not to, to have a, you know, an, a, how, too adverse stance against China because we need to solve some global problems together with China like climate, for example, which is uh, one of the main uh, issues, of course. So it's uh, like Catherine said, you, you have to, to have uh, you know, both challenges and, and, uh, uh, and, and also opportunities in the relation to China. We have to, to deal with that. But it's not easy. And I think there has been a shift mm -hmm. the last years in how we see the relation with China. Thank you for that. So I'm going to watch both of the microphones to see if anyone's going up to them for a question. And I'll ask another question while I'm watching. Do I see the, the oh, there we go. Please go over and ask your question. I'm looking to, Senator Kuhn sounds like, looks like he may want to ask something. No, okay. But <laughs> great to have you here, sir. Yeah, thank Please. You. Thank you very much. And if you could identify yourself and to whom you'd like to pose a question. Yes, uh, my name is Velizar Shoamano from Bulgaria. First, uh, I want to express my gratitude uh, to Minister Di Maio for leadership of Italy uh, for the battle group in Bulgaria. So my question is, uh, we are focusing uh, very much uh, on, on Baltic Sea and congratulations for Sweden and Finland. But the challenge in the Black Sea is much bigger. We have uh, France taking lead in Romania, Italy, in Bulgaria, but we have these uh, limitations of uh, Montreal uh, for uh, ships in, in Black Sea. So how do you see addressing uh, this, uh, this balance? Because for forward presence, it was enhanced forward presence, quite different from tailored forward presence. Now with forward defense we are discussing, uh, do you see any opportunity to balance between north and south when it comes to forward Deployment. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to add to your Black Sea question. Is it not time for us to break the blockade and get the food? Out? I mean, uh, Turkey will take out the landmines. We can do a convoy. Russia has no right to blockade this open seawater, and it's leading to starvation and hunger across the world. Is it? Should that be not also something we do in the Black Sea? Can I? Yeah, please. Yes, uh, I think that is very important that. And before mentioned the 360-degree approach 
because she comes from, a, a, she represents a, a northern country, but at the same time, it's very, it, it testifies how it's important to have an approach about the core tasks of NATO and uh, the, even the southern flank and the southern east flank of uh, our alliance in order to ensure our security. Obviously, NATO is a defensive alliance, but it's clear that in the Black Sea, we have to push on uh, the mediation of UN in order to remove the blockade about wheat. And at the same time, we have de to increase all our tools in order to guarantee uh, in a useful way the security of our allies in the region. So if we need to improve and to implement more the, uh, our systems of security in the region, on the defensive side, we will do. Thank, thank you for that, please. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alessandro Marrone. I'm the head of defense program at the International Affairs Institute, Istituto Affari Internazionali Rome. <laughs> so thanks to the uh, three ministers for the speech. I have a question for Minister Di Maio and Minister Colonna. How do you see cooperation between Italy and France uh, uh, for the stability of North Africa, uh, Sahel, and Middle East uh, within NATO, within EU, or within uh, ad hoc coalition? Because it seems to be the NATO strategic concept is more focused on collective defense. So perhaps there is more room for European initiative in NATO or in the EU for the stabilization of the southern flank. So it's a really interesting question. Uh, is it a bilateral approach? Is it an EU approach or is it a NATO approach you would take? <laughs> Everything <we>? together? <laughs> Preferably in a coordinated way. No, we, we, we do share uh, many interests and views on the Med Sea for obvious reasons. We are you know, countries from the south of Europe and open to that sea which is dear to our civilization, by the way. Um, and I would like to add that our cooperation has been increasing over the years. Um, Luigi remembers I was in Rome a few years ago. I think we've made very good and positive steps since then, regardless of my departure from Rome. By the way, I want to, I want to be precise on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've been moving and, and including and touchy issues. Uh, by the way, this is not my only answer to your question. It is a combination of everything. You know, uh, we uh, have sometimes a view that it is one or the other. That's not the reality. That's not the reality of world affairs. Um, Europe has a huge interest in the Med Sea, has huge programs to help the Mediterranean region. Not new, it has been going on for decades. One might say it's not enough, we should do more, we should use several uh, leverage tools that we might have. But I would say this is one part of our action. The combined bilateral France and Italy, not alone in the Mediterranean, by the way, is another uh, step of action we, we can use. And NATO might have a role, uh, case by case, you know, it happened in the past, that to uh, check some goods, we had to use NATO capacities. Just like today, facing Russia's aggression in Ukraine, NATO is monitoring what's, what's happening in the Mediterranean Sea and in the Black Sea as well and in the North Atlantic as well. So again, it's a combination, possibly in a good, well, precisely coordinated way that brings the answer. Um, th thank you very much for that excellent question. We've got uh, seven minutes left. Um, I, I'd like to pick up on something that, oh, I see. I, we have a question here from one of our young leaders from Estonia, right? The president of IATA, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm Eugenia, and it's an honor for me to represent the Youth Atlantic Treaty Association. Um, being from Albania, I would like to shift a bit the attention over the Western Balkan countries. We have been witnessing a lot of summits recently, and uh, many not so positively awaited response to the fully integration of some Balkan countries into the Euro-Atlantic community. Um, in your opinion, how do you see this situation, and will it be uh, explored from the Russian uh, more within in terms of disinformation campaigns or um, malign influences, considering also the, the difficulties over in Bosnia and Herzegovina or Kosovo itself. Thank you. And we all know the Western Balkans has been a priority area for Moscow. So which of you would like to take that on? Yeah. 
Please. Well, I can uh, start by saying that I, I think one of the first things we have to do is to try immediately to solve uh, the discussion that Bulgaria has raised uh, with North Macedonia. So North Macedonia and Albania can become uh, uh, start their negotiation with the EU. I think uh, both countries have done their homework and it's actually uh, embarrassing for EU that we cannot fulfill the, the decision that we have already taken to start the negotiation. And I hope that we will solve that because of course, there needs to be this um, uh, European perspective for the Western Balkan uh, countries, uh, not only perspective, but uh, to be able to become uh, members. Uh, here, of course, it's also important uh, um, in line with this that uh, both uh, Ukraine and, and uh, Moldavia got candidate status at the last summit, uh, and soon to be, I think, Georgia will get it too after they have fulfilled some of the difficulties uh, that they have uh, in, in uh, Georgia. Uh, I think that there is a growing um, understanding in EU that this also is a geopolitical uh, situation where if we don't get uh, into uh, you know closer uh, closer to real negotiations and go forward with these countries that the, the interest from population to, to turn away from Europe uh, to other parts will maybe grow and that is something that we need to uh, hinder. Thank you for that answer, and thank you for your leadership of the young, uh, 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 the YADA, the Young Atlantic Treaty Association. If anyone questions whether NATO is about the future, you have to get to know these next generation leaders. Very dynamic, terrific group. By the way, we honored Dua Lipa last year with one of our highest honors, and so we also understand we, uh, uh, that this is a person who has a good vision for the future of the Balkans and the future of the youth in the Balkans. I see one more question. This may be our last, but let's see how far we can go. Good, after good afternoon. Thank you very much to the panel for... Um, and if you could introduce yourself, too. <laughs> Thank you to the panel for your remarks today. My name is Rebecca East McCaskill, and I'm from NATO Special Operations Headquarters. And my question is about the rise of authoritarianism, not just um, from our adversaries, but within our own nations. And I wonder, since the strategic concept specifically calls out the alliance as the premier transatlantic forum for dialogue, and we're based on shared values, what it is that with the in the alliance we could do to protect those values that we all hold dear to, our, to ourselves. Thank you. So um, let me give, uh, well, we're running out of time, but maybe one minute for each of you on this authoritarianism versus democracy issue. I know it's a short time, but uh, I like the fact that uh, Prime Minister, uh, sorry, I've promoted you. Foreign Minister Linda, uh, I, I like the way that she talked about the domestic political situation. Uh, Foreign Minister uh, Colonna, you have a domestic political situation that's also quite difficult. How do, you, how do we manage democracies to have staying power to actually stay in this fight against an autocracy uh, uh, that where decisions are a, a lot simpler to make? Why don't you start? One, mi one, one minute one, for each one minute. and then we'll have I, to close. I, I don't think I've noticed that France turned into an authoritarian regime. Oh, actually, because... actually, it looks like we have a little bit more time. So go, go ahead. Uh, uh, so the question is not so much applicable to France, I believe, but to the uh, European Union at large. Because, yes, we've seen some populist movements on the rise, um, not everywhere, but in quite a few, maybe too many countries. Um, I'd say two things. First of all, we have to remind everyone that being part of the European community is being part of a community of values, you know, and I've named them few, democracy, the rule of law, respect for each other, and respect of civil liberties. Sometimes it's worth to pass the message again and again, and I won't go further into referring to specific situations, but yes, we have to repeat what we are and to illustrate what we are giving the best possible example. Um, then, 
frankly speaking, to be honest, we have to address these issues that fuel in some misunderstandings, sometimes some, some anger. And you know, I'm extremely candid in my answer, if you see what I mean. We, we've seen that in my country, including, and it's up to the government, up to the elected authorities, up to parliament, to deliver the proper answers. This is the best answer to your question. You know, we have to deliver. Uh, One minute, or maybe no, two. <laughs> we, we have a little bit of an extension here, but Minister DeMaio, maybe you can look at your own country. Each of these countries is different in its domestic politics. We, we have some small elections coming up in November in the United States. You know, uh, rising energy prices are going to have an inflation, they're going to have an impact on that. Uh, managing this at the same time that you're managing a contest against a despot, uh, Putin, uh, is not the simplest thing in a democracy. How, how do you see that playing out? Do we have the staying power for this? I think that our citizens know very well what is the importance to stay in an alliance like NATO and an institution like the European Union. Our alliances of values that are a very important pillar of their security. And people want security. They are asking us more security. And for this reason, I think that we have to continue with the method of today. Today, we increased the number of member states mm -hmm. in this alliance, and we gave a clear answer to Putin. And uh, the expect, I think, is the opposite expectation of Putin. So I think that we have to continue on this path. And at the same time, we have to keep our unity in supporting Ukraine militarily, financially, and on the humanitarian side. And in domestic, on the domestic side, we have to continue to promote some initiatives like I mentioned the price cap, but even in economic initiatives that can support our companies, our industrial sector, our families in order to face the impact of this war that is a global war on the market side if we see at the price of energy, food, fertilizers, and others. So, so M Minister Linda, how is this playing in domestic politics in, in Sweden? You, you have a trifecta of issues coming into NATO. I'm, I'm sure that there are some differences in, in, in politics in Sweden about that. Uh, you have the inflation and the economic slowdown that everyone is facing, so that has some impact as well. Uh, and you have uh, the threat of Putin and how to uh, uh, address Putin. How does this stew of, domestic, of issues uh, work its way through uh, Swedish domestic politics? Well, I, I would rather answer the question that the, the young lady had about... Maybe I tell you something. The one thing I always coach people on is uh, when I ask a question, you can say, well, that's a brilliant question, but I'd like to answer something entirely yeah. different. Because, that's fine, go ahead. Yes, because, because when it comes to democracy, it's so clear that this is, it, it is a threat to authoritarian state. Yeah. As late as yesterday, uh, our embassy in Moscow was called up to the uh, foreign affairs minister in Moscow, saying that we immediately had to stop all the support we are giving uh, to civil society uh, for democracy promotion, uh, our Swedish Institute, our uh, development cooperation agency, we have uh, roughly $40 million uh, in this kind of support, and if we continue, then uh, it will be uh, no consequences, uh, so that has to stop immediately. And it shows, of course, that it has an effect that they don't uh, want. And since uh, 2019, we have a drive for democracy in our foreign ministry, meaning that we have in all our embassy all over the world, we have democracy talks, we have uh, more than 10,000 people has taken part, is, uh, is civil rights defenders, is LGB LGBTI persons, is feminism, uh, is all of this, that how can we promote democracy in the different countries? And we have seen that it's not just a value, it's also something that creates good things. So now, since a week back, we have started something we call Case for Democracy. We take uh, hard facts from IDEA, International Dem uh, Democracy Institute, that is placed in Stockholm, international uh, organization, from VDEM, which is an 
absolutely fascinating university, uh, part of Gothenburg University, where you have fact on everything about democracy. And we say, case for democracy to security, case for democracy to uh, equality, case for democracy for, for um, um, development. And then we can show facts that the democracies are more stable, democracy are more peaceful, democracy are more sustainable. So we make a case for democracy. And now we are trying to get those uh, information out. So it's not just, you know, some, we like <laughs> democracy. It, it's <laughs> hard facts and we need to, to, to use it because we need to defend democracy much more vigilant than we have done before. That's a powerful answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm checking. I think I can ask one more question. If you have time for one more question, all three of you. I don't know. Uh, if, 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 if I'm, looking for, I'm looking for my instructors because we're waiting for, we're waiting for our question. next panel. <laughs> Let, let's make this the last question. But it's an interesting one. It's come from our global audience. Uh, and, and it's to all three from Pedro Oliedo. Um, uh, in a recent interview, the Spanish foreign minister said that this is a historic summit on a par with Yalta summit, God help us, or the fall of the Berlin Wall, hopefully. Uh, the, um, uh, can, you, um, uh, can you each comment on that uh, at whatever brief length you'd like to? And maybe we'll start here with France and Italy and, and then Sweden, and then we'll close the session. History will tell. <laughs> <laughs> we did our best. Well, no, huge steps to do, but then we'll, we, we'll see. And, and if there's one thing you think this summit will be remembered for, what would it be? That. Unity, okay. unity, <laughs> unity, determination, yes. values, oh, strengths. Of course. Please. Oh, uh, the, the application, the, appro the provision of the application of uh, Sweden and Finland, and second, the strategic concept that is another important step. And uh, if we remember, only uh, one month ago, how was the debate about uh, Finland and Sweden? We were not optimistic, no? I remember a dinner in Berlin <laughs> uh, of NATO countries, and uh, uh, it was a, a very difficult dinner about uh, Sweden and Finland and the request of Sweden and Finland. Now, today, we have a good end, a good end on about strategic concept, a good end about the destiny and uh, uh, the enlargement to uh, Finland and Sweden. So it's an historical event, and we will continue in this direction in order to have other meetings and other important summit like this summit. Mr. Linda, I trust you think this is a historic event, <laughs> but put it on a scale of what we've gone through in the past. And for me, uh, I think if there's one thing we've learned in the last two days is there's one thing you can do on paper, but what we've learned in, 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 um, in Ukraine is it's all about execution. And that's to your answer, time will tell. But I'd love to hear your answer and then we'll close the panel here. No, of, of course, that uh, all the 30 countries uh, at today's summit has welcomed Sweden and Finland uh, to become members of NATO. Of course, that is, is historic. And then uh, it will be remembered also for, for the new strategic complex, not, not the least for the, the Chinese, uh, the discussion on China, which is in a quite new way. And I think that will be seen as a turning point uh, also for uh, the way forward for NATO. Thank you, excellent answer, terrific panel. Uh, I want, before you applaud the panelists and before I turn over to uh, M Michelle Martin from uh, uh, The Weekend Host, All Things Considered, and consider this National Public Radio. If you're American, you know exactly what we're talking about, <laughs> and you probably know it way, way beyond there as well. Uh, it will be a terrific panel with the Secretary of State of the United States, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain. So, so stay in your seats and stay close to your seats. Uh, but I want to thank our, our partners, Elcano, for your, your, your masterful uh, leadership in all of this, and GMF, uh, Munich Security Conference, Atlantic Council team is here, and all our friends at NATO. This has just been a terrific, uh, terrific experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best. See you in Washington.
Yeah, that's Chris Coon. Okay, we're, hello. Oh, there, there you go. Hello. There we go. Great. If everyone would please take your seats. I don't want to use my teacher voice, but I will. Please sit. Those who will be sitting, please sit. We'd like to begin our session as soon as possible. I don't have a clock. I need a clock. All right. Great. Everyone ready and settled? On behalf of the Atlanta Council and all of the other partners to this, uh, to this event, I welcome you and I thank you for spending this time with us after a very long day. I'm sort of delighted to have with us the Foreign Minister of Spain, Jose Manuel Alvarez, and the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. We're just going to get right into our conversation. And I'm Michelle Martin. I'm the, uh, one of the hosts of All Things Considered from National Public Radio in the United States, uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And we do hope you're all supporters and uh, <laughs> contributors, all of you who can. Um, Foreign Minister, if I may start with you, obviously the war in Ukraine has focused the world's attention uh, on NATO if it needed any more attention, but there are NATO member partners who are far away from the action. How do you maintain um, urgency and focus on the issues that are important to NATO members when their your populations who are far away from the conflict are mainly experiencing the conflict as inflation, you know, increased gas prices, you know, increased food prices. I mean, how do you maintain a sense of urgency around resolving that conflict when most people really aren't experiencing it, excepting secondary considerations, which are very important to them? Yeah, all public opinions in Europe, and clearly here in Spain, we are very, very far from the eastern flank and from Russia. Uh, understood very quickly, starting in February 24, that uh, something had changed dramatically that day. War, conventional war and full scale, was back on European soil. And we were heading towards a new security uh, Euro-Atlantic order. And therefore, what was happening there really concerned us, and it was also a threat to us. So the public opinion support, if we see the polls in Spain, to us joining all the other European partners and our natural allies that are United States are very, very high. And I think that this summit is showing that that's not incompatible with taking also a look to other threats coming from the South or hybrid threats that can happen in the East or in the South. So at the same time, there is this awareness that what's going on in the East concern us very directly because it's a change in the European order of avoiding war as a way of solving uh, conflicts. And at the same time, all concerned, East and South, are really, really under the Madrid strategic concept. Mr. Secretary, you know, easy for me to say because I haven't been in all those meetings, but one could make an argument that this has been the easy part, funneling weapons to Ukraine, um, maintaining solidarity around helping Ukraine maintain a defense. One can make an argument that the hard part is yet to come, pivoting to a diplomatic solution, which at some point has to take place. Are there any meaningful negotiations going on? If so, who's taking part in them? And if there aren't, what would trigger them? Well, Michelle, first, I think we have to recognize that the hard part is every single day mm -hmm. for people in Ukraine. The death, the destruction being wrought by the Russian ag aggression some of which we see on our screens, much of which we don't, um, is extraordinary. And the Ukrainians are living this every single day. So that's the hard part. Mm -hmm. um, Agreed, and but for, the, for people who are not directly yes. affected by the conflict, for other member nations like yours too. So, uh, but I just wanted to 
mm -hmm. to start with that because I think it's so important that we don't lose sight of that basic fact. Uh, second, Jose Manuel is exactly right. I think that what we've seen is a recognition throughout Europe and beyond that the aggression against Ukraine is also an aggression against some very basic principles that do underlie the, the international order. And if we allow them to be challenged with impunity, then we risk opening a Pandora's box. And I think people feel that. Uh, and of course, this is the worst aggression in Europe since World War II. So all of that is felt. But uh, to, your, to your question, I'd also say a tremendous amount of work went into building uh, together the capacity to support the Ukrainians, put pressure on the Russians, and reinforce our alliance. That didn't just happen. It was the result of a tremendous amount of engagement, uh, including by the United States, over many, many months uh, to do this work together. Now uh, it has to be sustained. It has to be sustained in terms of the support for the Ukrainians. We heard from President Zelensky today. It has to be sustained in terms of continuing to keep the pressure on Russia, and President Biden was clear from the start that that would impose some costs on us, but the stakes required it. And it requires us to do what we've done today and we'll do tomorrow at NATO, which is to, uh, in ways we haven't seen in a generation, reinforce our own alliance, a defensive alliance, not an alliance threatening anyone, not an alliance designed uh, to be against Russia, but to make sure that its members can adequately defend themselves. Agreed. When will a diplomatic solution be on the so, table? and is? Is one in the office? To, Who's to use a very, what would, what would, to what use would a very hackneyed expression, uh, it takes two to tango. And we have not seen any interest on the part of uh, Vladimir Putin in engaging in any kind of uh, meaningful uh, diplomatic uh, initiative. But in any event, as we said from the start, it's really important that the Ukrainians define the terms of any potential negotiation. Our, our role right now is to make sure that they have the means in their hands to continue to repel the Russian aggression, and when a negotiating table eventually does emerge, which at some point it will, that they have the strongest possible hand to play at the negotiating table. Just a brief follow-up on just on that point. There have been some obviously sort of very disturbing military actions taking place while you all were mm. meeting. There was, you know, in a, in a missile attack on a shopping center, for example. Do you, do you interpret that in any particular way? Do you think that that was a a signal of some sort? Well, as Tony was saying, for me, it's a signal that on the other side, on Vladimir Putin's mind, the idea of a dialogue, even of a ceasefire, is very, very far. It's a way of saying this is a full-scale conventional war. And I want to remind everyone, because this is something that is noble, we have a tendency to forget it. For many months, we said in all format, OECE, uh, Russian NATO Council, Normandy form a bilateral dialogue to try to solve right. any uh, um, uh, problem that Russia could have concerning its security. And right now, what we are seeing is that there is no one day in which civilians are killed or bombed. So for me, uh, we all agree that dialogue could have been the best way to discuss anything, but unfortunately, Vladimir Putin doesn't agree with us. And just to add one thing, because this is important. Sure, Jose Manuel makes a really important point, especially because we're here at NATO. There was a fiction that Vladimir Putin tried to advance, that this was somehow about a threat that NATO posed to Russia, or that Ukraine posed to Russia. It was never about that, and it remains clear that uh, it, it, it never will be. What this is about is Vladimir Putin's conviction that Ukraine does not deserve to be a sovereign, independent country. It's not about a threat that NATO poses. It's not about a threat that Ukraine poses. And unless and until he gives up on this fixation on trying to end Ukraine's sovereignty and independence, it's going to be hard to uh, get anywhere. So the stated goal of this conversation was NATO after Madrid. I want to talk about some of those issues. Another issue, um, there were two significant recent disasters affecting both of your countries, both related to irregular immigration, just in the last couple of weeks. In Melilla, at least 37 people died attempting to cross. In the United States, at least 50 people died who were being smuggled in, into the country. Uh, given that both of your countries, our countries, are uh, natural, they're, they're national borders, but they're also NATO borders. I mean, is it time for NATO to turn its attention to mass migration in some meaningful way and to put some urgency behind that? Yeah, well, the two, the two specific uh, events that you pointed out is a human tragedy, and it's appalling to all of us. And what that points out is the complexity of the phenomenon of irregular migration and how 
both the, uh, or, uh, the, the origin and transit countries and the countries that we are receiving illegal migrants, we must cooperate as strongly as possible to try to channel and to deal with this challenge in the best way. And at the same time, we are talking about borders in which inequality is probably at its most. The, the, the Melilla border is a border between European Union and Africa, probably the most unequal and unbalanced border, wherever uh, reference you take, GDP, uh, youth, whatever. And it's very complicated to try to channel those uh, irregular flows. So we have to go also to the root causes, which is underdevelopment. That's why we have also to cooperate with all those countries. And of course, the risk is always, as we saw in the Belarus border with Poland, that someone can use that as a weapon against our territorial integrity or our sovereignty. That's why in the strategic concept of Madrid, irregular migration, if it's used as a political tool, it can be a threat. But, agreed, sovereignty. but is NATO a vehicle to address this with urgency, to apply the same kind of urgency and focused attention to, I think we would all agree, it is a humanitarian disaster. It's a moral disaster. And it also has claimed many, many lives, probably more than we even know. Mm. So, Mr. Secretary, is, is, it, is, this, is NATO an appropriate vehicle to First address thing we have to recognize well? is we are living a historic moment when it comes to uh, irregular migration and migration of all sorts. There are more people on the move around the world, 100 million forcibly displaced in one way or another from their homes, more than at any time since we've actually reported uh, these facts and this information. Mm -hmm. And it is happening across the world, in our own hemisphere, uh, on our own border. One of the interesting things, Michelle, is that the United States and Spain, I'll leave aside NATO for the minute, are working closely together, including in the Western Hemisphere, to try to deal with the uh, regular migration that we're seeing there. We just came back together at, before coming to NATO. We were at the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles. For the first time, the countries in our hemisphere, through the, what's called the Los Angeles Declaration, said we have shared responsibilities when it comes to trying to deal with migration, because it, not a single one of us alone can deal with it effectively. And we are following through on uh, a number of things that we've agreed to, uh, to try to work on this collectively. Spain is a partner in this effort with other countries in the hemisphere, with the United States. So for sure, we need collective uh, uh, approaches to this. So another question for both of you, China. I mean, is it your hope that steps taken here will send a message to China? And if so, what is it? What's the message? China is a permanent member of the Security Council. So their role must be to preserve war, peace, and stability. That's what we expect from China. So that's the main message from this summit to mm -hmm. China. What NATO wants is peace and stability in the world, and we hope to cooperate with them. So it's to China to tell us if they want to engage with us in that way. What about you, Mr. Secretary? No, I, ver I, I very much agree. Uh, the relationship that we all have with China is among the most complex and consequential of any relationship that we have with another country. And there are aspects of the relationship that are clearly competitive, uh, and we need to make sure that that competition is fair uh, and engage in it very, very strongly. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are aspects increasingly where uh, we have to contest what China is doing. And one of the things that it's doing is seeking to undermine the rules-based international order that we uh, adhere to, that we believe in, that we helped uh, build. And in that sense, uh, NATO has come together and said in its strategic concept, this is the, basically the, the, the blueprint that we have for how we're going to approach the world together. For the first time, uh, we have China as a feature of that strategic concept, a concern that all of the countries in NATO have, not looking for um, conflict, but trying to make sure that together we're upholding the rules-based international order wherever it's being challenged. And if China is challenging it in one way or another, we will stand up to that. At the same time, as Jose Manuel said, there are areas where we hope to uh, pursue cooperation. But in 2010, the last time we had a strategic concept, a document that I know maybe some people's eyes will glaze over, but it's actually really important to look at it because it does define the road ahead for NATO, what it is this alliance will be doing. Yes, defending itself and trying to deter aggression from countries like Russia, dealing with all sorts of new transnational threats that didn't even exist at the time the last strategic concept in 2010 uh, was written. Back then, by the way, NATO was looking at Russia as a potential partner. China was not even mentioned. And of course, uh, cybersecurity, um, outer space, 
uh, challenges, hybrid challenges, short of actual physical uh, conflict. None of those things really featured in uh, what we were thinking about. Now they are. Now they do, and China's a part of that. Just a very brief follow-up on this. There are four Asia-Pacific uh, countries that are partners. I think that's the right term, partners. That's right. NATO partners. They're not NATO members. They're NATO partners. What role do you see them playing going forward? Can you just and you, can you be a little bit specific? Well, NATO, although the main threat now comes from, from the eastern flank, and we have to look at the southern flank because it's the direct threat. NATO, in order to promote peace and stability, that's all we want, must have a global uh, look and look at global affairs. And there is where those partners are very important for us, as Jordan or, or Mauritania in the southern flank, our Asian uh, partners help us to better understand, to engage with people on those parts of the world, and to promote okay. that uh, rule-based order. Before we let you go, just a final question for each of you, an open-ended question. What do you see as the biggest challenge for NATO going forward? I mean, some say it's those, these gray zone countries like Georgia or Moldova, possibly Ukraine going forward, where these countries are looking to the West for security guarantees, but they're probably not going to be members of NATO. Some people say it's the illiberal tendencies that are emerging in countries that we thought to be settled democracies. I don't think I need to name them. So what, what do you see as the biggest challenge for NATO going forward? And let's say, um, Mr. S Minister, we gave you the first word, so I'll give Mr. Blinken the last word. So will you go first? Uh, let me turn a little bit your question. Uh, threats are going to appear, and they can transform. The real challenge for us is to keep united and to keep the cohesion. If we do it, we are showing it. Uh, uh, concerning the, the, the Russian threat, uh, we will always overcome whatever happens. If we start to have divisions and to try to get different approaches, then even very small challenges can be very, very disruptive for us. Mm -hmm. That really should have been the last word, because I think it was, it was perfect. But, but go ahead. <laughs> but, but in, um, no, first of all, it really is um, the unity that Jose Manuel talked about, because Virtually none of the challenges that we have, whether it's in the uh, Euro-Atlantic area or beyond, and by the way, I think he's exactly right about why the, the partnerships with other countries are so important. We tend to look at um, our security in, in different silos. We've had a transatlantic silo, we've had an Asian silo, we have a hemispheric silo. We have to break them down because virtually all of these problems touch on each of us, and there are different competencies and different perspectives uh, and different assets that countries can bring to bear if they're working together. What is so powerful about what we've done uh, in the last day and will do tomorrow is to reaffirm in ways that I can't remember us doing the solidarity among our countries. NATO is emerging from this summit uh, more united, uh, more focused, and with more assets to deal with a multiplicity of challenges. There's not, a, there's not a single one. The immediate threat posed by Russia and its aggression on Ukraine and against the principles of the, uh, the international order, the longer-term challenge posed by China, a whole series of transnational threats to include climate and the effect that that has, including on generating conflict. All of these things are uh, in our strategic concept. All of these things are challenges we have to meet and face, but we know that we're going to be more effective in doing it if we actually have a shared common approach and we're bringing our shared weight to bear against them. That's what we're doing here uh, over these two days. Secretary of State Blinken, Minister Jose Manuel Alvarez, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry we don't have time for questions, so I was told. Thank you so much Thanks, for joining Michelle. us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
everyone, I would just like to thank you all. First of all, our great audience, our great audience in person who is here today. We started yesterday when we didn't know what the result of the summit will be. And I think in my mind it's a bit of an understatement to say that it was a successful summit. We have two new members joining us very soon formally. We have a new strategic concept. We have new announcements of strengthening deterrence and defense. We are looking very strongly forward how to mitigate climate change with what NATO can do. We have young leaders here with us. We have experts, we have political leaders. We have heard heads of government, heads of uh, states. We have heard ministers, 17 ministers. We have heard experts, journalists, everyone. So I think the alliance in a wider sense, but also as NATO, is in a good place. And who we are here today, we are representation of our people, our values, everyone who we are. The fact that we are on stage doesn't matter because you are the alliance. You are NATO. We are NATO, all of us. It's not the governments only. It's private sector. It's you, experts. It's organizations enabling, empowering everyone to play part in our security, our collective security. Especially big thank you to all the young leaders here. You will take over this alliance. It is your future, protect it. And my big thank you, Atlantic Council, GMF, Munich Security Council, and Royal Elkano Institute, to all the staff here, and to all the hundreds of volunteers in person, online, and everybody who has worked for our collective security.